Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 11 Chapter 251, Giant Tree Jenna's brother gone mad? Lumian's rage surged. Not because he was angry with the other party and thought his mental strength too weak to crumble so easily into madness, but because he heard Fate's mocking laughter once again. He noticed yesterday that Julian blamed himself for Elodie's death and showed signs of withdrawing into himself, but that was far from madness. Even if he faced psychological issues in the future, they would be prolonged, not an instant breakdown. Unless. Unless something happened last night that dealt Julian another heavy blow. Damn fate. Franca shared the surprise. Yesterday, she had warned Jenna to keep an eye on her brother's mental state but she hadn't expected Julian to lose his mind so swiftly. As far as she knew, he was a resilient young man. He was in good health, and his emotions wouldn't easily be affected or trigger dangerous tendencies. It would be normal for him to isolate himself or indulge for a while, but a complete breakdown in one night seemed unlikely. Jenna had mentioned Julian's inclination towards extremism, but that was for the sake of their family. With his sister still alive, burdened with debts, and the need to become an underground singer, it was evident that Julian would persist and work hard to share the load until the debts were repaid. If his psychological issues persisted until then, he might collapse or quietly take his own life. This led Franca to suspect that Julian had been agitated once again the previous night. She had similar concerns about Jenna's mother's decision to commit suicide, but she refrained from mentioning it to avoid upsetting Jenna. Franca understood Elodie's feelings and choices, but suicide felt too hasty and impulsive, as if something had influenced her emotions. Before transmigrating into this world, Franca had read many reports of such nature. She knew that the torment of poverty, self-blame for burdening the family with debts, fear of being incapable of labor, and pure selfless love could drive an optimistic person into a desperate situation, leading them to sacrifice themselves. However, such matters typically involved a period of internal struggle before they were carried out. After all, everyone had a will to survive and would consider their loved one's feelings. While it wasn't impossible to commit suicide upon understanding the circumstances, the chances were quite low. Franca speculated two possibilities. First, Jenna's mother might have been psychologically affected by her physical condition. Second, the explosion at the chemical plant might have been part of the motives of the Member of Parliament Secretary, Roan, and others. The subsequent abnormal and widespread emotional fluctuations could be connected to those events. Is Julian in a similar situation? Franca shifted her gaze to Jenna, who approached room 207, sobbing. What happened? Julian got fired, Jenna said, her expression filled with resentment just because he didn't go to the factory yesterday afternoon. But who thinks of work when their mother has just passed away? After leaving the hospital, he immediately went to his master to request time off, but they handed him a dismissal notice instead. He had been an apprentice there for a whole year. Damn it. Frank accursed. Can't they just deduct some money? Are they heartless? Do none of their own family members die? They said it needed to be requested in advance. It can't be done afterward. Jenna wiped her tears. Julian broke down this morning. He cried like a child, blaming himself and expressing his fear of losing his job. I waited until he was exhausted from crying and fell asleep before rushing over to find you. I went to Rue de Blouse's Blanches first but found no one there, so I came here. As she spoke, her words meandered as though a flood of emotions had surged within her and needed release. Franca let out a relieved sigh. It doesn't seem too grave. Sounds more like an overwhelming breakdown. Trust me, a genuine psychiatrist can heal your brother completely. I'll arrange an appointment for you right away. As Franca spoke, she turned and headed towards the staircase. The anger in Lumian's heart intensified. Forgetting to request time off getting fired on the very day he made the request, succumbing to new disturbances, and spiraling into madness, it all seemed too coincidental. Motherfucker Termoboros. Motherfucker inevitability. 
Lumian spun towards Jenna and said sharply, let's pay a visit to the factory owner and your brother's master. Jenna pursed her lips and replied simply, okay. Lumian walked past her and followed Frank up the stairs, his fiery blue eyes burning with determination. At that moment, the words of psychiatrist Madame Susie echoed in his mind, always remind yourself not to overreact. Whenever you feel a similar surge of emotions, take deep breaths and find your calm. Lumian took a deep breath, feeling a sense of alarm. In the face of Jenna's brother's madness and fate's cruel taunts, he should be angered and protest, but he shouldn't have allowed his rage to consume him completely. Almost simultaneously, behind Lumian, Jenna's resentful expression transformed into a calm one. From somewhere, she drew a brownish-green dagger, resembling a blade fashioned from tree branches instead of metal. Its surface was adorned with bark, arranged in intricate patterns. With a swift motion, Jenna thrust the dagger towards Lumian's back. Reacting swiftly, Lumian twisted his body, narrowly avoiding a fatal blow. The dagger found purchase between his shoulder and back, drawing blood. Jenna leaped back with agility, while the crimson blood from Lumian's wound flowed profusely, like crimson fire. The bark on Jenna's brownish-green dagger seemed to come alive, greedily absorbing Lumian's blood. In that moment, the muscles on Jenna's face contorted, rendering her unrecognizable to Lumian and Franca. In an instant, she transformed into an enchanting and ethereal girl, her features captivating. Lumian's pupils dilated as he recognized the imposter. Charlotte Calvino Charlotte Calvino, the leading actress of Theater de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons. Charlotte blended seamlessly with her surroundings, evading Lumian's fiery crimson fireball with ease. Amidst the thunderous explosion, the door to room 207 crumbled. The actress chuckled and uttered, You regained your senses swiftly. I couldn't eliminate you directly. But it matters not. We only require a small portion of your blood. On Avenue du Marquet, outside the khaki-colored four-story building that housed the Member of Parliament's office, Jenna stepped into the banquet hall with bewilderment. Before her eyes lay an array of exquisite desserts, savory dishes, and glasses of vibrant colored drinks spread across long tables. In one corner of the hall, a small symphony band played a soothing melody, accompanied by the sparkling brilliance of a crystal chandelier and the gentle rays of sunlight pouring in through the windows. Amongst the crowd were individuals clad in brown jackets, linen shirts, and nondescript attire from the market district, appearing rather out of place amidst the opulence of the banquet. Some stood in a corner, their expressions vacant, while others regarded the luxurious items with resentment. Some consumed food in a state of confusion, while others savored champagne with excitement, relishing the taste of an affair reserved for the upper class. Instinctively, Jenna retreated to a dimly lit corner, her expression impassive as she silently observed everything around her. Meanwhile, on the fourth floor of the Member of Parliament's office, Hugues Artois, dressed in a black tailcoat and a dark blue bow tie, his sideburns mottled and his nose prominent, stood behind a window, surveying the market district. This chaotic and antiquated place belonged to his kingdom. Monsieur Member of Parliament, why host a condolence banquet and invite these plebeians? Roan, wearing gold-rimmed glasses and sporting neatly combed hair, asked in confusion. Hugues Artois smiled. It is the duty of a member of parliament. Before assuming another identity, I must fulfill my obligations. Furthermore, by offering condolences and assistance to the grieving people at this time, I will leave a lasting impression in their minds. They may become my loyal followers in the future. When the time comes, their conversion will be easier. The red-haired Cassandra chuckled. And they shall remain oblivious to the fact that it is you, a member of parliament, who has brought calamity, pain, and despair upon them. They will only perceive the care and concern from a high-ranking figure, satisfied by your promises. Secretary Roan nodded, a smile playing on his lips. In their eyes, Monsieur Member of Parliament is an esteemed figure they can only admire from afar. They dare not approach or question him, let alone harbor suspicions, vent their anger, or harbor hatred. As long as there is no organization among them, they will never dare to resist. 
Hugues Artois laughed and declared, that is precisely why we must sow division among them, fueling their animosity towards each other. With those words spoken, Hugues Artois turned his gaze towards the sunlit window and muttered to himself, those under the mother tree of desire must have already commenced their actions, I presume. En rue anarchy, just outside Aubert's du coq door. Without warning, the ground split open and the center caved in, catching several vendors off guard. They tumbled into the abyss, their screams abruptly silenced. A colossal brownish-green tree sprang forth from the depths, its branches spreading in every direction. Stretching across multiple blocks, it ensnared Aubert's du coq door within its leafy embrace. The eloping couple, amidst their verbal sparring, found themselves once again engaged in their favored pastime. Anthony Reed, the information broker, sought refuge beneath a rickety wooden table, trembling uncontrollably. Meanwhile, Pavard Neeson, the proprietor of the underground bar, reached for his sketch pad, downing a gulp of liquor as he sketched with an expression of deep concern. The immense brownish green tree continued to grow, unabated. Chapter 252 Ancient Times Lumian's fireball missed its target, Charlotte, and in response, countless branches and vines slithered into Aubert's du coq door from every direction, entwining the walls, floor, windows, and ceiling. They twisted together in a tangle of brown and green, creating an impenetrable barrier. In an instant, the entire scene transformed into a surreal illusion before solidifying once more. Before him stood an immense tree, its shades of brown and green blending together harmoniously. Its roots delved deep into the earth, while its majestic crown reached ever higher towards the heavens. Lumian's eyes widened as he realized he had been unknowingly transported. It was reminiscent of his previous journeys into Permitha, where he would find himself in a new place without any awareness of the transition. Gone was Aubert's du coq door. Now, his feet trod upon the tangled knots of tree roots that carpeted the ground. His gaze ascended to the colossal tree, reminiscent of ancient legends, as the vast expanse of the sky with its painted like blue hue and fluffy white clouds loomed above. The tree's surface was marred by repulsive, damp growths, and each branch appeared to bear the weight of a structure, a building, a road, and other peculiarities. Aubert's du coq door was among them, perched upon a brownish-green tree trunk, intertwined with countless branches and vines, revealing a mere dozen windows to the world. Through one of the glass windows, Lumian caught sight of the eloping couple engaged in passionate lovemaking, while the information broker, Anthony Reed, cowered under a wooden table, trembling in fear. The other tree trunks held objects enshrouded by branches, leaves, and vines, appearing ethereal and hazy as if they were scenes recorded by a magnetic field through foggy air. Within this realm, ancient buildings with pediments, herringbone roofs, and lead-framed windows emerged. Women clutching gas street lamps were embraced from behind, priests stood before nude men, and individuals leaped out of glass windows while covering their behinds. Exquisite bodies were carried on trays to dining tables, Orgies unfolded with clothing strewn about, and an evil beauty turned her head to reveal two black goat horns. A bishop naked from the bottom half heard confessions from believers in front of a sacred emblem. The scenes varied in architectural styles, clothing, and hairstyles, some evoking ancient times while others seemed to have occurred just yesterday. Behind Lumian, crimson fire ravens materialized, half illusory. He swiftly scanned the area yet Franca was nowhere to be found. Franca hadn't been transported to this place caught between reality and illusion. On Rue Anarchy, amidst the tree roots, branches, and vines, street vendors and pedestrians devoured the food they sold. Even after vomiting, they continued to eat with unwavering determination. Some forcefully pinned down members of the opposite sex on the street, others drawing daggers to attack peers who had provoked them or dared steal their spots. In scenes of utter chaos, certain individuals approached glass windows, attempting to entice their reflections into a dance with a gentlemanly bow. Pedestrians and carriages traversed the streets, seemingly oblivious to the extraordinary circumstances. Vendors continued their lively hawking, and shops remained open. Passersby appeared captivated by the bustling atmosphere, unwilling to depart. 
What they failed to notice was the absence of anyone who had entered this area. They had simply vanished, never to return. On the fourth floor of the khaki-colored building that housed the Member of Parliament's office at Avenue du Marquet, Hugues Artois, lost in thought, gazed out at the nearby streets. Cassandra, with her fiery red hair, turned back to him and asked with curiosity, what is Susanna from the Bliss Society planning? A smile formed on Hugues Artois' lips as he replied, they spoke a great deal, but my understanding was limited. I recall them mentioning a plan to submerge the underground divine tree into the depths of Fourth Epic Trier and extend it into a place called the Astral World. Cassandra, Roan, Margaret, and Baduva exchanged puzzled and concerned glances, unable to hide their confusion. But won't that cause a tremendous uproar? Our current strength is far from that of official beyonders. It's best to avoid a direct clash with them. You might not be aware, but I come from the Sauron family and I understand the authorities quite well. I know how powerful and formidable they can be. Everything we've done so far has been in secret, evading investigations as best we could. If we were to be exposed, it's highly likely that we would face a saint or a grade 1 sealed artifact. And beyond them, there are angels in grade 0 sealed artifacts. Hugues Artois pressed his right hand down and reassured them with a smile. Fear not, they won't implicate us. I didn't incite them to undertake this endeavor. I didn't even offer a hint or assistance. I can only be considered aware of their plan in advance, silently consenting to their actions. The only thing that could potentially link us to this affair is the explosion at the chemical plant that received an excessive amount of decay blessings. However, that occurred because Bono Goodville misunderstood Rome's intentions and committed an unforgivable crime. The various emotions and desires stemming from the accident were exploited, amplified, and used as nourishment. What does that have to do with us? As the team members' expressions eased, Hugues Artois stepped away from the window, emitting a deep chuckle. If they succeed, it will mark another solid step forward in our pursuits. We will be even closer to welcoming the descent of great existences. If they, unfortunately, fail, we will exercise restraint for the time being and strive to ensure that our activities remain hidden from the beyonders of the two churches. We will continue to be the rulers of the market district. Success or failure, it's our opportunity. During the National Convention's discussions, I will expose the corruption and mediocre abilities of the beyonders from the two churches. They have allowed heretics to repeatedly ravage the market district, each time worse than the last. I will request Bureau 8 to establish a branch in the Market District to assist the inept church beyonders and share their burden. Bureau 8, always eager to expand its authority, will surely support my proposal. With three different official forces simultaneously present in the Market District, conflicts among them will work to our advantage. Compared to the orthodox beyonders of the two churches, Bureau 8 can be influenced, corrupted, and gradually swayed to our side. This is my plan. In the long run, victory will be ours. Roan, the secretary with gold-rimmed glasses and neatly combed hair, chuckled. That's my specialty. Influencing, corrupting, and gradually decaying an organization, leading to its decline and moral degradation. Hugues Artois adjusted his tailcoat and bow tie, preparing to leave for the banquet hall. Before departing, he surveyed his surroundings, his gaze shifting between Cassandra, Roan, Baduva, and Margaret. An unusual sense of confidence and certainty washed over him. These four subordinates possessed impressive beyonder powers, with the red-haired Cassandra being particularly formidable, instilling him with a sense of security. Outside the office door, near the stairs, stood an official beyonder team tasked with protecting him. Not every member of parliament received the privilege of a three-man protective team. Some were already powerful beyonders, while others hailed from noble backgrounds and had their own beyonder bodyguards. For some, a certain level of personal strength warranted the presence of a beyonder companion to ensure their safety. It was only someone like Hugues Artois, lacking beyonder abilities and familial support, who required such protection. According to the rules, the responsibility of safeguarding Hugues Artois rotated among the Eternal Blazing Sun Church, the God of Steam and Machinery Church, and Bureau 8. Today, it was the turn of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church. 
In addition to the Beyonders, the entire building housed 10 well-trained professional security guards armed with firearms. They were members of Bureau 7, a branch of the Intis Intelligence and Homeland Security Committee, the Special Services Bureau, responsible for providing basic protection to members of parliament and high-ranking government officials. Standing by the door, Hugues Artois waited Roan, his secretary, to open it. With a smile on his face, he lifted his head slightly, puffed out his chest, and confidently walked out, descending the stairs. On the ground covered with tangled tree roots, Lumian surrounded himself with semi-illusory fire ravens, once again spotting Charlotte Calvino, the leading lady of Theatre de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons. With a remarkable talent for acting, Charlotte gracefully wandered through the illusory scenes formed by the various tree trunks. Sometimes, she adorned a corset dress and styled her hair in an elegant bun. Other times, she embraced contemporary fashion, donning a fitted dress, a small coat, and long boots. On certain occasions, she even transported herself to the era of the Sauron royal family, embodying their love for masculine attire and blending seamlessly with the corresponding backdrop. In this ethereal process, whenever she left one misty illusory scene, she promptly emerged in another, as if leisurely strolling through different eras of Trier. Beneath the dim glow of the gas street lamps, Charlotte wore a smile as she addressed Lumian, you should consider yourself honored. You are the first dissident to enter the divine tree and merge with it. The crimson fire ravens encircling Lumian condensed but refrained from attacking. This was because Charlotte constantly flickered between illusory scenes, altering her appearance with each transition. Her voice echoed from all directions, forming sentences. Lumian had already donned black gloves. His right hand was in his pocket, gripping Mr. K's finger tightly. Charlotte continued her discourse, introducing the situation as if through an aria, as if it were insufficient to satisfy her inner desires. This ancient tree of shadow predates the construction of present-day Trier. Its roots were buried deep underground. It brings delight and sustenance to the people of Trier. With the aid of the devil lineage and devoted followers, the ambience here gradually transformed according to the deity's desired path. The people of Trier have never failed it. Both debauchery and pleasure are inherent to human nature. Year after year, they showered it with various excessive desires, providing it with nourishment. Over a millennium has elapsed. Although Trier hasn't reached the expected pinnacle of unbridled joy and indulgence until death, it has taken form. The divine tree's growth has now reached a crucial crossroads. In such a situation, pure desires and emotions can no longer play their primary role. They can only serve as firewood for the fire. We require a sacrifice of considerable magnitude. And you, who possess corruption at the angelic level but lack commensurate strength, are the perfect choice. Lumian's heart skipped a beat upon hearing this. His pupils dilated, as if he wished to see Charlotte's face clearly. Does she know that I carry the sealed power of inevitability within me? Charlotte grinned. The first time you summon High Priestess Susanna, she sensed the terrifying angelic power sealed within you. She didn't dare possess you. Her subsequent attempts to kill you were not solely motivated by Charlie. Chapter 253 Root of the Problem Upon hearing Charlotte's words, Lumian grasped the problem in an instant. As soon as he reached the market district and attempted his first summoning dance, he unintentionally summoned Susanna Mattis, who had been drawn to Charlie, into his room. At the time, Susanna seemed eager to possess him, but she instinctively sensed the danger lurking within the seal and refrained from acting. This mirrored the behavior of the peculiar creatures Lumian had summoned before. It appeared that only by compelling them would they dare to take hold of him. Hence, Lumian didn't see anything amiss then. Even when he later encountered Susanna Mattis again and gained deeper insight into the Bliss Society, he failed to connect the dots. But now, he realized his oversight. Susanna Mattis was fundamentally different from the strange creatures he had previously summoned. The dissimilarity didn't lie in her status as a Sequence 5 evil spirit who had failed to attain godhood, but rather in her possession of reason and the ability to think. 
besides being extremely fanatical and persistent, she could also lead and develop a secret organization. When such an evil spirit sensed the tremendously dangerous power sealed within Lumian's body, even if she didn't immediately recognize it as angelic-level corruption, she would have left in confusion and sought revelation from the evil god she believed in. By the time she grasped the situation, Lumian, possessing the strength of a low sequence beyond her equivalent to an angel, would be irresistibly appealing to heretics skilled in sacrificial rituals. He would be no less enticing than a hundred million Vroldor abandoned on the street before a Scrooge. Had it not been for Lumian's quick thinking, temporarily stunning her with fallen mercury and deceiving Susanna Mattis during their second encounter, the situation might have reached its conclusion before the official Beyonders arrived. For Charlie, an ordinary person, to successfully descend from the fifth floor to Lumian's door and seek help despite Susanna Mattis' threats and lingering presence, it seemed more than just mere luck. One couldn't trust the words and emotions of an actor, especially those who were particularly good-looking. In Charlotte Calvino's performance, Lumian had been scanning the surroundings, hoping to utilize a hunter's instincts to find an exit from this peculiar space. Yet, aside from the entangled tree roots blanketing the ground, the colossal slowly growing brownish-green tree, and the oil painting like blue sky with white clouds, there was nothing else. In such an environment, Lumian's pyromaniac instincts made him stop hesitating. He released his grip on Mr. K's finger and flung it into the air. Almost simultaneously, the semi-illusory crimson fire ravens condensed around him took flight, each tracing an elegant arc as they soared toward the illusionary scene where Charlotte Calvino stood and the fog of the past lingering on the surrounding branches. Charlotte stepped out of the Grand Palace, suspected to be a scene depicting Emperor Roselle's affair, and entered the White Maple Palace during the Sauron royal era. There, a beyonder who had transformed into a man due to a potion but hadn't changed his sexual orientation was scrutinizing the noble lady's spouses. The rumbling sounds persisted, yet Charlotte effortlessly evaded the onslaught of fire ravens. The fog shrouded scenes of the past remained unyielding, as if they were truly non existent. However, the brownish-green branches that bore them showed signs of scorching and charring. The Tree of Shadow was, after all, a tree, and thus susceptible to combustion. The only issue was that Lumian's fire ravens inflicted minimal harm upon it. In an explosive moment, Mr. K's finger detonated like a bomb, transforming into a gruesome rain of flesh and blood that draped Lumian in a hooded robe of crimson. To Lumian's dismay, Mr. K didn't appear immediately. It was uncertain whether it would take time to sense his presence or if the Tree of Shadow had isolated this space from the real world. Charlotte ventured into the illusory scene of a torrential downpour, where a few naked figures sprinted about. Her white silk dress seemed drenched, adhering to her body and accentuating her unusually exquisite form. She bestowed Lumian with a smile, her eyes akin to serene lakes tinged with timidity, innocence, and purity. A searing flame coursed through Lumian's being, igniting from his head down to his very core. Lumian's heart surged with longing. He darted between the entangled roots, heading toward the brownish-green tree and the captivating figure of Charlotte Calvino. Charlotte didn't traverse the various illusory scenes. Instead, she stepped onto a tree branch below and leaned against the brownish-green trunk. Her body trembled slightly, as if yearning to hide but finding no escape. Lumian's eyes blazed with a reddened fury as his gaze fixated upon Charlotte's sparkling eyes, moist lips, graceful neck, and alluring curves. His thoughts became a chaotic haze. Thus, he failed to notice Charlotte's abdomen and legs sinking into the brownish-green trunk. He failed to observe the crack forming, unveiling a colossal moist flower. The vivid red flower bloomed gradually, akin to an enormous mouth anticipating its prey. Lumian lunged toward Charlotte, propelled by his fervor. Charlotte couldn't help but smile. At that very moment, a muffled explosion erupted from Lumian's right pocket. Boom! Underneath his blood-colored robe, a ball of flames burst forth, ripping through his pocket and igniting his shirt, causing an agonizing pain to course through Lumian's waist. Lumian's eyes regained some semblance of clarity. Swiftly, he reached out and grasped Charlotte's wrist keeping a minimal distance between himself and the moist flower. 
having long been aware of the mother tree of desire's ability to awaken various desires, how could Lumian not have been on guard against Charlotte's seduction? However, in order to prevent the other party from detecting his defenses prematurely and setting a trap, he chose not to directly soak the mysticism smelling salts in cloth and place it near his nose. Nor did he turn the dagger around, preparing for the collision that would bring him back to his senses. In their current predicament, such methods held little reliability, for Charlotte might not allow him to truly pounce on her. Hence, Lumian opted to create a small fireball with a delayed explosion in his pocket, all the while gripping Mr. K's finger. If he remained unaffected and the fireball neared detonation, he could choose to dispel it and create another. The small fireball inflicted negligible harm upon him. Its primary purpose was to awaken him through pain. As for the resultant burn injuries, Lumian paid them no heed. Pyromaniacs held no fear of such trivialities. In an instant, Lumian seized Charlotte's wrist, and he caught a flicker of fear on her face. Without delay, two serpent-like crimson flames burst forth from Lumian's palm, searing their way along Charlotte's arm toward her body and head. Instinctively, Charlotte tilted her neck back, emitting a pained groan as her skin swiftly turned black from the scorching flames. Just as Lumian was on the verge of engulfing her entirely, a wave of intense danger washed over him. He attempted to pull Charlotte to the side, but she appeared to meld with the brownish-green tree. No matter how hard Lumian tugged, he couldn't extricate her. Reluctantly, Lumian abandoned his futile efforts and lunged to his right. With a muffled thud, a tree trunk as thick as a wine glass descended from the sky, impaling the ground teeming with tangled roots like a javelin, its tip quivering violently. Lumian glanced upward and beheld Susanna Mattis, her turquoise hair cascading around her, her emerald eyes and scarlet lips. She possessed a translucent quality, standing amidst the dense and ethereal canopy of the tree, blending seamlessly with it. Both the brownish-green trunk and the outstretched branches bore colossal wet flowers in pale hues, flourishing and blooming. On Avenue du Marquet, inside the khaki-colored four-story building that housed the Parliament member's office, in a corner, Jenna observed Hugues Artois, garbed in elegance, leading his secretary Roan and others through the gathering. With a glass of champagne in hand, he offered consolation, made promises, and delivered impromptu speeches with mere words. In response, he received sincere gratitude, unveiled dependence, and instinctive flattery. Jenna couldn't help but recall a question Lumian had once posed to her. Do you wish to sit here and watch as the murderers responsible for your mother's death and the destruction of your happiness revel in champagne, indulge in dance parties, and inflict more heartbreak on innocent families? Unconsciously, Jenna's fists clenched, her knowledge of the truth fueling an uncontrollable anguish. However, she understood the need to restrain herself. Acting impulsively wouldn't yield results. She had to endure. This was because following the proper procedures, she couldn't take action against a parliament member without substantial evidence. And if she desired to seek justice independently, her adversaries boasted several beyonders who had been bestowed with an evil god's boon and were protected by official beyonders and armed personnel. All she could do was endure and await the future. Within the confines of Aubert's du coq door, ensnared by branches and vines, Franca stood near the staircase, her face flushed and her eyes glistening as she battled to suppress the overwhelming desire coursing through her veins. Her right hand trembled as she retrieved the canister of mysticism smelling salts obtained from Rentis. With a twist of the lid, she raised it to her nose. Achoo! 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 A series of sneezes erupted, marking Franca's triumph over her desires and the gradual return of her rationality. Swiftly scanning her surroundings, she realized that Lumian, who had been mere steps away, had vanished. Taking note of the unnatural transformations plaguing the motel and the adjacent streets engulfed by colossal trees, Franca clenched her teeth and arrived at a resolution. The tree crowns above seemed to grow increasingly ethereal as they reached skyward, extending into an otherworldly realm. She retrieved two objects from her possession. They were a pair of tarot cards. One depicted a man and a woman raising their cups in a greeting, the two of cups. In the center, a wooden staff coiled by twin serpents stood prominently. 
the other card portrayed an angel sounding a trumpet, calling forth the resurrection of the departed, the judgment card. Chapter 254 The Weight of History Franca clutched the judgment card tightly and chanted in Hermes, Rain Judgment. The ordinary looking tarot card remained unchanged, but within a few seconds, Aubert's Duke Coke door trembled visibly. The brownish green branches and turquoise vines that covered the building's facade receded, as if filled with fear. Franca's view through the window expanded. She witnessed the sky merging with the ethereal canopy of a colossal tree. The clouds appeared to be caught in a hurricane, swirling in unison. As the wind shifted, numerous white clouds gathered, forming a massive vortex that descended to the ground, elongating into a sword-like gust that bridged heaven and earth. The sword descended, and a figure stood unwavering in the middle of Rue Anarchy. It was a woman with shoulder-length blonde hair, donned in a traditional grayish-white knight's training attire. Standing over 1.5 meters tall, her features were exquisite, and her eyes exuded a commanding aura of dignity, demanding submission and obedience. Rue Anarchy, where she stood, was no longer recognizable. The surrounding buildings, the narrow roads, and the vendors and pedestrians, consumed by their own desires, were divided and scattered across the strange wilderness, blending with the other streets. Interwoven roots sprouted from the ground connecting the scattered sections. Radiating from the brownish-green tree at the center, they spread out layer by layer, growing denser as they neared the core. The streets occupied by the colossal tree remained hidden from the outside world, thanks to this strange wilderness. Franca let out a sigh of relief at the sight of the short yet dignified lady with blonde hair. Grasping the judgment and two of cups cards, she blurted out, Praise the fool. Praise Madam Judgment. As soon as the woman known as Madam Judgment landed, her gaze fell upon the side of the brownish-green tree. Unbeknownst to Franca, a cradle-like dark red open carriage had appeared there at some point. Two towering creatures with goat horns, pitch-black bodies, and burning dark flames pulled the carriage. They seemed to be demons. Seated within the carriage was a woman wearing a light-colored veil. She adorned a loose white robe, her slightly swollen belly emanating a tangible maternal glow. Lady Moon. The strange wilderness was her Permethau world. Lady Moon. You have emerged from the rat's hole. The eyes of judgment, the blonde-haired lady, instantly took on an ethereal quality, as if touched by a golden hue. Through her eyes, she perceived the intertwining beyond her powers that existed within the woman on the carriage, manifesting in different colors and states. Deprivation. Madam Judgment's solemn voice resounded. It was an ancient Hermes word. With a simple gesture of her right hand, Madam Judgment temporarily stripped the ability to copulate between creatures of different genders. Immediately after, Madam Judgment leaned forward, pushed out her palm, and declared an ancient Hermes, exile. With a whirring sound, an invisible and majestic force coalesced into a terrifying hurricane, howling before Lady Moon. Unfazed by distance, it materialized directly where the carriage was. Beneath Lady Moon's veil, her faintly discernible red lips parted as she took deep breaths. The exaggerated hurricane, capable of toppling an entire building, seemed to find an outlet in a confined vessel. It surged into Lady Moon's mouth and permeated her body. In just a second, the hurricane dissipated into nothingness, completely absorbed by Lady Moon. With a radiant maternal glow, she extended her right hand, caressing her swollen stomach with tenderness. The cerulean sky and billowing clouds resembled exquisite paintings, while the earth beneath was a realm entwined with tree roots. Lumian's gaze met Susanna Mattis perched atop the crown of the tree, and they exchanged a knowing look. In an instant, semi-ethereal crimson fire ravens materialized around him. The fire ravens circled and soared towards the heavens, but they couldn't breach the ethereal canopy of the tree. They could only approach, their presence without touch. They alighted upon the brownish-green trunk, scorching it with blackened marks. Observing this, Lumian swiftly shifted his focus. He had discovered earlier that flames possessed the ability to inflict certain damage upon the enigmatic entity known as the Tree of Shadow. 
crimson fireballs condensed one after another, hurtling towards the branches of the tree. Yet, they merely singed them without evident impact. Lumian paused momentarily. Susanna Mattis was preoccupied with something, and Charlotte Calvino had yet to recover from her burns. It was suspected that she had taken refuge within an illusory scene, allowing the crimson flames in his palm to accumulate layer by layer until they transformed into a fist-sized sphere of searing incandescence. Boom! The explosion caused by the incandescent fireball was several times more powerful than before, but not a single fragment of the Tree of Shadows bark fell. Only a larger area of charred flesh and the faint whiff of a colossal light-colored blossom attested to the reality of the incandescent white flame stream. Lumian's expression turned grave. After a moment of contemplation, a spear formed from blazing white flames materialized in his hand. He hurled the spear towards the brownish-green tree, witnessing it puncture needle-sized holes in the charred bark before disintegrating into a cascade of flames that spread across various sections of the tree. Witnessing this, Lumian's heart clenched as he recalled his sister Aurora's favored phrase for describing those who overestimate their abilities to the point of impracticality, it's akin to an ant attempting to shake a towering oak. Lumian's anxiety, impatience, and fear compelled him to unleash his fists. His clenched fists were engulfed in crimson flames. As he struck the brownish-green tree, a wisp of fire infiltrated its surface. Fire Infusion Lumian sought to bypass the Tree of Shadows' resilient outer bark and directly harm its core. Bam! 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 His flaming fists pummeled the trunk of the brownish-green tree, as if he aimed to inject every accumulated flame within his being into it. Bam! 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 After a flurry of frenzied attacks, he retracted his fists and took a step back. Rumble! A muffled explosion reverberated from within the tree trunk, causing the charred bark to finally crumble away, consumed by flames. In an instant, an ethereal mist enveloped the scene, as if a long-forgotten beautiful dream had been set ablaze by a match. Lumian found himself momentarily lost in a haze, as if he had transformed into the protagonist of that dream, a man engaged in a passionate encounter with an enchanting woman wearing an exquisite dress, her hem teasingly lifted. The unfamiliar sensation felt so vivid that Lumian believed himself to be living it firsthand. Abruptly, a sharp pain shot through his ankle, snapping him out of the reverie. He discovered numerous branches and vines emerging from his surroundings, stealthily coiling around his feet, their thorns piercing through his blood-colored robe, sinking into his flesh, and greedily drinking his blood. Lumian grunted, crimson wisps emanating from his body, manifesting into a vibrant cloak of fiery flames that swathed his robe of flesh and blood. Amidst crackling sounds, the branches and vines ignited, quickly withering into brittle twigs and ashen remnants. Seizing the opportunity, Lumian swiftly retreated, his gaze fixed upon the wound he had inflicted. His eyes met the same brownish-green bark, albeit slightly recessed compared to its surroundings. Beneath the bark, more bark. Lumian's pupils dilated as he gleaned the gravity of the situation. The Tree of Shadow had been nurtured by the abnormal desires of Trier's denizens for one to two millennia. Each piece of bark likely represented specific human activities from a particular era, layered upon one another, carrying the weight of history and the subtleties of humanity. In simple terms, Lumian realized that if he wished to destroy the Tree of Shadow, he would have to confront countless desires accumulated over the span of two thousand years. And he had exhausted his strength to vanquish merely one desire, perhaps one in a billion, or even billions upon billions. How could he possibly prevail? Only then did Lumian comprehend the abnormality of his actions. He had been focused on assaulting the Tree of Shadow instead of seeking an escape route. An exchange of glances with Susanna Mattis brought forth fear, anxiety, and a deluge of emotions. No wonder Susanna Mattis allowed me to act freely. No wonder the injured Charlotte Calvino didn't intervene. Lumian had been cautious of the fallen tree spirits and actors that could evoke desires and emotions, yet he had unknowingly fallen under their sway. Once more, he raised his gaze and beheld Susanna Mattis, her hair a cascade of turquoise, nimbly shifting positions within the ethereal canopy, uttering an arcane incantation. 
Charlotte Calvino resumed her enigmatic actions, traversing illusory scenes, her attire, hairstyle, and makeup transforming to mirror various eras. It was no mere performance. As Lumian's thoughts raced, dizziness assailed him, and his strength rapidly waned. Such a sensation was foreign to him, but he had subjected others to its effects. The sedative concocted by the Bliss Society. Ever the keen observer of his surroundings, Lumian swiftly took out the mysticism-smelling salts, his attention drawn to the multitude of pallid flowers adorning the brownish-green tree. He suspected they were responsible for releasing the sedative gas. Achoo! In the midst of his sneeze, Lumian pivoted, intending to distance himself from the Tree of Shadow. Yet, Mr. K remained absent. In the blink of an eye, roots emerged from the earth, intertwining to erect a formidable wooden barricade, surpassing ten meters in height, encircling the brownish-green tree and obstructing Lumian's path to freedom. Lumian halted and pivoted on his heel. Countless fractures marred the trunk, branches, and roots of the Tree of Shadow. Some crevices harbored moist, light-colored flowers, while others resembled cavernous mouths oozing with viscous slime, swiftly elongating toward him. Trapped with no means of escape, Lumian's lips curled into a smirk. Without warning, he extended his right hand, pressing it firmly against his left chest. He spoke with a derisive tone, Termoboros, they truly underestimate your worth. They actually intend to employ you as a sacrifice. Chapter 255 Bridge of Communication Upon learning of the Bliss Society's plan, Lumian's immediate assumption was that Susanna had made a crucial mistake. What lay sealed within him wasn't just corruption at an angelic level, but an actual angel. The former lacked self-awareness and reacted on instinct alone. Without undoing the seal and reconnecting it with its true form, it was like a cache of explosives temporarily without a detonator. While there was still a possibility of explosion, Susanna and the other heretics believed they could manage the situation. By employing the right method, utilizing the isolated environment within the Tree of Shadow, arranging the necessary rituals, and harnessing the evil god's gaze during the sacrificial ceremony, they could break the seal and offer it as a sacrifice to the Mother Tree of Desire, ensuring the angelic corruption wouldn't pose a threat. However, the true angel possessed intelligence and a strong will. He wouldn't idly stand by while being sacrificed. Once the seal was completely lifted, could Susanna, Charlotte, and the others truly handle a genuine angel? One of them was a Sequence 5 evil spirit that required the Tree of Shadow to possess some godhood, while the other was undoubtedly an actor with an irrepressible desire to perform. As for a true angel, he had to be at least a Sequence 2 for Lumian to address him as such. In ancient times, they were nearly on par with deities and were considered subsidiary gods. The difference between them was as vast as that between a saint and an ordinary individual. Initially, Lumian hesitated to use Termoboros as an escape plan, fearing that the sinister and detestable angel would exploit the opportunity to make him do something seemingly innocent on the surface but secretly aid him in infiltrating more of his powers beyond the seal. In that scenario, Lumian, Susanna, and Charlotte would meet their doom. The Tree of Shadow would be destroyed or vanish underground, allowing Termoboros to truly descend upon the world. Left with no other choice, Lumian cautiously stepped onto the steel rope suspended above a metaphorical abyss, hoping to maintain his balance. One misstep, and he would fall into irreparable oblivion. As soon as Lumian finished speaking, Termoboros's deep and commanding voice resounded in his ears. It had been a while since Lumian had heard and resisted the angel's temptation. He could only sense his connection to his own fate through the abnormal occurrences around him or the predetermined events. Yet, the angel hadn't given up and continued to make attempts. Now, after many days, Lumian once again heard Termoboros's voice, experiencing the full presence of the angel sealed within him. Termoboros's voice carried a tinge of relaxation and satisfaction as it echoed in Lumian's ears. If they underestimate me, it will only aid my escape from this seal. This environment is perfect, precisely what I've been waiting for. Even if you perish later and the seal loses its support, the outside world won't detect the corresponding changes and won't be able to prevent me from breaking free of my restraints. 
they may not outright kill you, but once they attempt to shatter the seal and perform their sacrificial act, I will unleash their predetermined fate. I will abandon your body and disrupt their ritual. Termoboros's words insinuated, this is the opportunity I've long awaited. Why should I assist you? Just wait patiently for the inevitable outcome. Lumian fell into silence and leaped away from his original position. The tree roots split apart, and a massive, damp, pale flower blossomed, one after another, as if the abyss itself had yawned open. Achoo! Lumian inhaled the mysticism smelling salts once more, dispelling his drowsiness. He gazed up at Susanna Mattis in the sky and erupted into wild laughter. Ha, you're the most dim-witted bunch I've ever encountered. You've set up this ritual without a clue. Did your brains empty out because of your faith in the Mother Tree of Desire, or have they been filled with various liquids? Let me enlighten you. What's sealed inside me isn't corruption at the angelic level, but a bona fide angel. His name is Termoboros. As soon as that seal is undone, he shall descend upon us and slaughter you all. He'll shatter this foul, wretched fallen tree and cast it into a cesspool. If I were you, I'd cease this ritual now and let me go. Susanna Mattis, continually shifting positions within the illusory tree canopy, looked down at Lumian and smiled. Are you bluffing again? Bluffing seems to be your favorite pastime. I fell for it once, I won't be fooled again. Not far from her on a branch, one of the few windows on the surface of Aubert's Duke Oak door, entwined with vines and branches, reflected the figure of the playwright Gabriel. He frantically penned his name on a piece of paper with a fountain pen, as though a renowned author signing autographs for avid readers. He had succumbed to the allure of his script, Light Seeker, gaining fame and becoming a household name. Susanna Mattis continued, furthermore, we've contemplated the possibility that it's not corruption but an actual angel. Therefore, with the divine revelation, we've altered a crucial segment of the ritual. We will employ you as the primary sacrifice, together with the seal and the angel, to offer them to the mighty mother tree of desire. It won't hinder the final outcome. Sacrificial rituals are not like cooking, where ingredients are transformed into dishes. Our task is to present the offerings to the deity. As for what befalls you, along with the seal and the angel within, it is for the great mother tree of desire to decide. Why do you think I refrain from truly attacking you? Such an action might have prematurely shattered the seal. Don't even entertain the notion of threatening me with suicide. I shall imbue you with an ardent desire to live. It seemed as though Termoboros was akin to a valuable gift that would break free of its own accord. The seal was like a locked box, and Lumian himself was the exquisite wrapping. Susanna and Charlotte had no intention of unwrapping the box and presenting the gift to the Mother Tree of Desire. Instead, their plan was to offer the box and its packaging to the deity, avoiding any significant risks. Upon hearing Susanna Mattis' words, Lumian remained unfazed, neither surprised, nor fearful, nor disappointed. He tilted his head slightly and directed his gaze towards his left chest, a smirk forming at the corners of his mouth. Termoboros, did you hear that? You're going to be packaged up and offered to the deity known as the Mother Tree of Desire. You won't get a chance to escape that seal. I'm not sure how the Mother Tree of Desire will deal with you, but I can assure you it won't be anything pleasant. Are you really content to wait for the final outcome as a mere bystander? This time, Termoboros didn't immediately respond to Lumian. After a few seconds, his resonant voice reverberated, draw your fallen mercury and plunge it into the trunk of the Tree of Shadow. Pierce through its second layer of bark. Lumian was taken aback. The fate of the Tree of Shadow can also be exchanged? Termoboros's voice regained its grandeur. It wasn't possible before, but now it is. That tree possesses a certain living characteristic. It's akin to a mythical tray ant that hasn't fully developed its intelligence. Without hesitation, Lumian extended his left hand, passing through the crimson flaming cloak and robe made of flesh and blood. He grasped the pewter black dirk adorned with sinister patterns. Bending his body slightly, engulfed in flowing crimson flames, he sprinted toward the trunk of the Tree of Shadow, swift as a cheetah. 
Along the way, he leaped agilely, evading the cracks and blooming gigantic flowers. Observing Lumian's new course of action, Susanna Mattis didn't pay too much heed. She didn't believe he could truly harm the Tree of Shadow or her. Nevertheless, she remained cautious. She intended to kindle his desires and fabricate corresponding illusions, luring him to unite with a certain flower or crevice in the tree. Susanna Mattis' emerald eyes reflected Lumian's figure, draped in a robe of flesh and blood and adorned with a flaming cloak. Moisture welled up in her eyes instantly. She had hoped to witness Lumian abruptly changing his direction and pouncing upon the colossal light-colored flower. Yet, Lumian appeared unaffected as he charged toward the brownish-green trunk. Beneath the flaming cloak, Lumian clutched the mysticism smelling salts in his right hand, holding it close to his nose. Tears welled in his eyes, obstructing his sneeze. However, with the aid of the alms monk's endurance, he managed to endure it. Susanna Mattis was puzzled. With her level and sequence, even if the other party repeatedly sniffed the mysticism smelling salts, he shouldn't remain completely unaffected. Under normal circumstances, given the disparity in their strength, she could easily induce Lumian to sneeze while he searched for light-colored giant flowers or brownish-green crevices and continued inhaling the mysticism smelling salts. Of course, there was a possibility of failure in such situations, but it was unquestionably lower than the probability of success. But now, Susanna Mattis' initial attempt had proven futile. It was as if a skilled dice thrower had surprisingly rolled the lowest number. Achoo! Lumian let out a loud sneeze. Seizing the moment while his mind remained clear and Susanna hadn't exerted her influence a second time, he shielded the metal canister with his right finger and thrust the fallen mercury at the brownish-green trunk of the Tree of Shadow, aiming for the needle-sized hole he had created with the burning white spear. A resounding clang echoed as fallen mercury failed to penetrate any deeper, as if it had struck an impenetrable iron plate. Achoo! Lumian, having inhaled a substantial amount of the mysticism-smelling salts, sneezed once more, shaking off yet another desire incited by Susanna. Her attempts faltered once again. Lumian's right hand, gripping the metal canister, surged with crimson flames. It absorbed the engulfing cloak of fire that adorned his body, swiftly condensing into a blazing white boxing glove. In the next instant, Lumian raised his right fist and hammered it against the hilt of fallen mercury, resembling a blacksmith forging a weapon. A thunderous boom erupted as the incandescent white boxing glove detached from Lumian's hand and detonated at the rear end of fallen mercury. Boom! Lumian's left palm, holding the dirk, was charred and mangled in several places. As for fallen mercury, propelled by the force of the explosive impact, it managed to break through the first layer of bark and penetrate into the core trunk of the Tree of Shadow. Chapter 256 Crack The searing pain in Lumian's left palm from the explosion nearly caused him to instinctively draw his pewter black dirk which had already been plunged into the core trunk of the Tree of Shadow. Drawing upon his resilience and experience with similar injuries, he fought to control his body's reflexive reactions. As his mind cleared from the stimulation, he managed to shake off the two desires imposed by Susanna Mattis. Pain and rationality entwined, engulfing his mind, followed by a terrifying torrent of scenes. These were the accumulated experiences of the Tree of Shadow over the past millennium, countless fragments of desire that had nourished and formed its trunk. They represented the potential futures of this malevolent tree. They converged in a mercury-colored illusory river, flooding Lumian's thoughts like a deluge. Not only were there an overwhelming number of scenes that could overpower any low sequence beyond her, but some scenes compelled Lumian to instinctively ignore or overlook them, unable to muster the courage to look or discern. Just when he thought his intellect would be crushed by the immense torrent and reduced to a blank canvas, he realized that he had endured it. It was as if there existed an additional space capable of accommodating countless scenes beyond the limit. Lumian wasted no time in choosing the fate he wished to exchange. Guided by his intuition for danger and spiritual instincts, he selected a scene, a brownish-green root extended towards the depths of an ancient structure devoured by an unseen flame that silently burned in the darkness, casting an eerie glow over the area. 
With a crack, the tree roots snapped and descended into the shadows. Purple flames surfaced, swiftly transforming into a color indistinguishable to the naked eye. In an instant, it dissipated, leaving no trace behind. Lumian withdrew fallen mercury and exerted all his strength to pry open this fate, but it remained unresponsive. Swoosh. 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 Brownish green tree trunks, not excessively thick, hurled towards Lumian like javelins precisely thrown by a platoon of soldiers. Each one possessed the potential to impale and skewer a target upon the gnarled tree roots. In the ethereal canopy of the tree, Susanna Mattis' emerald eyes widened as she attempted to employ various abilities related to desires, be it for sex, food, greed, or acting, but all in vain. Opting for the tree spirit's powers, she aimed to deliver a physical blow. Bound to the Tree of Shadow, the methods available to her were far more potent than those of her counterparts who relied on ordinary trees as companions. Though she still doubted that the so-called Cursed Blade could harm the Tree of Shadow, Lumian's confidence and performance left her somewhat uneasy. Subconsciously, she believed it wiser to disrupt whatever he was doing. She would rather err on the side of believing it to be seriously harmful and take excessive precautions in advance than be careless and witness unforeseen changes and the possibility of failure. The former would at most waste a certain amount of strength and energy, delaying the completion of the ritual a little. The latter might bring about changes she didn't want to see in an outcome of failure. Even if the probability was low, she had to take preventative measures. She couldn't wait until it happened before attempting to rectify it. The flesh robe enveloping Lumian's body abruptly contracted, diminishing his size and evading the majority of the javelin-like tree trunks. Two of them landed on Lumian's left and right shoulders, leaving him unable to dodge or evade. The flesh and blood constituting the robe acted as disciplined soldiers receiving an order. They surged towards the impending strike, constructing layers of blood-colored cushions. With a resounding impact, the layers of flesh were pierced by the two brownish-green tree spears. More flesh surged forth, hurriedly filling the void. Although Mr. K's finger had transformed into a robe of flesh and blood to mitigate the damage, Lumian's legs buckled under the force akin to that of a sledgehammer, causing him to tumble backward. In that moment, he felt the fate of the brownish-green tree root, which had been burned by the invisible flames, loose in its grip. The illusory power prying it loose didn't solely belong to Lumian, but also to his left chest, emanating from an unknown source. Gritting his teeth, Lumian utilized the momentum of his fall to laboriously stir up that fate. With great difficulty, he transformed it into a droplet of mercury and exchanged it with the fate of encountering the Montsurus ghost, stored within the pure black dirk. With a crisp crack, fractures spread across fallen mercury, as if it struggled to bear the burden of fate. Some fractures were unnaturally long, others were delicate, and some ran straight through the blade. With a thud, Lumian collapsed onto the coiled tree roots entrenched in the ground, freeing himself from the lingering forces of the brownish-green tree javelins. His shoulder throbbed with pain, but he remained physically unharmed. The robe woven of flesh and blood began to disintegrate, trickling down, obstructing the pale-colored flower in the brownish-green crack as they unfurled their mouths in an attempt to devour Lumian. When he collapsed, he crushed them. With a resounding boom, crimson flames erupted, consuming the malevolent entities. Seizing the opportunity, Lumian swiftly rolled over and maneuvered to a relatively safe position. Only then did Lumian recall a crucial issue. Amidst dodging attacks from trees, branches, leaves, vines, roots, and flowers, and taking whiffs of the mysticism smelling salts, he whispered amidst sneezes, encountering the Montsurus ghost. Achoo, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Montsurus ghost will attack immediately. If it took a while, what was the point of his previous efforts? Disregarding the fact that the Montsurus ghost would assault the Tree of Shadow every month or two, even if it attacked every four to five minutes, Lumian found it despairing. When the time came, the preparations for the ritual would surely be complete. The sacrificial ceremony would have already commenced. Under the watchful eyes of the evil god, the Mother Tree of Desire, there was a high likelihood that the Montsurus ghost would choose to wait a while before returning, based on its previous patterns. 
Termoboros's majestic voice resonated within Lumian's body and ears once again. It approaches. It is a destined fate. In the ethereal canopy of the tree, Susanna ceased her attacks on Lumian. Utilizing the Tree of Shadow, she remotely guided Charlotte in controlling the sacrifice while delving her consciousness into the brownish green tree, searching for any potential issues resulting from the pure black Dirk's assault. The sooner she discovered it, the sooner she could resolve it and propel the sacrificial ritual forward. Upon hearing Termoboros's words, Lumian couldn't help but inquire, can the Montsurus ghost truly destroy the Tree of Shadow? Although both entities were malevolent, the giant tree that had been rooted in Trier's soil for over a thousand years, nourished by countless desires, and linked to a hidden evil god, appeared loftier, more menacing, and more wicked. Termoboros's deep voice resounded, No. However, it possesses the ability to influence the Tree of Shadow to some extent, creating an opportunity for you to escape. Just as Termoboros finished speaking, Lumian caught sight of a sudden black shadow beside him. The figure stood slightly hunched, resembling an elderly man burdened by the weight of life. The Montsurus Ghost. It had bypassed numerous restrictions and obstacles to arrive in the alternate space occupied by the Tree of Shadow. With a single stride, the stooped figure reached the edge of the brownish green trunk. Susanna and Charlotte noticed its presence. They instinctively sensed a threat, yet they didn't connect the black shadow to Trier's legend of the Montsurus ghost. Frantically, they stir up the various desires of the Montsurus ghost, but their efforts were like stones cast into an unfathomable abyss. There was no response whatsoever. For the first time, Lumian beheld the true appearance of the Montsurus ghost. It was neither an elderly man nor even human. It more closely resembled a viscous black shadow taking on a human form, hunching its back. The Montsurus ghost fixed its gaze upon the tree of shadow for two seconds before pressing itself against the brownish green trunk. In an instant, it transformed into a malevolent, pitch black liquid that corroded the layers of tree bark. A sizable pool of moist darkness spread across the surface of the massive tree trunk, steadily contaminating its surroundings and expanding its reach. Within moments, the entire lower portion of the Tree of Shadow was overtaken by the Black Shadow, rendering Susanna Mattis and Charlotte Calvino's attacks futile. The next second, the oil painting like blue sky and white clouds, along with the ground intertwined with tree roots, trembled visibly as if experiencing a violent earthquake. Faint illusory cracks appeared on the surface of the tree trunk, the ground, and even in the sky. Some of them slowly widened, revealing glimpses of the street beyond, a distorted microcosm of chaos influenced by branches, vines, and desire. Be prepared, Termoboros's grand voice echoed in Lumian's ears. Realizing that she couldn't halt the Montsurus ghost and that the situation was rapidly deteriorating, Susanna Mattis wore a resentful expression and recited an incantation in ancient Hermes, son of the god who should never have been born, you are a cage for the imprisoning curse, an evil that erodes history. I implore your assistance. The instant Susanna Mattis finished speaking, the branches beneath the ethereal tree crown began to secrete a viscous, pitch black liquid. It bore a striking resemblance to the black liquid assumed by the Montsurus ghost, but there was a significant distinction. It possessed a greater degree of chaos, frenzy, and wickedness. Almost simultaneously, pale white, Malformed skulls, yellowish eyeballs entwined with thick veins, scarlet tongues dripping with repulsive pus, and indescribably grotesque objects that induced madness by mere sight sprouted from the liquid secreted by the tree trunk. In the untamed wilderness, where Madame Judgment and Lady Moon engaged in their fierce battle, Rue Anarchy and other locations lay scattered. The brownish green tree swayed ominously, while tiny cracks that appeared to pierce the very fabric of reality spread across its surface and surroundings. Suddenly, an illusory door materialized in the sky, layer upon layer. From the midst of these doors emerged a lady clad in an orange dress, her appearance exuding a languid aura. Worms emitting resplendent starlight wriggled in and out of her visage, obscuring her true features from discernment. With purposeful strides, the woman approached the brownish green tree, extending her hands to grasp the sides of an invisible crack, as if intent on tearing it open. 
Chapter 257, The Unfortunate Transparent maggots, shimmering under the starlight's embrace, wriggled out from the lady's relaxed palm, their movements concealed within an elusive crack. The crack, once invisible, now bore the hue of starlight. With a vigorous pull, the transparent veil veiling this world let out a terrifying groan, unable to bear the weight. It parted forcefully, yielding to the unstoppable momentum. Amidst an indescribable shattering, the crevice ripped apart, transforming into a colossal cavity adorned with glimmering starry specks. It resembled the entrance to a tunnel leading to an unknown realm. In a mere instant, the woman in the orange dress vanished from the wilderness. Seated within the cradle carriage, Lady Moon's expression flickered. She commanded the demon-like creatures pulling the carriage to follow her into the tunnel. Madam Judgment trailed closely behind. In a world where tree roots intertwined and ethereal clouds resembled oil paintings. As the branches of the otherworldly tree secreted viscous black liquid and peculiar entities sprouted, Lumian felt his mind teetering on the edge of madness, despite Termoboros's warning not to gaze skyward. His skin prickled, and the flesh beneath twitched unnaturally, as if masses or tumors were about to form. At that moment, pure starlight bathed the world, casting its radiance upon Lumian's eyes. Not far from him, a minuscule crack instantaneously expanded into a mystical and enigmatic door of starlight. Shut your eyes and rush through the doorway, Termoboros's resonant voice echoed in Lumian's ears. Without a moment's hesitation, Lumian clutched fallen mercury tightly with his bloodied left hand and sprinted toward the starlit door. Squeezing his eyes shut, Lumian relied on a hunter's instinctual understanding of spatial location and precise distance, reaching his destination within a few strides. Unperturbed by the changes around him or the lurking dangers, he leaped into the unknown. After a brief bout of dizziness, Lumian sensed as though he had ascended from the depths of a profound lake, his entire being easing. He opened his eyes and beheld the brownish-green silhouette of the shadow tree not far away, Aubert's dew coke door, and other buildings cloaked in branches and vines. He witnessed streets divided by peculiar forces in various sections of the wilderness, merchants and passers-by indulging in their individual desires, and Franca gracefully leaping from a second-story window of Aubert's dew coke door. He had departed from the alternate realm within the Tree of Shadows, yet he had not returned to the tangible world. Franca also caught sight of Lumian nearby. She exclaimed with excitement, hurry, find the exit. Although she had summoned Madame Judgment and felt a measure of confidence, she desired no lingering stay in this place. How could a mere sequence seven like herself partake in a battle involving demigods? Even observing from a distance posed significant risks. Lumian nodded and sprinted toward Franca, scanning his surroundings for any signs of an exit. The more he surveyed, the more he sensed the resemblance to Permitha, a boon from the Great Mother. However, there were no hordes of undead or demons casting sinners into the abyss. Could it be that the Bliss Society's operation involved the followers of the Great Mother? Lumian swiftly formed a hypothesis and shouted to Franca, who was mere inches away, to the edge of the wilderness. Drawing from his experience, if this place was indeed Permitha, they should be able to escape from the wilderness's periphery. Franca nodded slightly and followed, without questioning his instruction. Suddenly, the wilderness convulsed with a violent quake, and a low rumble echoed from within the brownish-green tree. The sky darkened, and the world itself teetered on the brink of collapse. The branches and vines that had ensnared the buildings and streets swiftly withdrew. Vendors, pedestrians, and residents, caught in the grip of their desires, snapped out of their dazed states. They ceased their ravenous feasting, released their grip on their partners, and rose in fear. Bloodied and bewildered, they halted their savage violence and looked around in a state of confusion. In Aubert's due coke door, the bickering eloping couple ceased their romp. Oblivious to the wrongness of their actions, they were perplexed as to why the sky had darkened so drastically, as if evening had descended upon them. Anthony Reed, trembling beneath a wooden table, regained his composure. He emerged and peered out the window, his expression darkening. Gabriel, who had been frantically signing his name, suddenly regained his senses. He wondered if the stress had taken its toll on his sanity while he polished the Lightseeker script, 
incorporating the theater manager's feedback. Pavard Neeson, owner of the underground bar, set aside his paintbrush but couldn't tear his gaze away from the drawing board. Though he had only sketched it hastily, he felt it was the most remarkable work he had ever produced. It surpassed even his loftiest standards. Unconsciously, he yearned to return to that state, but he couldn't. In the blink of an eye, all the branches and vines retracted into the tree of shadows. Most of the vendors, pedestrians, and residents, who had regained their senses, beheld the ominously terrifying brownish-green tree. They didn't understand what had transpired, but fear propelled them to swiftly flee from the tree of shadows, heeding their instinctual warnings. In that moment, Susanna Mattis, her turquoise hair flowing, materialized atop the ethereal tree crown. Below her stood Charlotte Calvino, wearing an expression of disappointment, frustration, and hatred. The escape of the sacrificial offering signaled a temporary failure in their sacrifice. They promptly departed the alternate realm to evade the repercussions of the demigod-level clash. Susanna Mattis, beset by the backlash and the influence of godhood, appeared increasingly ethereal, as if she could dissipate at any moment. Lumian and Franca, racing toward the wilderness's edge, flickered in her weakened gaze, yet she lacked the power to influence them. Under normal circumstances, her fusion with the Tree of Shadows granted her the ability to exert her powers from a distance. However, the backlash from the interrupted ritual and the uncontrolled corruption following the Son of God's descent had nearly claimed her life. She was now in an extremely feeble state. The tenacious and evil spirit that she was, Susanna Mattis refused to surrender so easily. She yearned to capture Lumian and drag him back into the Tree of Shadows to resume the unfinished ritual. Once again, the branches and vines of the Tree of Shadows swiftly extended, ensnaring a hapless vendor and hoisting him aloft. Their thorns pierced his flesh, absorbing the vital essence that could rejuvenate Susanna. It was akin to utilizing the Tree of Shadows to enter a dreamlike state, draining energy to gradually lead the target to their demise through a sinister encounter. However, the process had become crude and expedited, an accelerated ordeal. Vendors, pedestrians, and residents trapped within the wilderness erupted in terrified screams as they frantically fled upon witnessing the surge of brownish-green branch and vine monstrosities and their companions being hoisted into the air. The eloping couple, wrapped tightly in a blanket, darted out of Aubert's Du Coke door, following in Anthony Reed's wake toward the wilderness's edge. Behind them trailed Gabriel, Pavard Neeson, and the tenants who hadn't yet departed for work. Before them swarmed vendors and pedestrians in a chaotic scramble. One by one, fleeing escapees were snatched up by tree branches and vines, their cries for help piercing the air. The peddler, who had once served Lumian extra whiskey sour, stumbled over a rock on the ground. In utter despair, he witnessed turquoise vines creeping up his body, layer upon layer, engulfing him entirely. Sensing the commotion, Lumian turned his head and fixated on the scene for several seconds before gradually slowing his pace. Upon witnessing this, Franca cursed, Do you plan to go back and save them? Damn it. Know your place. You're just a wanted criminal, a mob leader. Lumian didn't come to a halt, but he didn't hasten his steps either. He and Franca drew ever nearer to the edge of the wilderness. In that very moment, Lumian's ears resonated with the majestic voice of Termoboros. This time, the Angel of Inevitability did not deliver sentences one by one. Instead, he injected a lengthy paragraph into Lumian's consciousness at intervals. Have you not come to terms with your destiny? After enduring the might of inevitability, there shall naturally be a corresponding corruption. From the moment Kordu was obliterated, you became the unfortunate one. It was not I who exerted influence over you in many past matters, rather, it was your hapless fate playing its part. As an unfortunate soul, not only shall you suffer ill fortune, but so too shall those around you and those close to you. If it were not for your lack of knowledge and mysticism, which allowed Susanna Mattis to uncover the issue within your body and begin contacting Hugues Artois about employing the chemical plant explosion for the sacrificial arrangement, Jenna's mother would not have taken her own life, and Jenna's brother would not have descended into madness. If you had been cautious enough, when Flaming regained consciousness and drank with you, you would have remembered to seek an opportunity to engage a genuine psychiatrist. 
he may not have chosen the path of suicide. If you had not merely forewarned Roar, but also restricted his movements, he would not have succumbed to the illness once more and met a swift demise. Michelle would not have lost her will to live. All this misfortune has been brought upon them by you. My existence is not solely a trump card that grants you boons and the power to deter others, but also an inescapable curse. Only by bowing to inevitability and releasing me from my seal can your misfortune come to an end. If you continue on this path, you shall be unable to save those whom you wish to save. You shall be unable to protect those whom you wish to protect. You shall only amplify their misfortunes. When the time comes, those pleading for help here shall perish. Gabriel shall perish. Charlie shall perish. Jenna shall perish. Franca, too, shall meet her demise. Lumian came to a sudden halt, his countenance twisted in anguish. He could no longer conceal the pain that consumed him. Franca called out once more, get a grip. It's all well and good to do good deeds when everything is fine. But now, we need to escape and seek help from official beyonders. Who knows what will come of those demigod battles? Susanna is now like an empowered Sequence 5 with some godlike abilities. She's not someone we can handle. Those people don't expect assistance from a villain who enjoys playing pranks on them. In the vicinity of the brownish green tree, numerous individuals already dangled from its branches. With a swoosh, Gabriel was hoisted up by a few green vines, and the scattered pages of the Lightseeker's script fluttered to the ground. Pavard Neeson, the owner of the underground bar, stood beside him, his body impaled by a protruding spike. Among the eloping couple, the woman stumbled and ran slower, eventually tripping over a branch and becoming ensnared by the vines. The young man wrapped in a blanket grew alarmed and continued onward. However, after a few steps, he abruptly halted, cursing himself. Dogs hit. Before he could finish his sentence, he had already spun around and dashed back toward his partner. Clenching his teeth, he sought to tear at the vines and help her free. Desperate cries and terrified screams reverberated through the wilderness. Lumian's fists clenched involuntarily. Suddenly, he let out a chuckle and spoke. Then, are you considered close to me? After all, you reside within my body. Will you also encounter misfortune? I know I will face countless failures, yet I will persist again and again in pursuit of that elusive and seemingly insignificant hope. If I had chosen to surrender, I would have been defeated long ago. And now, there is still a chance for success. With that, Lumian took another step and continued his sprint toward the edge of the wilderness. Although Franca couldn't comprehend his mutterings, she was glad to see that he had made a wise decision. Two to three seconds later, the two of them reached the wilderness's edge. Lumian deliberately maintained a distance from Franca, then suddenly extended his arms and pushed her out. Caught off guard, Franca watched in shock as her body gradually left the wilderness. She turned to gaze at Lumian. Lumian smiled and spoke gently, once, I shared their despair, pain, and longing for aid. And during that time, someone extended a helping hand to me. With those words, he pivoted and sprinted toward the brownish-green tree. In the dim expanse of the wilderness, crimson flames ignited upon his body. This time, the fiery cloak no longer isolated him from his garments, scorching his skin and flesh. He intended to use the constant pain to resist the diverse desires he would encounter next. As he ran, his gaze locked onto Susanna, her turquoise hair entwined. Yet, he saw not only the fallen tree spirit, but also the figure etched in his memory. The one who had illuminated his path. Chapter 258 Assassin Susanna's eyes fixed on Lumian as he dashed towards her, his body engulfed in crimson flames. She absorbed energy from the surrounding crowd, including peddlers, pedestrians, and tenants hanging from the trees. Her goal was to restore her combat abilities as quickly as possible. She wasn't worried about Lumian causing her harm. Positioned at the top of the tree crown, she knew he couldn't reach her. Moreover, she was one with the Tree of Shadow, making her nearly invulnerable. 
Without godhood, any attack would only cause minor injuries, incapable of killing or severely harming her. Thud. 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 Lumian sprinted into an area where tree branches and vines entangled, with a hundred to two hundred humans dangling from above. The brownish-green foliage tried to ensnare and pierce him, but his fiery aura forced them to retreat in panic. Suddenly, a rumbling sound shook the ground. The brownish-green tree descended rapidly, shrinking its height to seven to eight meters. The violent tremors across the wilderness made it difficult for Lumian to advance. Rumble. A tremor like an earthquake shook the crystal chandelier in the banquet hall. Terrified expressions appeared on the faces of most people present. Quick-thinking individuals sought shelter under the long table draped in a white tablecloth. The team assigned to protect Hugues Artois consisted of Imra, a mixed-blood individual, Valentine, and a warrior pathway beyond her named Antoine. Sensing the anomaly simultaneously, they tacitly sent Imra to investigate. He rushed to the window and peered out, trying to locate the source of the disturbance. Imra observed that several houses in Rue Anarchy, Rue du Rossignol, and Rue de Blouse's blanches had tilted to a certain degree, but they had not collapsed. Their surfaces were covered with brownish-green branches and vines. In comparison, the prominent feature was the brownish-green tree, situated roughly on Rue Anarchy. It descended, adorned with numerous tree tumors and flowers. The scene lasted only a few seconds before returning to normal, as if an unsuccessful painting had been replaced by another work. What's happening? Hugues Artois calmly approached the window and inquired. Imra didn't hold back any information. He lowered his voice and replied sincerely, anomalies have occurred on Rue Anarchy, Rue du Rossignol, and Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Rue Anarchy, Rue du Rossignol, Rue de Blouse's Blanches. As Jenna, who had approached a nearby window but missed witnessing the scene, heard the street names, her feet froze in place. Two names immediately surfaced in her mind, Seal, Franca. Had they encountered the anomaly? Jenna's heart sank, and she instinctively looked at Hugues Artois. She noticed a curl forming on the Member of Parliament's lips, as if he couldn't hide his delight. It's him. It's him and his group of heretics. Jenna's mind instantly reached a conclusion. Darkness enveloped her, and despair surged through her uncontrollably. Could Franca and Seal withstand the planned attack by the heretics and survive this anomaly? Should I rush to their aid with my current strength? Or will I only bring harm to them? At that moment, Jenna felt as if the pillars supporting her, her two friends who had always stood by her side, were about to crumble, just as she had lost her mother and it was all the fault of the heretics, of Hugues Artois. Her thoughts drifted to Franca's words when she consumed the potion and transformed into an assassin, warning Jenna to avoid contact with evil gods. Contact with evil gods will bring nothing but disaster. Not only will it drive a person to madness and strip away their true self, but it will also drag everyone around them into darkness, whether they know them or not. If we don't eliminate those individuals, the influence of the evil gods will persist. The pain will return again and again, unending. And now, Hugues Artois stood at the center of all the market district's disasters. Jenna lowered her head, unable to meet Hugues Artois' gaze, afraid that her eyes would betray the pain and hatred within. Hatred consumed her. Yet, she could only remind herself that her brother Julian was still alive, albeit with a certain mental ailment that could be cured. If he lost his sister next, he might truly spiral into irredeemable madness. After the banquet concludes, after the factory owners provide their compensation, and after I settle all our debts, I'll take Julian and leave the market district and Cartier du Jardin Botanique. We'll find another place to live, far from the ensuing pain. Jenna repeated these words to herself, desperately trying to contain her emotions. Why is there another anomaly? Hugues Artois questioned Imra, Valentine, and Antoine. Imra offered a bitter smile and replied, I witnessed that tree. It has appeared multiple times in Trier's history, but it has never been fully resolved. Ever since joining the Purifier team in Trier, he had learned about the hidden dangers lurking beneath the ground that couldn't be entirely purified. The brownish-green tree was one of them. 
he, his superiors, and his teammates couldn't fathom why Trier had been established atop such things in the first place. Without giving Hughes Artois time to question their capabilities any further, Imra added, now that the anomaly has been discovered, it won't be long before it's suppressed. As a member of the elite purifier team, he knew that Trier differed from other countries' capitals. Due to the perpetual underground dangers, both the former royal family and the current parliamentary government had agreed to the two churches' secret dispatching of an angel each or placed grade zero sealed artifacts in Trier to prevent any mishaps. Of course, during periods when the royal family and government held immense power, the church's angels refrained from interfering. For example, during Emperor Roselle's reign. Once the anomaly caused by the peculiar tree was exposed, it would swiftly face a devastating blow. Although it couldn't be completely eradicated, it would be kept under control for a considerable time. After the swift and violent descent of the Tree of Shadow, the wilderness stabilized. Gabriel, Pavard Neeson, and the others remained suspended from the branches, their faces growing pale and blackened, as if drained of energy. Lumian regained his balance and continued sprinting towards the nearby brownish-green tree, still engulfed in crimson flames. At that moment, Susanna Mattis had regained a significant portion of her strength. Lumian's figure appeared in her eyes, awaiting his approach within the range of her current abilities. Behind Lumian, a shadow detached itself from its owner and stealthily lunged at his back. It was Charlotte Calvino, acting as a shadow. Having not been the host of the ritual and being far from the treetop, she had not suffered the backlash or intense corruption, thus her strength had not waned. Seeing Lumian turn around, she quickly hid herself and put to show her acting abilities, ready to execute a surprise attack suddenly, a gunshot pierced through the air in the distance. The iron black bullet was too distant and lacked precision. It grazed Charlotte's body, but it disrupted her plans. Wearing a blouse, light-colored breeches, and red boots, Franca emerged at the edge of the wilderness, clutching a brass revolver. She cursed at Lumian's retreating form and shouted, Fuck, don't you think I'm on your team? Noticing that the street had returned to its normal state, Hugues Artois made his way back to the center of the banquet hall, holding a glass of light gold champagne. Standing before the gathering, he began his speech as usual. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to have you join us for this condolence banquet. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor those who have tragically departed. As you can see, yet another accident has occurred in the market district. We cannot continue like this. We must establish a more efficient and adaptable system to handle such situations. I understand that many of you harbor anger and fear in light of the recent accident. Your loved ones may have lost their lives, sustained severe injuries, or perhaps experienced agitation, mental breakdowns, and madness as a result of this. Jenna's head shot up upon hearing these words, her gaze fixed on Hugues Artois once more. He had just mentioned agitation, mental breakdowns, and madness in such specific detail. Under normal circumstances, such elaboration would not be necessary. A simple reference to insanity would suffice. Did Hughes Artois know that someone would suffer a mental breakdown due to the chemical plant explosion and go mad? And was he deliberately mentioning it in his speech, as if a criminal returning to the crime scene, reveling in his sinister handiwork? An absurd mix of hatred and fear consumed Jenna's heart. If her suspicions were correct, Julian's mental breakdown might have been influenced by the heretics. Could he be cured? Could he be saved? If I don't sever the source, even if I leave the market district with Julian, there might still be hidden dangers and lingering problems in the future. The feeling of desperation overwhelmed Jenna, as if she were trapped in an inescapable darkness. Her pupils dilated, reflecting Hugues Artois' figure with a chilling clarity. Imra, Valentine, and Antoine's expressions darkened, their gazes falling, as they heard Hugues Artois' implicit accusations against the two churches. The alternate space that accompanied the Tree of Shadow lay in ruins. Some areas were coated with pitch black mucus, while others bore gaping holes, as if swallowed by an endless void. Suddenly, a glimmer of light emerged from the shrunken door of starlight. It grew brighter and brighter, akin to a transformed sun, illuminating every nook and cranny with an eerie clarity, banishing all shadows. 
a female figure draped in a white robe adorned with golden threads emerged from the radiant source. She appeared to be crafted from pure light, translucent and ethereal. With emerald green eyes and flowing blonde hair, she exuded beauty and a divine aura. The guardian angel of Trier, Saint Vive. Amidst the applause, Hugues Artois, having concluded his speech, mingled with the families of the victims, champagne glass in hand. He displayed enthusiasm, friendliness, and a trustworthy demeanor. Jenna closed her eyes and wandered towards the long table dressed in a white tablecloth. She picked up a plate and placed some food on it, then grabbed a long silver fork and began to eat. As she ate, she slowly approached Hugues Artois in a daze. Drawing near, just two meters away, she assumed a stance that suggested a conversation with Monsieur Member of Parliament. Surrounded by his team and guarded by official beyonders, Hugues Artois noticed Jenna. He smiled warmly, anticipating her approach. Jenna passed by Secretary Roan and positioned herself a step away from Hugues Artois. Before their conversation could commence, the ground trembled once more, accompanied by a resounding rumble. Rue Anarchy and Rue de Blouse's blanches seemed to brighten significantly. Cassandra, Hugues Artois, and the others turned their bodies instinctively, gazing out of the window, their concern evident. Witnessing this, Jenna closed her eyes once more. Then, she took a step forward, raising the silver fork in her hand towards Hugues Artois. All the emotions suppressed within her heart erupted. You wretched politician, the bringer of disaster and darkness to the market district. You heretic, your conscience devoured by a dog. You are the bastard responsible for my mother's death and my brother's descent into madness. Perish now! Without your demise, the suffering in the market district shall never cease. Darkness shall engulf this place, preventing the dawn from breaking. Indeed, with heretics surrounding you and the protection of official beyonders, anyone attempting to confront you would meet their demise here, dissuaded by the risk. But what if an assassin has no intention of leaving alive? Jenna channeled all her hatred, outrage, and pain into the long-handled silver fork in her grasp. She unleashed an assassin's mighty blow, aiming for Hugues Artois' exposed right eye as he turned his body. In that moment, she glimpsed the surprise, confusion, and fear etched upon his face. She witnessed Hugues Artois frantically glancing towards Cassandra, pleading for assistance. Cassandra's line of sight was obstructed by purifier Imra, who had subtly stepped diagonally, leaving her unaware of the imminent danger. With a squelching sound, the long-handled silver fork in Jenna's right hand plunged deep into Hugues Artois' eye socket, piercing into his brain. Hugues Artois' expression froze. The fear, confusion, and terror remained etched on his visage. Time did not permit much change, only revealing a profound sense of despair. Jenna watched as crimson blood gushed forth, and Hugues Artois' countenance gradually crumbled under the lights. Surrounding her, red sparks erupted, whether from firearms or supernatural abilities. She closed her eyes with a serene smile, surrendering to her fate. Mother, I see the light. Chapter 259 Awe Hugues Artois' initial reaction was one of surprise and confusion as he beheld the glimmering silver light emanating from the long-handled fork, thrusting menacingly towards him. He found it hard to fathom that someone would attempt to assassinate him, a well-protected member of parliament, under these circumstances. The assassin didn't appear particularly formidable. Despite being a retired veteran, he had left military service five years ago to pursue a career in politics. His combat skills were no longer honed. With the adversary a mere step apart, evading the attack effectively seemed impossible. Disregarding him, even a sequence 9 or even a sequence 8 beyonder would likely struggle to dodge a mighty blow from an assassin, especially one who had stealthily approached them. It all depended on whether their abilities could help them avoid vital areas or reduce the damage, thus preventing instant death. Naturally, some sequence 8 or 9 beyonders possessed the ability to sense danger or hostility ahead of time, thwarting the approach and attack of assassins. In an instant, Hugues Artois cast his gaze upon the red-haired Cassandra, the three official beyonders, and his subordinates Roan, Margaret, and Baduva, 
feeling intense fear grip him. However, what met his eyes was Cassandra's red hair, her body and line of sight obscured by the mixed blood Imra, as well as the calm and indifferent gazes of the official beyonders, Imra and Antoine. Valentine had reacted immediately but restrained himself, and Roan, Margaret, and Baduva, though eager to use their beyonder powers to save him, dared not expose their boons obtained from the evil gods. At that moment, Hugues Artois was overwhelmed by a profound sense of despair. You all, save me. Save me. With a squelching sound, the long-handled silver fork plunged mercilessly into Hugues Artois' right eye, propelled with all the force Jenna could muster. It pierced through the eye socket, penetrating the brain, with only a small portion of the handle protruding outside. Hugues Artois' thoughts became hazy. He yearned to reach out and grasp something, but his arm wouldn't even rise. I haven't become president. I haven't witnessed the arrival of great existences. I haven't received the boon of godhood. I cannot die like this. Slain by a feeble assassin. I, I don't wish to perish. A barrage of thoughts flashed through Hugues Artois' mind as gunshots resounded in his ears. His body slumped to the ground, and darkness enveloped his vision once more. Thud. Hugues Artois, member of parliament for Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman, collapsed onto the ground, his heart ceasing to beat. Jenna, her eyes shut and a smile adorning her face, was struck by bullets fired by nearby Bureau 7 agents. One bullet struck her shoulder, and another pierced her ribs from the opposite side. The pain contorted her expression instinctively. Her body involuntarily recoiled, as if she wished to curl up into a protective ball. She opened her eyes and beheld Roan and the other devotees of the evil gods glaring at her with hatred and an unnatural panic, yet refraining from attacking. In the next instant, a golden revolver, its chamber loaded, pressed against Jenna's head. Imra surveyed the room and declared, I have already subdued the assassin. Verify if Monsieur Member of Parliament can be saved and maintain order. No one should leave for the time being. He made it clear that he intended to escort Jenna back to Eglise St. Robert or inquire on the spot about the motive behind the assassination and the mastermind, preventing Cassandra and the others from venting their rage. As the Tree of Shadow descended, the various streets reverted to their original state, yet they remained engulfed in wilderness. Lumian perceived that Susanna Mattis could no longer stir his desires from a distance as she did before. So, he turned around, intending to confront Charlotte first. The crimson flames enveloping his body burned with intensity, scorching his garments and searing his skin and flesh to varying degrees, inflicting constant pain. This torment stimulated his mind, allowing him to maintain a certain level of clarity. He could also rely on the endurance bestowed by the alms monk Boon to sustain his thoughts and actions, instead of merely focusing on enduring the agony. Even for pyromaniacs, such incineration posed a threat. Moreover, as time passed, the damage would worsen, eventually endangering their lives. Of course, long before that point, Lumian's spirituality would likely crumble. He could only allow the flames to extinguish on their own. Were it not for the alms monk Boon and the internal struggle within the Tree of Shadow, his spirituality would have been strained by the self-immolation. Upon seeing Lumian turn and observe Red Boots Franca dashing toward her with a brass classic revolver, sliding across a layer of frost formed beneath her feet, Charlotte abandoned her plans for a surprise attack. Instead, she readied herself to return to the Tree of Shadow, where she could exploit the environment and enhance her abilities to confront the enemy. Her body instantaneously grew pliable, as though secreting a slimy substance. She acted as a serpent-like creature, utilizing the intertwining vines and branches to swiftly retreat toward the brownish-green tree. At that moment, Charlotte's body froze. It was akin to facing a dragon head-on, confronting a predator at the apex of the biological hierarchy. She couldn't help but tremble with fear and overwhelming panic. She circled her immediate vicinity and ran haphazardly, as if fleeing from an unseen adversary. Not far from her, Anthony Reed, the information broker, emerged from behind an iron-black gas street lamp post, suspended by the vines and branches of the Aubert's du Coke door. 
At some point, his dark brown eyes had transformed into a pale golden hue, adopting a vertical orientation. He was a psychiatrist, a sequence 7 psychiatrist of the spectator pathway. He had just employed awe. In ancient times, it was referred to as dragon might. The brownish green vines and branches surrounding Anthony Reed, manipulated by Susanna rather than the Tree of Shadow, cowered and retreated from him. Observing Charlotte's descent into madness and confusion, rendering her unable to evade Lumian's attacks, Susanna, who desperately absorbed vitality, narrowed her eyes and cursed, unable to conceal her deep seated hatred. You shall all perish. Today, you shall all meet your demise. Swoosh. 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 On the tree of shadow, new tree trunks distinct from the main body shot forth like javelins, aimed at impaling Lumian in the midst of the wilderness. Apart from utilizing the abilities of the fallen tree spirit, Susanna Mattis had not yet regained sufficient strength to affect targets dozens or even nearly a hundred meters away. Lumian had foreseen this. With a roll, he positioned himself within the area where Charlotte aimlessly fled. Thud. 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 The tree trunk javelins impaled the ground nearby, pounding the wilderness like hammers. Lumian rose to his feet, engulfed in crimson flames. He extended his arms slightly and let out a boisterous laugh. Bring it on, kill me. If Susanna were to blanket the area with relentless assaults once again, he could still find a way to evade them. However, Charlotte, lost in her state of confusion, would undoubtedly meet her demise. As he bellowed, half-illusory crimson fire ravens materialized behind Lumian. They circled and traced multiple trajectories, fixating their sights on Charlotte Calvino. The branches and vines on the ground surged wildly, swiftly ensnaring Charlotte, shielding her from harm. A series of thunderous sounds resounded as the crimson fire ravens descended upon Charlotte, shattering tree branches and igniting vines, systematically stripping away layer after layer of the actor's outer shell. Bang! Franca, who had closed the distance, stepped in and extended her right hand, firmly squeezing the trigger. An iron black bullet flew from the classic brass revolver and struck Charlotte's head with precision, piercing through the gap created by the fire ravens. The enchanting, pure, and delicate visage instantly shattered, with red and white fluids splattering forth from her eyes, nose, and mouth. With only its severed head remaining, the lifeless body stumbled a few steps in confusion before finally collapsing to the ground. Go to hell! Susanna roared. With that cry, brown branches, green vines, thick limbs, and pale colored blossoms surged forth in a multitude of forms, converging upon Lumian, Franca, and Anthony. Despite the nightmarish scene unfolding before them, Lumian sensed no immediate peril. Until Susanna Mattis regained a certain level of strength, an attack that consumed a significant amount of spirituality posed no true threat. Lumian charged forward once more, carrying the crimson flames that devoured his flesh, venturing deeper into the primordial forest like setting. Vines ignited, flowers turned to ash, branches charred, yet none impeded the enemy's advance toward the Tree of Shadow. Suddenly, the objects recoiled drawing the suspended human captives back into the embrace of the Tree of Shadow. Susanna had thought it through. There was no need to squander energy merely to vent her rage. It was wiser to await the approach of the three prey, luring them into the range where desire could take hold, before employing her most formidable abilities to deal with them. She could not accept her current weakness. That was one of the reasons why she refrained from invoking the incantation to seek assistance initially. Before dragging the offering into the Tree of Shadow, the Son of God dared not reveal himself in Trier. In the future, Susanna possessed a measure of confidence and needed to push the offering to a certain extent, securing the protection of the ritual. Only then could she utilize her fusion with the Tree of Shadow to confront the Son of God. The Son of God was astonishingly deranged. He would never restrain the corruption he might inflict upon his subordinates. As for Lady Moon, she had merely pledged to intercept potential saboteurs temporarily. Susanna dared not permit devotees of other deities to enter the Tree of Shadow. Thud, thud, thud. 
Lumian raced through the abruptly vacated wilderness and dilapidated streets, sprinting toward the brownish green tree. Franca and Anthony each selected their respective angles of attack and followed suit from different directions. The fortunate vendors, pedestrians, and tenants who had yet to be ensnared by the branches and vines seized the opportunity to flee the wilderness, making their way towards the outskirts. Chapter 260 Cracking It didn't take long for Lumian, Franca, and Anthony to approach the Tree of Shadow, stepping within the effective range of Susanna's powers. One of them had run out of mysticism smelling salts and was consumed by crimson flames. His skin grew numb, but his flesh still burned with pain. Another moved gracefully, constantly shifting positions. Every now and then, she would inhale the scent of the metal canister in her hand and let out a sneeze. The third employed the psychiatrist's placate ability to pacify his emotions and desires. In the ethereal crown of the tree, Susanna Mattis, positioned only four to five meters above the ground, grunted. Franca, dressed in a blouse and light-colored trousers, saw her reflection in Susanna's eyes. Suddenly, intense fear gripped Franca. Yet, this fear didn't arise from the outside world or grow abnormally intense. Rather, it originated from her understanding of the current situation and her desire to survive. Susanna Mattis, fused with the peculiar tree, couldn't be treated as a mere Sequence 5. She ought to be regarded as a weakened Sequence 4, one lacking an incomplete mythical creature form. Franca believed that Susanna Mattis would swiftly dispatch her, Lumian, and the information broker. Before saving anyone, she had to save herself. Franca halted, her yearning for life impossible to suppress. She struggled, torn between the urge to flee and the nagging feeling that she shouldn't abandon her teammates. Susanna Mattis' emerald eyes shifted toward Anthony Reed. The information broker, his emotions and desires now stabilized, shuddered suddenly, an all-too-familiar fear surging from the depths of his heart. A spectator afflicted by severe mental deficiencies is all too easy to deal with. Anthony Reed fully comprehended his predicament, yet he lacked the power to resist. A helpless sigh escaped his lips. When his placate failed, he trembled and retreated to a corner, succumbing to overwhelming fear. Swiftly, Susanna Mattis incapacitated Lumian's two companions, leaving them unable to offer aid for the moment. Then, she directed her gaze at Lumian, who stood less than ten meters away from the Tree of Shadow. As an evil spirit, Susanna possessed boundless extremism and persistence. She still sought to capture this sacrifice. Despite the ritual causing a great uproar, prompting numerous saints and even angels to rush and intervene, making its success unlikely, the Tree of Shadow could not be destroyed. It wouldn't even suffer significant harm. Unless the eternal blazing sun or the god of steam and machinery were willing to bury the millions of people residing in Trier and expose even graver underlying problems underground, there would always be another opportunity, even if the present one failed. As long as Lumian remained within her grasp, the sacrificial offering that perfectly sealed an angel, it wouldn't take long for Susanna to attempt the ritual once more. Hence, the malevolent spirit, Susanna Mattis, desired to capture Lumian alive. In an instant, Lumian's pace slowed, his mind consumed by the same thoughts. I mustn't die. I mustn't die. If I perish, Aurora will have no hope of revival. I must survive and uncover the truth behind the core to disaster. I must understand why Aurora believes in inevitability. These people have no connection to me. What does it matter if they die? Don't countless lives perish every day in this world? Can I even prevent that? Dot. Lumian's pace grew sluggish, his expression contorting in agony. The fiery crimson flames that engulfed him continued to burn, inflicting pain while also sharpening his senses. But the more aware he became, the stronger his desire to survive. This time, Susanna's influence over his desires had not faltered. The fallen tree spirit summoned an array of vines, branches, and tree trunks from the Tree of Shadow, ensnaring Lumian within a small circular perimeter of less than ten meters. The once open space transformed into a dense, ancient forest teeming with vegetation. Damp, 
pale-hued flowers sprouted from the roots, vines, and branches, releasing odorless anesthetic gases that threatened to lull the surroundings into a deep slumber. In that moment, Lumian's yearning for life aligned with his other thoughts. To escape this dire predicament and survive, he had to press forward and defeat Susanna Mattis. Lumian surged forward once more, gathering semi-illusory crimson flames behind him, spiraling them toward Susanna Mattis, who hovered merely four meters above the ground. He didn't expect this assault to harm the fallen tree spirit. After all, Susanna Mattis had merged with the Tree of Shadow, granting her formidable defenses and vitality. Moreover, she wasn't a mindless foe who couldn't dodge attacks or employ superpowers to safeguard herself. Lumian's objective was to momentarily disrupt Susanna Mattis' focus and impede her from inciting another desire immediately. This time, the Crimson Fire Ravens managed to breach the ethereal barrier. They passed through the weakened defenses and hurtled toward Susanna Mattis. Layers of brownish-green vines and branches encased Susanna Mattis, enveloping her in a wooden sphere, her pair of green eyes the only feature visible. Amidst the rumbling, the plant-like encasement exploded, replaced swiftly by fresh growth. Meanwhile, less than ten meters slipped away in the blink of an eye for Lumian. Vast amounts of slumberous gas corroded his body, but they were swiftly consumed and evaporated by the searing crimson flames. The charred scent of his flesh neutralized the remaining fumes, leaving only a small portion to infiltrate Lumian's nostrils. His thoughts slowed, his head spun, yet his movements remained unaffected for the time being. Harnessing his momentum, Lumian alternated between his left and right feet, launching a forceful kick against the brownish-green trunk. He propelled himself forward by a couple of meters before leaping high into the air, his gaze fixed upon Susanna Mattis. Behind him, a colossal fireball gradually took shape. His eyes reflected the wooden sphere and Susanna Mattis' emerald green gaze. It seemed as though he intended to hurl himself at the treetop, obliterating the encasing of plants with the mighty fireball. This particular stance bore an evident element of showmanship. Lumian's desire to perform had been subtly provoked by Susanna Mattis, even if his ceaseless pain could only be slightly suppressed. Susanna Mattis grinned, allowing sharp brownish-green tree trunks to emerge from the surface of the encasement like a porcupine bearing its spikes, ready to impale any unsuspecting prey. Once Lumian sustained grave injuries, the vines and branches forming the sphere would unfurl, taking complete control of their captive. As the massive fireball solidified, Lumian began his descent. Yet, instead of lunging at Susanna Mattis, he regarded her with an air of superiority, eye to eye. Still, he refrained from attacking. He continued his descent. Susanna Mattis wore a puzzled expression, perplexed by his failure to walk into her trap. Only when Lumian touched down below the treetop did he make his next move. The massive, incomplete fireball detonated, propelling him toward the trunk of the Tree of Shadow like a cannonball. In his left hand, he wielded fallen mercury, now adorned with cracks. Right from the start, Lumian hadn't set his sights on Susanna Mattis, who possessed freedom of movement and the advantages of being a Sequence 5. It would be highly risky, with little chance of success and much danger involved. His sole objective was to strike the Tree of Shadow with Fallen Mercury, a single strike. Without the enhancement of Termoboros, Fallen Mercury alone wouldn't be enough to alter the fate of the brownish-green tree. However, Lumian was confident that Susanna Mattis had fused to some extent with the Tree of Shadow. As the name Fallen Tree Spirit implied, a tree was necessary to embody a tree spirit. This understanding derived not only from Lumian's observations but also from Franca's speculations and Susanna Mattis' own admissions and actions. In essence, when fallen mercury pierced the Tree of Shadow, there was a strong possibility that it would alter the fate of Susanna Mattis, who had merged with it, rather than the fate of the Tree of Shadow itself. Lumian's actions were intended to deceive Susanna Mattis into overconfidence, ensuring she wouldn't impede his approach to the Tree of Shadow or hinder him from gathering a fireball for propulsion. And Susanna Mattis' manipulation of his desire to perform only fueled Lumian's confidence further. Though acting was a waste of time and could potentially lead to missed opportunities, it also served as a cover for one's true intentions. 
With a loud crash, Lumian and fallen Mercury collided with the brownish-green trunk. Ribs cracked, wrists snapped, his entire body battered by the explosion and impact. But he managed to drive the pewter black dirk through the outer bark and into the second layer. As expected, Lumian didn't see the torrent of historical scenes. Instead, he sensed the illusionary river, shimmering with a mercury hue, that belonged to Susanna Mattis. In the next instant, his desire was manipulated once again, and a barrage of javelins rained down from the ethereal tree crown. Releasing his hold on the pewter black dirk, Lumian entrusted the rest to fallen mercury. He plummeted to the ground, using the pain to reclaim consciousness. With a swift roll, he evaded the tree javelins that impaled the earth. When Susanna Mattis realized Lumian's true intent, she felt vexed, angry, and somewhat fearful. The previous use of the pewter black dirk had left a deep impression on her. However, she wasn't overly concerned for her safety. With her connection to the Tree of Shadow, it would be arduous for her to be slain, even if she encountered a saint. Her worry lay in the possibility of severe injury, which would thwart her chance of capturing her prey once more. At that moment, fallen mercury shattered into pure black fragments, silently descending to the ground. Long worn and weakened, it could no longer endure. However, its destruction also brought an end to the fate exchange, which should have taken several minutes to complete. It didn't stir any fate within Susanna Mattis. It merely bestowed upon her the fate stored within the blade. Normally, this would be impossible as fallen mercury had to adhere to corresponding rules. But now, shattered and fragmented, it couldn't care less. Susanna Mattis froze, purple flames erupting from her body. Fallen mercury had bestowed upon her the fate of the Tree of Shadow's root being consumed by an unseen underground fire. As a tree trunk akin to the Tree of Shadow, she couldn't escape this fate. In a mere second, the purple flames vanished, leaving Susanna Mattis reduced to ashes, her eyes filled with disbelief and astonishment. A tree trunk erupted in flames, cracking and collapsing. Chapter 261 Escape The branches and vines pursuing Lumian swiftly withdrew, as if responding to an unseen command. A javelin-like tree trunk crashed down, causing the rest to vanish into thin air. Gasping for breath, Lumian cast his gaze upward as he sprinted onward. At that moment, his eyes fell upon the incinerated form of Susanna Mattis, consumed by the vegetative sphere that had enveloped her. Not far off, he witnessed an unfamiliar tree trunk snap and succumb to fiery destruction. She's dead. Relief flooded Lumian's being. She's dead. The burden of his struggle lifted, and he crumpled to the ground, no longer able to hold on. The crimson flames that had enveloped him abruptly extinguished, unveiling his charred and disfigured body. With great effort, Lumian struggled to prop himself up, his back pressed against the vine and branch-adorned wall of the Aubert's du Coq door. He resembled a forsaken vagabond, abandoned by the world, a hint of derision in his voice as he observed the tree of shadow sinking deeper and deeper into the earth. Moreover, he witnessed the vines and branches retracting into the main trunk, the once suspended individuals released from their tethers and descending to the ground from varying heights. Among the initial group of victims, whose essence had been drained, three to four individuals remained suspended nearly three meters above the ground. Already weakened, most of their remaining vitality escaped as they suffered the harsh impact, causing them to lose consciousness on the spot. Perhaps there was still hope for their salvation, or perhaps they were beyond rescue. The hundreds who had been suspended but had not yet lost a significant portion of their essence sustained various injuries from the fall. Though their lives were not immediately endangered, they hurriedly rose to their feet, driven to escape to the fringes of the wilderness. Gabriel's complexion turned pale, bruises marring his hands and feet. Rather than fleeing, his initial instinct led him to stoop and collect the scattered lightseeker's script from the ground. The eloping couple, entwined together in their suspension, exchanged curses for being a hindrance, but they supported one another as they limped forward, their legs injured from the fall. They joined the fleeing throng, vanishing into the distance. Pavard Neeson, the proprietor of the clandestine underground bar, suffered relatively minor injuries. 
Grasping the freshly drawn draft, he raced ahead. Char and weary, Lumian settled on the street, leaning against the Albert's du Coke door, situated perilously close to the Tree of Shadow. Tilting his head back against the wall, he wore a faint smile while observing the energetic exodus of peddlers, passers-by, and inhabitants of modest abodes as they fled towards the outskirts of the wilderness. Within the confines of the Tree of Shadow, Lady Moon beheld a tumultuous clash unfolding, with numerous angels and saints joining the fray. Her faction faced mounting pressure due to reinforcements from the two churches and Bureau 8. An overwhelming sense of retreat washed over her. Should this continue, the two churches might resort to drastic measures, beseeching divine intervention. Lady Moon swiftly resolved. Deprived of several abilities and ensnared by various prohibitions, she pressed against the bulge in her abdomen and parted her lips. An ear-piercing shriek erupted within this alternate realm, causing the nearly two-meter-tall tree of shadow before her to undergo an instantaneous metamorphosis. Upon the branches and mist-shrouded bark, which depicted scenes from the past, figures born from diverse desires, now lifeless, sprang back to existence, save for Emperor Roselle. Many were demigods, emerging from their respective histories with vacant, icy expressions and an aura of chilling darkness. Resurrection Empowered by the divine fetus nestled within her womb and the unique essence of the Tree of Shadow, Lady Moon temporarily revived the accumulated desires from over a millennium in their original corporeal forms. Though the revival would be short-lived, and the resurrected beings notably weaker than before, the sudden influx of demigods into the battle within mere seconds could profoundly impact the unfolding chaos. It was precisely due to the timely aid of the divine fetus that Lady Moon dared to linger behind partaking in this tumultuous clash. Without it, having only agreed to provide cover and hindrance to those from the Bliss Society, she would have already sought refuge elsewhere. In eerie silence, the resurrected phantoms disintegrated beneath the scorching sunlight. Lady Moon seized the opportune moment to summon Permitha, which had not yet fallen into complete disarray, merging with it and vanishing from sight. On Avenue du Marquet, inside the khaki-colored four-story building that housed the Parliament member's office. Imra, the mixed-blood individual, refrained from immediately questioning Jenna, an assassin. Instead, he directed two agents from Bureau 7 to tend to Jenna's wound, staunching the profuse bleeding and applying bandages. He conveyed the impression that allowing the culprit to succumb to her injuries would hinder their ability to gather crucial clues. Valentine, Antoine, and the other agents observed and interrogated the remaining participants of the banquet, including Cassandra and Roan, who belonged to Greg Artois' team. Rumble. Once again, the ground beneath their feet trembled. Those near the windows caught glimpses of Rue Anarchy, Rue du Rossignol, and Rue de Blouse's blanches, intermittently flickering with light. Approaching them were clergymen garbed in white robes embellished with golden threads wielding various contraptions. This development disrupted the interrogation of Imra, Valentine, and the others. After a while, Angouline de Francois strode into the banquet hall, clad in a coat adorned with golden buttons, accompanied by a grayish-white humanoid mechanical creation. Several additional team members and a contingent of police officers followed suit. Upon hearing Imra's report, Angouline cast a glance at Jenna and instructed Travis Everett, bring all the attendees of the banquet to headquarters for separate interrogations. Leave the assassin here. We shall handle her questioning. Hm also keep the members of Monsieur Member of Parliament's team. There are matters we must clarify. Everett raised no objections. The organization's constables escorted the anxious onlookers away from the khaki-colored building housing the Member of Parliament's office. As the hall emptied, Anguline turned to the two Bureau 7 agents standing beside Jenna and instructed them, escort the assassin to the lounge. We must ensure she does not overhear our conversation and withhold any truths. With Jenna escorted to the lounge facing the back alley, Angulim approached Cassandra, Roan, and the others, speaking in a deep voice, Hi there, there is information we must acquire. A faint smile adorned his face. Indeed, Monsieur Member of Parliament has met his demise. According to the law, his position is immediately vacated. In other words, you are no longer part of Monsieur Member of Parliament's team. The immunity you once enjoyed is no more. 
So, before we engage in our discussion, let us proceed with some notarizations. Upon hearing Angulim's words, Cassandra and the others' expressions underwent a marked change. Meanwhile, in the lounge, Jenna, who had calmed herself after assassinating Hugues Artois, heard a tumultuous commotion emanating from the hall. One of the armed agents from Bureau 7, tasked with keeping watch, hastened to the door to investigate. Seizing the opportunity, Jenna's heart skipped a beat as a plan materialized in her mind. Her countenance transformed, and she gazed past her remaining guard with a mix of surprise and fear. Though extensively trained, the agent possessed an understanding beyond that of ordinary individuals. Today, an abnormal occurrence had unfolded on Rue Anarchy, culminating in the assassination of Monsieur Member of Parliament. Reports indicated a battle involving supernatural forces transpiring within the hall. It was only natural for him to worry about potential repercussions reaching the lounge and an unseen threat lurking behind him. Subconsciously, he entertained the notion of turning around, but halfway through the motion, caution compelled him to remain vigilant. Yet, this proved to be the only opening Jenna needed. Already restrained by handcuffs, she balled her fists and struck the agent's shoulder and neck with force, sending him sprawling to the ground. His revolver slipped from his grasp. Before the agent near the door could react, Jenna positioned her hands on the windowsill, propelling herself upward. She crashed through the glass and descended into the back alley with the grace of a feather. Suppressing the pain from her gunshot wound, she sought refuge in the shadows of a nearby corner and swiftly departed the khaki-colored building. Lady Moon weaved through different directions, employing various abilities until she finally emerged from Permitha. At that moment, she found herself in Cartier Erast, northwest of Trier. Before her stood a magnificent building adorned with golden steeples. Lady Moon cautiously surveyed her surroundings and discreetly let out a sigh of relief. Had the Tree of Shadows' deeper intrusion into the fourth epic's trier served the Great Mother's interests, she wouldn't have joined the Bliss Society's mission. She had no desire to reveal herself. It was well known that those who controlled desires often fell prey to their own desires. The chances of failure were not insignificant. Without delay, Lady Moon slipped into the beige building from its side entrance. A few hundred meters away, a golden retriever sat silently beside a woman dressed in green. They observed Lady Moon's every move in the grand structure with its numerous steeples, their expression solemn. It was the sacred heart cloister of the eternal Blazing Sun Church. In the wilderness were Rue Anarchy, Rue du Rossignol, and the buildings on Rue de Blouse's blanches crumbled, Lumian witnessed the Tree of Shadow on the brink of sinking into the ground. He couldn't help but taunt Termoboros. Well, I'm not that unlucky after all. I've actually succeeded. Hardly had the words left his lips when Franca, who had regained her senses, rushed over and hissed, Are you trying to play the role of a charred corpse? As she spoke, she retrieved the healing agent she had obtained from the poison sperm mob, intending to offer Lumian half a canister. Lumian's injuries weren't as severe as they seemed. Fatal burns for most low-sequence beyonders would require no more than a month or two for pyromaniacs to recover from. As for fractures, explosions, and impacts, none of them could claim the life of a hunter immediately. Enduring until tomorrow would naturally bring about recovery. Considering the potential pursuit of official beyonders after the wilderness completely vanished, Lumian didn't tempt fate and consumed half a vial. Soon, he felt his body rapidly regenerating. At this moment, the wilderness teetered on the edge of collapse. The streets had returned to their original positions, and many people had already rushed in. Franca surveyed her surroundings and spoke swiftly, Can you still move? We must leave this place swiftly. All right. Lumian rose to his feet. He took a couple of steps to the side, intending to retrieve the charred tree trunk that had been part of the Tree of Shadow before departing. Just as Lumian grasped the trunk, something caught his peripheral vision. Within the depression left behind by the Tree of Shadow's submersion, a hazy and translucent creature darted past. Lumian's pupils dilated, struggling to believe what he had witnessed. He yearned for a clearer view. It was a diaphanous, indistinct figure resembling a lizard. It bore an uncanny resemblance to the elf he had encountered in his dream. 
it was the very creature that had emerged from Aurora's mouth. Chapter 262 Review Lumion had always held the belief that the lizard like elf he saw was merely a figment of his dreaming mind. Symbols and metaphors held a deeper significance than the tangible reality. Yet now, before his very eyes, the diaphanous and elusive lizard like creature revealed itself in all its existence. It was undeniably real. Moreover, it had appeared in Permitha, emerging from the deep chasm left by the Tree of Shadow, a most peculiar event involving formidable powers. Could it be that the lizard crawling out of Aurora's mouth was not a fabrication? What did it symbolize, and what were its intentions? Lumian's brow furrowed as he contorted his expression, experiencing a mix of pain, shock, confusion, and withdrawal. This agitation stirred something within Lumian, making him feel that he could regain some of his memories and determine their authenticity. Yet, this time, the scenes didn't flicker through his mind as they did during psychiatric treatments or after hearing Madame Puales's words. The dream still lingered in his memory. In that moment, Termoboros's resonant voice echoed in Lumian's ears. Do you truly believe that I am responsible for all the anomalies and misfortunes surrounding you? Do you think you can escape Susanna Mattis, who is nearly a demigod with a backup plan, by relying solely on the efforts of the sealed me and a sequenced seven beyonder like yourself? Do you believe that Susanna Mattis' failure is solely due to her being an evil spirit, extremism, impatience, and lack of preparation before the ritual? Is there no other underlying reason? These words overlapped and resounded in Lumian's mind, allowing him to grasp their meaning within a short span of time. Lumian was taken aback, feeling as if he had been plunged into an icy lake, experiencing the transition from early summer to winter. He blurted out, then what is it? Termoboros remained silent, as if sensing and comprehending something. In an instant, Lumian's joy surged. He felt the heavy burden on his shoulders dissipate significantly. Does this mean that Aurora truly fell under the control of that peculiar lizard-like creature? Was that why she remained oblivious to any abnormality when awake, seeking assistance from the outside world alongside me? No, perhaps she sensed that something was amiss. The correct interpretation of the letter's order should be, we are getting weirder. The people around us need help as soon as possible. Frank nudged Lumian. Why are you lost in thought? Hurry, let us leave this place swiftly. The official beyonders and clergymen have arrived. Lumian shook off his daze and dashed with Franca to the far end of Rue Anarchy, his singed clothes clinging to his body, along with the tree trunk originating from the Tree of Shadow, not Susanna's later creation. During this process, two revelations suddenly dawned upon him. As an angel of inevitability, Termoboros also displayed an astute understanding of various matters. It is inconceivable for him to remain oblivious to Susanna Mattis offering him as a sacrifice to the Mother Tree of Desire with me as the primary vessel without unsealing the seal. He is no novice to the mystical world like me. Therefore, he never anticipated the outcome of Susanna Mattis breaking the seal from the very beginning. He made those claims purely as a bluff, coercing me to seek his aid and agree to certain unequal terms, creating an opportunity for him to truly escape. What he didn't foresee was my choice to deceive Susanna Mattis, compelling him to provide me assistance based on the information she provided. No, he must have considered this possibility, but he had nothing to lose by attempting it. What if I had not devised a swift solution at that critical moment? Damn it, his intentions are far too sinister. I could have fallen victim to his deception with the slightest carelessness. Likewise, Susanna Mattis is no paragon of honesty. Since she sought guidance from the Mother Tree of Desire and acknowledged the possibility of an angel being sealed within me, why wouldn't she contemplate the potential transmission of power through the seal? Subsequently, she prayed for power capable of withstanding the influence of Termoboros's leaked power, or even surpassing it. I failed to perceive it then and came dangerously close to corruption despite being distant. Had I not escaped the Tree of Shadow in the nick of time, I would have succumbed to corruption. Why didn't Susanna Mattis seek assistance right from the start? Could it be that corruption poses a threat to her as well? Indeed, 
despite unforeseen circumstances during the Corda ritual, the Padre, as the host of the sacrificial ceremony, was shielded by the power of inevitability. He did not transform into a monstrous entity or merge into the three-headed giant like the others and successfully escaped. Susanna Mattis also planned on relying on the protection of the ritual to resist corruption. Hence, she bought time, awaiting the completion of the ritual's preparations. She did not target and control me initially because she knew that pushing too hard would prompt Termoboros to intervene prematurely, introducing too many uncertainties. Thus, she endeavored to create an illusion for me, fostering the belief that resistance and escape were within reach. Only when I broached the subject of the angel did she stall for time, stringing together a series of seemingly revealing words. She concealed her true trump card, biding her time for me to make the wrong choice with Termoboros's aid and fall into her prearranged trap. Although she did not anticipate the attack from the Montsouris ghost, had it not been for an external intervention exploiting the crack created by the ghost, I would have remained trapped within the Tree of Shadows' depths. Moreover, she was on the verge of officially activating the ritual and gaining protection. Damn it! Beautiful actors truly possess the knack for deceiving others. As Lumian and Franca sprinted ahead, their surroundings suddenly transformed into a surreal spectacle. Vibrant layers of colors intertwined with indescribable, fantastical creatures. His head spun, and his vision became hazy. When his sight cleared, Ru Anarchy was nowhere in sight, and the vibrant palette had vanished. Instead, he found himself standing on a verdant hillside, facing Madame Magician, adorned in an orange dress. She's here too. Lumian glanced around but couldn't spot Franca. As if sensing his unspoken question, Madame Magician smiled and spoke, the two of cups departed with her major arcana card to attend to some matters. The two of cups? Lumian was perplexed. That's Franca. She is one of us. Her codename is Two of Cups, just as you are the Seven of Wands, Madam Magician casually explained. You have officially joined our ranks. Speak to the Two of Cups later and have her introduce our organization. I won't say much. Not only is Frank a member of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, but she is also part of the secret organization utilizing tarot card codenames. Lumian felt a mix of surprise and elation. This meant that he and Franca were true comrades. Madame Magician scrutinized Lumian's charred countenance and fragmented attire. From somewhere, she produced a simple brown suit tailored for a man and tossed it to him. Change into this later. While it's not particularly scandalous for Triarians to roam the streets nude, one mustn't entirely succumb to the surroundings. You must maintain your true self. Only then can you resist the potion's corruption and minimize the risk of losing control. Lumian caught the clothes, and Madame Magician pondered for a moment before speaking, tell me in detail what has transpired recently. Although I knew you would encounter followers of the evil gods and become entangled with them, I did not anticipate you getting embroiled in such weighty matters directly. Lumian recounted the events, starting from his arrival in Trier to his use of the summoning dance to lure Susanna Mattis. He focused on the sacrificial ritual, Termoboros's involvement, and the enigmatic lizard-like creature. As Madame Magician listened, her expression grew solemn. Once Lumian finished speaking, she nodded slightly and said, This is highly abnormal. Both Termoboros and that elf are far from ordinary. She gazed at Lumian, speaking in a direct manner, It wasn't Termoboros who aided you in enhancing Fallen Mercury's abilities within the Tree of Shadow and allowed the Montsouris ghost to arrive early. Not him? Lumian had speculated the issues that Madame Magician might uncover, but he never expected her to address this matter so clearly. If not Termoboros, then who else could it be? Moreover, the subsequent changes only occurred after the compromise of the inevitable angel. I don't have the answers either. Madame Magician shook her head slowly. What I can affirm is that the seal of that great existence wouldn't allow Termoboros to unleash such power. If that were possible, he would have long manipulated you to assist him in breaking the seal. Observing Lumian's perplexed expression, Madame Magician continued, All Termoboros can do is influence your judgment and choices. After all, he is sealed within you, 
and your fates are intertwined to a certain extent. To put it simply, concerning Charlie's situation, Termoboros couldn't expedite Susanna Mattis' recovery. He couldn't dictate when or how she planned to find Charlie. He could merely utilize this situation to instill anew the intention of employing the luck transference spell to alter Charlie's fate and augment the corresponding likelihood. From this standpoint, do you believe he possesses the capability to enhance Fallen Mercury's abilities and allow the timely arrival of the Montsouris ghost? However, it is plausible for him to aid you in shouldering the burden of the past scenes within the Tree of Shadow. Hence, I have consistently advised you to seek my counsel beforehand on critical and perilous matters rather than making decisions on your own. Lumian's heart surged like a tumultuous ocean. He recollected the incident where Rentis took Charlie underground and realized that Madame Magician's words held truth. Charlie's gruesome plight and destiny stemmed from two factors. Firstly, the threat posed by the Bliss Society through Rentis, and secondly, Lumian's own choice at the crossroads of fate. Thus, once Rentis was slain by their hands, Charlie's fortune merely improved marginally. Only when Lumian made the correct decision did everything revert to normalcy. There were no indications of Termoboros' influence. If he could sway Charlie's path in the same manner he manipulated the Montsouris ghost, Lumian would have fallen victim long ago. Moreover, why would Susanna Mattis entertain the idea of capturing me alive, knowing that I can receive indirect assistance from an angel after she departed from the Tree of Shadow and was in a weakened state, despite being aware of Termoboros' limited influences? Unless Susanna Mattis, who possesses a trace of godhood due to the Tree of Shadow, had already deduced that Termoboros was impotent in exerting influence and remained tightly sealed following the internal conflict within the Tree of Shadow. There must be another origin to this quandary. And that origin did not depart alongside her. Damn it. I had presumed that even if my judgment faltered or the fate exchange prolonged, Termoboros would never allow Susanna Mattis to capture me alive as it would render him a sacrificial pawn. Little did I know, he lacked the capability entirely. Lumian postulated, obtaining a more rational explanation for the recent turn of events. What exactly happened, he inquired, a tinge of anguish and anger coloring his tone. Madame Magician pondered for a few seconds before responding, taking into account those misfortunes, I suspect that Termoboros has allies in the outside world. In other words, there may be a beyonder lurking around you who possesses the ability to influence fate. He secretly accomplished tasks in accordance with the ideas transmitted by Termoboros, but he did so with subtlety to avoid exposure. A word suddenly flashed across Lumian's mind, sufferer. In his dream, after entering the underground altar with Ryan's team, they had become tainted by the aura of a sufferer. As for the owl and the other him within the warlock's tomb, Prior to their unveiling, they always gave him the impression that they were the root of the problem and the mastermind behind it all. Could these be symbolic as well? Chapter 263 Choice Lumian had always believed that his dream self represented his darker side, a twisted persona born from the corruption of inevitability. But now, it seemed there was more to it. There was no problem with his understanding of his own essence, but was he, along with the owl hidden in the warlock's tomb, also serving as a symbol? A representation of the puppet master behind the scenes, the true orchestrator of the lizard-like creature and the grand ritual in Kordu? And now, he was lurking in the shadows, attempting to collaborate with Termoboros in order to break free from the seal. However, Termoboros's attitude towards the lizard-like creature seemed to suggest otherwise. Lumian fell silent for a few seconds before sharing his speculations in detail with Madame Magician. The magician listened attentively, pondering for a moment before speaking. I initially believed that by undergoing progressive psychiatric treatment and recalling forgotten events one by one, the truth of Cordu Village would become clear to you. It wouldn't be any different from what I already know. But hearing what you've just said, I suspect that some of the symbols and metaphors in your dreams hold deeper, hidden secrets. But regardless, those symbols and metaphors are projections from my actual experiences. It's impossible that I still can't decipher them after regaining my memories, right? Lumian objected. Madame Magician smiled and replied, that might not be the case. 
Seeing Mumian's confusion, she explained simply, On the one hand, you may not have directly experienced those events, but your spirit and subconscious sense danger and abnormalities, projecting them into your dreams with symbolic elements. On the other hand, Termoboros is sealed within you. Your fate is intertwined with his. Your subconscious might have detected something unusual through this connection. Lumian grasped Madame Magician's meaning to some extent and pondered for a moment. After completing the full psychiatric treatment, can Madame Susie directly awaken my subconscious and inquire about the meaning of the different symbols? It's extremely risky. When the time comes, we'll have to rely on the joint opinion of the two psychiatrists to decide if it's worth attempting, Madame Magician replied thoughtfully. But that's a long way off. Before then, I can assist you in finding Beyonders skilled in decrypting symbolism to see if we can accurately interpret it without relying solely on your subconscious. Would you like that? All right, Lumian agreed eagerly. Then, he asked with concern, what about the potential Termoboros ally lurking nearby? Are we not going to do anything about them? Madame Magician remained calm as she answered, now that we have sensed this possibility, I don't think they will risk staying close to you. Of course, I will continue to keep watch. She then inquired, Do you plan to continue the mission assigned to you by the Aurora Order? Many people probably witnessed you charging toward the Tree of Shadow. This will raise Gardner Martin's suspicions. If you don't want to take the risk, inform Mr. K about it. He will likely be delighted that you've slain a fallen tree spirit and thwarted the Bliss Society's plan. He can assign you a new mission. If you wish to proceed, I can arrange for someone to blur the memories of those who saw you. In any case, it's normal for your exact appearance and physical characteristics not to be clearly discerned in that environment. Without hesitation, Lumian declared, I wish to proceed. Gardner Martin, a Sequence 6 or Sequence 5 of the Hunter Pathway, commanded a formidable group of hunters. If Lumian continued to interact with him and join the Iron and Blood Cross Order, there was a high chance of acquiring the potion formulas and main ingredients after Pyromaniac. Through these experiences, Lumian had gained a profound understanding of the disparities between sequences, the terror of powerful individuals, and his own limitations. He felt an urgent need to enhance his strength. It was a sharp contrast to his initial nonchalance upon arriving in Trier, where he sought hope amidst confusion. Only by becoming strong enough could he withstand misfortune and unveil the truth behind the catastrophe in the perilous world of mysticism. Only then could he discern whether various propositions using resurrection as bait concealed sinister intentions. Madame Magician nodded slightly, granting Lumian's request. Prompted by their previous conversation, Lumian inquired with curiosity, has the Tree of Shadow been dealt with? How could that be? Madame Magician scoffed. Even if both churches requested divine intervention, the Tree of Shadow would remain unresolved. Heh <laughs> heh, it's not impossible, but the price is exorbitant, deterring anyone from paying it. What sort of price? Lumian pressed further. As if taking a leisurely stroll, Madame Magician moved two steps to the side of the hill. After being nourished and exerting influence for over a thousand years, the Tree of Shadow has become one with Trier. It's akin to its shadow, its dark aspect. Unless we obliterate the entire city and exterminate every inhabitant, not even a true deity could fully eradicate it. Of course, we could relocate Trier elsewhere and resettle its entire population. Then, after five to six years, when the Tree of Shadow has weakened due to the loss of nourishment, we could uproot it. However, by doing so, the other perils lurking beneath Trier would become uncontrollable. There are other dangers. Lumian furrowed his brow. Isn't the underground of Trier too daunting? Perplexed, he asked, why wasn't the Tree of Shadow destroyed when it was first planted? Madame Magician chuckled. Well, wasn't it due to the urgency of constructing the city and countering certain underground threats? They failed to notice someone secretly planting the Tree of Shadow. She didn't divulge details about the dangers, implying that Lumian didn't need to know them at present. Lumian keenly sensed this and sealed his lips. Madame Magician looked at him and let out a self-deprecating laugh. 
Are you unhappy that I sent you directly to Trier and involved you in a series of perilous affairs without providing corresponding assistance? No, Lunian replied, puzzled by Madame Magician's question. From his perspective, accepting missions, completing tasks, and reaping rewards seemed fair enough. And throughout this process, Madame Magician would offer guidance through letters. Apart from the past few years of adoption, Lumian had long grown accustomed to not relying entirely on others and making full use of the various resources at his disposal to achieve his goals. Madame Magician chuckled. Didn't you see the major arcana card summoned by the Two of Cups? It happened because she was coincidentally in Trier. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been so effortless and effective. She paused for a moment before continuing, if I were to treat you as an extension of my eyes and hands, a loyal subordinate devoid of your own will, I could allow you to recite my name and provide ample assistance to ensure your safety most of the time. However, you chose the hunter pathway. It's a path that demands combat and a strong sense of self. A flower nurtured in a greenhouse cannot become a qualified hunter. It's immensely challenging for a hunter, who always fights within their comfort zones with a patron, to attain godhood and become a saint. In due time, they will have to invest more time and pay a higher price to compensate for their present deficiencies. What kind of person do you aspire to be? Lumian fell silent for a moment before responding, I want to be the one who makes those scoundrels tremble. His answer was unequivocal. Madame Magician nodded in satisfaction. Of course, that doesn't mean I won't care about you. I will still reply to your letters, provide my opinions, and even extend assistance upon request. However, I don't want you to feel perpetually shielded. Lumian nodded, signifying his understanding. He recalled Susanna Mattis' swift recitation of certain words to seek high-level assistance. Combining that with the keywords mentioned by Madame Magician, he spoke thoughtfully, can reciting the honorific name of a specific entity draw their attention and receive corresponding aid through prayer? Yes, the magician nodded subtly. However, it requires the sufficient goodwill of the other party. Once you reach a certain stage, I will also disclose my name to you. Yes, you are aware of Mr. Fool's honorific name, but without a ritual, simply reciting it will be difficult to elicit an effective response. It may even have adverse consequences. This is because Mr. Fool is contending with an ancient deity. The outcome will determine the fate of us all and whether this world can survive the apocalypse. Mr. Fool? The abbreviation for that mighty existence is the Fool? Truly befitting of a secret organization that employs tarot cards as their codenames. When Lumian heard of the Fool, he instinctively connected it to the tarot cards he encountered daily, rather than associating it with the honorific name. It seemed more like a description. Madame Magician changed the subject and glanced at the tree trunk in Lumian's hand. This is a valuable item. Attacks without godhood cannot harm it, and upon striking a target, it may trigger a particular desire. If you acquire beyonder characteristics that align with it, you can find a way to employ a saint-level artisan to combine them, turning it into a mystical item. You shouldn't carry it with you at all times, though. Otherwise, your desires will gradually spiral out of control. It poses great danger for beyonders who consume potions. Just as she finished speaking, Madame Magician turned her head slightly, as if listening to something. Then, she addressed Lumian, that will be all for today. In the blink of an eye, Lumian's vision filled with a blend of vibrant colors and ethereal, indescribable creatures. In the next moment, Ru Anarchy appeared before him, riddled with cracks. Madame Magician had vanished, leaving Lumian bewildered as he hastily donned the clothes and pants he held in his hands. His attention was then drawn to Franca, standing not far away. Simultaneously, the two of them exchanged smiles. Before they could convey their shared sense of being part of the same secret organization, Jenna emerged from the alley shadows, dressed in a grayish-blue gown. Lumian and Franca instinctively went on guard. Jenna winced, gripping her wounded ribs, yet expressed joy, damn it. You guys are all right. She appears genuine. Franca mumbled and approached her, concern etched on her face. What happened to you? Why are you injured? 
Jenna cast nervous glances around and lowered her voice. I assassinated Hugues Artois and ended up getting shot. Damn it. You succeeded? And you managed to escape? Franca exclaimed, taken aback. Even she didn't believe she could pull off such a feat what was this called? This was the embodiment of a true assassin. Lumian noticed a few passers-by on Rue Anarchy, so he interrupted Jenna. We can discuss it once we reach Aubert's du Coke door. I'll extract the bullet and treat your wounds. I still have half a vial of healing agent, Franca chimed in happily. She supported Jenna and, following the shadows along the roadside, they made their way back to Aubert's du Coke door. As they neared their destination, they encountered Anthony Reed, the information broker. Lumian chuckled derisively. I thought you'd have escaped. I still have some unfinished business in the market district, Anthony Reed replied vaguely. The four of them took a few more steps and laid their eyes upon the beige five-story building. Aubert's du coke door leaned a little more than before. Cracks marred its walls, intertwined with withering vines and branches. As the remaining tenants had yet to return, it exuded an indescribable dilapidation and silence. It had been some time since the catastrophe. Amidst the crowd, a young man dressed plainly disembarked from the steam locomotive, carrying an old suitcase. He left the platform behind and strolled all the way to Rue Anarchy. There, he laid eyes upon the beige five-story building, its surface adorned with streaks of vibrant red paint. Aubert's du coke door, he murmured, reciting the name of the establishment. He reached into his pocket, feeling the banknotes and coins, realizing it was likely within his means. To his surprise, Aubert's du coke door was much cleaner than he had envisioned. While certain areas were plastered with outdated newspapers and cheap pink paper, there were no signs of the ubiquitous bedbugs, repugnant phlegm, or various types of rubbish. After renting room 302 for 15 Verl d'Or, the young man climbed the stairs with his suitcase, feeling content. It's even more affordable than I thought. A clean motel like this costs only 15 Verl d'Or per month. Once he had stowed away his suitcase in the cramped room, he decided to treat himself to a drink using the money he had saved. In the capital of joy, one had to play the part. He made his way to the underground bar, immediately engulfed by the lively clamor as he stepped inside. A man in a shirt and bow tie, beer in hand, flailed his short arms, energetically expounding to the people around him. Others reveled, singing and dancing, refusing to be subdued. At the bar counter, a few patrons sat with an intriguing contraption. Curiosity piqued, the young man approached, examining the rubber hose and glass canister of the device. He asked with fascination, what is this? A handsome customer with blonde hair streaked with black turned his body and responded with a bright smile, it's called the idiot instrument that tests an individual's intelligence. Or you could say that it measures a person's foolishness. End of Volume 2, Light Seeker. Chapter 264, Secret Organization Volume Opening, Everyone is a Hunter, and Everyone is Prey Deputy Director of Lowen Kingdom's MI9 Spotted in the Crossfire of Market District Terror Fiery Debate at National Convention, Eternal Blazing Sun Church's Role in Hugues Artois Assassination Shocking Malpractice Negotiating the Limits, Two Churches in Talks over Parliamentary Immunity Restrictions No Oath no immunity, debating the rights of unsworn members National Convention or Heretic Haven? Hugues Artois shielding heretics behind market district terrorism. The headlines from different newspapers stood out, capturing Jenna's attention under the blazing afternoon sun. She scanned the newspaper's headlines, witnessing the fervent debate taking place from different angles. Jenna's gaze eventually settled on the wanted posters adorning the newsstand's side. Guillaume Benet. Poilies de Roquefort. Lumian Lee. Celia Bello. Jenna stared at her own poster, finding it peculiarly enchanting. The portrait displayed bore no resemblance to her, her features were almost reversed, except for her undeniable beauty. Even her brother Julian would fail to recognize her as his sister, let alone any bounty hunters. And so, Jenna continued her studies at the Theatre de Lancien Cage a Pigeons by Day 
and entertained audiences with her voice at the Salle de Ball Breeze by night, making ends meet. Her life remained unchanged, just as it had been. If it weren't for the daily newspaper debates surrounding Hugues Artois' demise and the ensuing conflicts, Jenna would have doubted whether her act of assassinating him was merely a dream born out of emotional turmoil. Based on Franca's findings and her own speculations, the official Beyonders seemed to appreciate Jenna's elimination of Hugues Artois. They believed she had made a significant contribution in eradicating a group of heretics. Had it not been for the pressure from the National Convention and the various restrictions in place, they might have even considered honoring Jenna with a medal. Hence, they intentionally spread misleading information, crafting a wanted poster that deviated from reality. They employed an investigation as a pretext to aid Jenna's brother, Julian, in purging the malicious powers that had destabilized his emotions. They cured his latent psychological illness and provided him with a legitimate occupation as a fitter, all under the guise of humanitarianism and support for believers. For Jenna, aside from the necessity to avoid her neighbors whenever she encountered Julian, her life remained relatively unhindered. She pursued her studies in theater acting and transformed into showy diva whenever the need arose. Drawing from Franca's experience, if Jenna lingered in the market district for a few more days, the purifiers of the eternal blazing sun church would likely approach her, sharing common knowledge and taboos to prevent any accidental disasters caused by her wild beyond her powers. They might even attempt to recruit her as an informant. If it were a beyonder from the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery, they might choose to observe her covertly, trailing her steps and uncovering the source of her beyonder characteristic. Depending on the circumstances, they would determine whether to apprehend her immediately and transform her into an informant or play the long game to capture more significant players. The purifiers, on the other hand, would likely adopt a more transparent approach, considering Jenna's substantial assistance in their cause. Jenna paid little mind to these matters. If the official Beyonders saw her capture, she would flee. If they wished to recruit her as an informant, she would comply. And if they disregarded her altogether, she would continue working to repay her debts and save for next year's tuition. Retracting her gaze, Jenna, dressed in a grayish-white gown, stepped out of Theodore Delancey in Cage a Pigeons. She turned towards Rue de Blouse's Blanches, seeking some rest before adorning her face with smoky and decadent makeup, preparing to become the captivating showy diva at the Salle de Ball Breeze. Apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches Franca, clad in a blouse, light-colored breeches, and wooden slippers, warmly greeted Lumian. Theater de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons proves more profitable than anticipated. At the Heretics Estate Charity Auction for the Post-Disaster Reconstruction, Gardner Martin had acquired Theater de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons for 50,000 Verl d'Or and entrusted its management to Franca. Most of the profits were left in her hands as his mistress. During the auction, he had also secured Aubert's Du Coke d'Or for 2,000 Verl d'Or. Occasionally, he dispatched individuals to conduct peculiar investigations, as if seeking to uncover the truth behind the disaster. Lumian undoubtedly took charge of the daily operations. As the weather warmed, Lumian embraced the change by donning a light brown pair of trousers, a crisp white shirt, and a black waistcoat. He didn't bother with a coat. Rather than inquire about the profits of Theodor de Lancy and Kajah Pigeons, Lumian surveyed the surroundings and posed a question. I wish to know more about the secret organization we've joined. He had initially assumed Franco would inform him at an opportune moment. However, after waiting for several days, it seemed Franca had forgotten about the matter, leaving Lumian no choice but to seek answers himself. Franca was taken aback, her surprise evident as she blurted out, You don't know? You join without any knowledge of the organization? Had it not been for Madame Judgment's confirmation that Lumian was a member, Franca would have suspected he was bluffing and hadn't actually joined. Lumian explained sincerely, I was on probation before, and after passing the assessment, my major arcana card left it to you to reveal the details. Franca accepted the explanation, recalling her own limited knowledge during her early days with the organization. She settled back into the recliner, crossing her legs and straightening her posture. We are all members of the Tarot Club. Tarot Club. 
Upon hearing the name, Lumian, already seated on the opposite sofa, showed no surprise. After all, members of this clandestine group adopted tarot cards as their code names. The core members were associated with the major arcana cards, while ordinary members bore the minor arcana cards. Franca's face gradually lit up with pride. Our tarot club is the most exceptional secret organization in the entire world. One could even argue it is among the most powerful. That's because our leader is a supreme entity standing at the apex of all deities. In other secret organizations, the deities they serve merely watch over and provide divine insight. They do not actively participate. However, before Mr. Fool descended into a deep slumber, he regularly convened gatherings in his divine kingdom for the major arcana cardholders. What do we call it? A true divine council. Other churches may have so-called divine councils, but at best, they are meetings held under the watchful gaze of a deity. It is not a gathering conducted in the presence of a deity with the deity's direct involvement. Franca pressed a hand to her chest and offered a slight bow. Praise the fool! Lumian had contemplated the tarot club's potential. After all, Madame Magician exuded an air of mystery and power. Yet, he never anticipated that the great existence she spoke of would be the leader of the tarot club. This shattered his preconceived notions of deities. After a moment of contemplation, he voiced his thoughts. Is Mr. Fool called the Fool because he holds the Fool card from the Major Arcana? So he, too, is a member of the Tarot Club? That is partly the reason, Franca replied after a brief pause. However, no one can confirm it. I suspect it is because the Fool is one of the many honorific names bestowed upon Mr. Fool. Hence, when establishing the secret organization, he chose the name Tarot Club and assigned different tarot cards to each member. But can we really address him directly as Mr. Fool? Lumian questioned, finding it somewhat blasphemous or disrespectful to refer to a deity using the honorific Mr. It seemed too ordinary and lacked the necessary sanctity. Franca smiled and assured him, there is no issue. It is said that Mr. Fool himself quite enjoys this form of address. Seeing that Lumian had no further inquiries, Franca continued. In many ritualistic magics, if you are unable to find a suitable recipient for your prayers, you can seek aid from Mr. Fool. Although the process may differ from your expectations, it will invariably lead to the desired outcome in a wondrous manner. The only caveat is that Mr. Fool is in a deep slumber, and we must not disturb him too often. According to my major arcana card, we should not do so more than once a month unless absolutely necessary. Reciting his honorific name alone will not draw attention or assistance. In fact, it may result in failure and pose a certain risk. The power inadvertently released by a slumbering deity is capable of obliterating us countless times over. Thus, we must perform a ritual to ensure our safety. Madame Magician had mentioned this before, but as per her explanation, Mr. Fool's slumber holds more significance than mere sleep. Franca seems unaware of the details. Lumian contemplated this as he asked thoughtfully, What kind of deity is Mr. Fool? Franca cleared her throat and replied, My lecture wouldn't do it justice. Ha, ah, I don't remember all that much. I suggest you visit Mr. Fool's cathedral and listen to the bishop's sermons. Mr. Fool's cathedral? Lumian exclaimed in surprise. Was there a cathedral dedicated to Mr. Fool in Trier? Weren't there only two churches in Intis? Franca explained, Mr. Fool's church primarily resides in the Rorsted archipelago of the Sonia Sea and some locations in the southern continent. However, due to the beliefs of many merchants, sailors, bounty hunters, and treasure seekers at sea, we often encounter followers of Mr. Fool at Lavini Docks in the Square District. Later, for certain reasons, the two churches agreed to construct a small cathedral there for Mr. Fool's church, allowing passing sea merchants to offer their prayers. However, proselytizing or preaching outside the cathedral is strictly prohibited. Most Triarians are unaware of its existence. The square district lay on the north bank of the Srenzo River, west of Trier. Lavini docks bustled with various goods arriving from numerous seaside ports. Sea merchants frequently passed through, 
while sailors sought to experience the vibrancy and prosperity of Trier. To the west of Lavini docks stood Trocadero Town, renowned for its Trocadero liquor. Lumian nodded and said, I shall find time to visit and listen. With that settled, he asked curiously, what is the connection between Mr. Fool's Church and our tarot club? Chapter 265 The Major Arcana Cards Franca, sitting cross-legged in the recliner, had long pondered over this question. After careful consideration, a smile curved on her lips as she spoke, Mr. Fool's Church is akin to an independent subsidiary of our tarot club. Observing Lumian's bewilderment, she went on to explain, each of our tarot club's major arcana cards represents an influential figure in the world, be it in reality or mysticism. I suspect that the Pope of the Fool's Church is one such figure. As for the other major arcana cards, they may lead different organizations. While these organizations might not believe in Mr. Fool, they can provide assistance to certain operations of the Tarot Club. To put it simply, the Tarot Club is the highest governing body directly overseen by Mr. Fool. Each holder of a major arcana card possesses a distinguished status in their own sphere of influence. And one such holder is the Fool's Church, Frank elaborated. Lumian grasped Franca's meaning roughly and inquired, How many major arcana cards do we have? Franca shook her head and replied, I cannot provide an exact number as the identities of the major arcana card holders are kept confidential. The only card we interact with the most is the major arcana card to which we are subordinate. Well, mine is Madam Judgment. Mine is Madam Magician, Lumian added. Franca chuckled, it seems that these two cards often appear together. Yes, our tarot club has a habit of scattering the entire deck of tarot cards at the scene after completing a task. We also place the card that represents us in the most prominent position. Isn't that wasteful? Lumian interrupted Franca. What harm is there in using a deck of tarot cards? Don't you find such actions cool? Franca muttered. You can leave the card that represents you, but what use is a deck without one? You'll have to buy a new one next time. If you visit the factory and customize a large number of tarot cards with just one card, you'll become an easy target. I can draw it myself, Lumian proposed, already formulating a solution. While he couldn't replicate the printed quality, he could capture the main characteristics of the Seven of Wands. Franca fell silent for a moment, then said, wouldn't something you draw have a mystical connection? Wouldn't you have to expend energy to counter divination? Sigh, we don't have to scatter them every time. We don't have to scatter them when working with non-tarot club members. We don't have to scatter them during stealth missions, such as the one we're on now. And we don't have to scatter them when we're under suspicion. Damn it. How did we get off track? What I wanted to convey is that due to the tarot club's customs and traditions, I've learned from various newspapers and mystical gatherings about the more active major arcana cards. Madam Justice has appeared multiple times on the mid seashore coast, in Trier, and Backlund. Mr. Hangman has made appearances at sea. We have Madam Hermit and Mr. Sun, as well as Mr. Moon and Mr. Star from the Southern Continent. As for any other major arcana card holders, I'm unaware. Madam Justice, Mr. Hangman, Mr. Sun, Madam Hermit, Mr. Star, Mr. Moon. Lumian realized that the names possessed an air of mystery and sophistication, unlike the mundane-sounding Seven of Wands and Two of Cups. After pondering for a while, he recognized a crucial point mentioned by Franca, Madam Justice had been seen in Mid-Seashire, Trier, and Backlund. Apart from Madam Judgment and Madam Magician, this was the only major arcana card with confirmed sightings in Trier. Lumian distinctly recalled that Madam Susie had mentioned the possibility of people from the West Mid Seashore coast being beyonders of the spectator pathway. This implied that she had a good understanding of the West Mid Seashore coast. Considering that she and the other psychiatrist were in Trier, their areas of activity overlapped by at least two thirds with Madam Justice's. Furthermore, when Madam Magician mentioned that the two psychiatrists were equals and that his psychological problem involved matters at a higher level, Lumian suspected that one of them was Madam Justice. 
based on the fact that both Madam Magician and Madam Judgment preferred to address themselves with tarot cards and conceal their true names, it was more likely that the enigmatic lady sitting across from him was the holder of the major arcana card, Justice. Susie, on the other hand, seemed to be her subordinate minor arcana card. With these thoughts in mind, Lumian glanced at Franca, who had adjusted her sitting position, and spoke, Were you planning to find a genuine psychiatrist for Jenna's brother from within our tarot club? Franca, confused by Lumian's sudden change of topic, was taken aback. No, I intended to approach members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. I try my best not to contact my major arcana, Madam Judgment unless it's a particularly critical or serious matter. Although she always appears composed and willing to help, do you know? She's a true demigod and a prominent figure with godlike status. I can't burden her with trivial matters frequently. She says she doesn't mind, but who knows if she's truly honest. Each insignificant problem might decrease her favor towards me. When her favorability drops to a certain extent, a demigod has numerous ways to make your life unbearable. Besides, you won't even know why it's happening. I usually handle things on my own. If that fails, I turn to Gardner Martin or the members of the research society. And if that doesn't work, I consider reaching out to Madam Judgment. Lumian shared the same sentiment, but he had the excuse of reporting the mission's situation and suppressing Termoboros's influence. He could write to Madam Magician from time to time to gather information. In any case, he was already in the process of writing a letter. There was no harm in asking. Observing that Franca's psychiatrist wasn't the same as his own, Lumian didn't mention Susie. He nodded gently and replied, same here. Franca glanced around and lowered her voice. However, don't hesitate to seek help when you need it. The resources and influence wielded by major arcana card holders exceed your imagination. What you find difficult can be resolved with a mere command or thought. Wasn't my mystical item, the Ring of Punishment, incredibly powerful? Madam Judgment granted it to me directly upon my request. She even allowed me to owe an equivalent exchange for a period of time. Ah. Uh. I see how you obtained the Pyromaniac Potion formula and its main ingredients so quickly. You're not wrong. Lumian smiled, conveying to Franca that she had hit the mark. He believed that if he could acquire Beyonder characteristics that complemented the Shadow Branch, he could genuinely seek the help of Madame Magician in finding a Saint-level artisan to craft the corresponding mystical item. Compared to him, who was only a Sequence 7, Madame Magician, already a demigod, was more likely to be acquainted with a high-level artisan. Franca exhaled and continued the conversation. Every bearer of a major arcana card is a demigod, with a high probability of being a saint. At the very least, the more active ones don't seem to be at the level of grounded angels. However, Madam Judgment told me that the Tarot Club has more than one angel. At least eight saints, and more than one angel? They're even stronger than the Aurora Order. Truly befitting the most extraordinary secret organization. Lumian sighed, wondering if the Tarot Club's core members were exaggerating to instill a stronger sense of belonging among their subordinates. With a yearning expression, Franca added, My current dream is to progress step by step to sequence 5, then advance to sequence 4 of the Hunter Pathway and become a demigod. That would grant me the right to obtain a major arcana card. Not only would it mean greater strength and a sense of security, but it would also allow me to participate in the Divine Council and ask Mr. Fool about things once he awakens. According to Madam Magician, obtaining a major arcana card isn't dependent on advancing to sequence 4 and becoming a demigod. Lumian dealt Franca a blow to prevent her from having overly high expectations. However, Franca didn't mind at all. She smiled and said, In any case, my question will have to wait until Mr. Fool wakes up. When the time comes, demigods will undoubtedly be more qualified than other members to obtain a major arcana card. At this point, she looked at Lumian and continued, Apart from us, there are four more minor arcana cards active in Trier. In total, there are 23 cards in the world, but there might be fewer. Many Beyonders find it fashionable to scatter tarot cards at the scene of an incident and intentionally imitate us. 
they might do it to misdirect the official Beyonder's investigation. In Trier, the most renowned card is the Knight of Swords. At the beginning of the year, he detonated a warehouse belonging to the Southern Continent's terrorist organization, the Rose School of Thought. The warehouse concealed a significant amount of explosives, and non-human remains were found at the scene. Lumian listened attentively to Franca's account, gaining a better understanding of the Tarot Club and the major arcana and minor arcana cards. After a brief moment of contemplation, he asked, Do minor arcana cards have gatherings in the world of mysticism? No, Franca shook her head again. Unless we meet in person, like we have, we can only communicate through our respective major arcana cards. Yes, regular gatherings do take place between major arcana cards and Mr. Fool's Divine Kingdom. However, Madam Judgment mentioned once that in urgent situations, with the assistance of our major arcana, we can communicate in a way that transcends reality, but such occurrences are rare. Lumian had no further questions. After chatting for a while, he heard Jenna's footsteps ascending the stairs. He stood up, preparing to leave. Where are you going? Franca asked, puzzled. At this hour, there was nothing for him to do in Sal de Ball Breeze, so he might as well stay and play fighting evil, the game Emperor Roselle had invented. Lumian smiled, a mix of emotions in his expression. To the catacombs. The ashes of the lunatic flaming and the Roar couple were finally being laid to rest in the catacombs. Chapter 266 Catacombs Outside the police headquarters in the bustling market district, Lumian, donning the enigmatic prying glasses, climbed aboard the carriage adorned with painted irises. Two ordinary constables, clad in black uniforms, occupied the seats opposite, their feet resting beside three somber urns. The names of the departed flickered in fluorescent ink. Taking his place across from them before the carriage slowly steered forward, Lumian caught the older constable's inquisitive gaze. What brings you here? What's your connection to these departed souls? He remembered that two of the deceased had neither kin nor friends, and the remaining one had distant relatives who trembled at the mere mention of the name Flaming. Not only were they unwilling to come and collect the ashes and relics, but they also reluctantly admitted that they were related by blood or marriage. Lumian responded calmly. I'm their landlord, in a manner of speaking. Just the landlord? The older constable appeared skeptical. Officer, a landlord is a person too. They can feel for others. Lumian chuckled. I've shared a drink or had a chat with them. Accompanying their remains into the catacombs isn't a big deal. The younger constable feigned disinterest, gazing out the window, while the older constable exuded an air of familiarity. Youth suits you well. But in the motel or apartment business in the market district, you must guard against developing attachments to tenants. Otherwise, you'll either be deceived or heartbroken. After a few more such experiences, your enthusiasm for others will wane. Lumian offered a perfunctory reply, and the constable broached another subject. We still have Flaming's belongings. His kin refused to collect them. Would you like them? If not, we'll handle it ourselves. I'll take a look when I return from the catacombs, Lumian replied nonchalantly. During the journey from the market district to the place du Pertori in Cartier de l'Observatoire, the older constable chatted away, alternating between engaging Lumian and attempting to draw his colleague into conversation. His chatter seemed ceaseless. Finally reaching their destination, Lumian disembarked from the carriage, cradling Roar's ashes in his arms. Despite his outgoing nature, Lumian felt a newfound relief, as if his ears had been granted respite. The catacomb administrator, whom Lumian had encountered before, awaited their arrival. In his mid-thirties, of average build, with curly brown hair, a thick beard, and slightly upturned eyes, he sported yellow pants, a white shirt, and a blue vest. Kendall, why is it you again? The older constable greeted him warmly. Kendall held an unlit carbide lamp and smiled. Robert, I heard you were coming, so I made sure to delay my other duties and be here for you. As Kendall spoke, he scrutinized Lumian and emphasized, you didn't forget to bring the white candles, did you? That will be the last thing I forget. 
Robert, clutching flaming urn, fumbled in his pocket and retrieved three white candles. He tossed one to his colleague and another to Lumian. With everything in order, Kendall ignited the carbide lamp and turned around, leading them deeper into the darkness, down the stone staircase comprising 138 steps. Along the way, they passed a heavy wooden door engraved with two imposing sacred emblems and traversed a hushed corridor where even the sound of their breaths seemed amplified. Lumian was no stranger to such a foreboding atmosphere, but the young constable displayed signs of nervousness. He clutched Madame Michelle's urn tightly, seeking solace. After traversing a broad avenue, illuminated by gas street lamps, the quartet arrived at the catacombs' entrance. The natural cavern, subsequently modified, stood silently in the dim yellow glow. Skulls, skeletal arms, sunflowers, and reliefs depicting steam elements adorned both sides. Beyond them, an impenetrable darkness loomed. Etched on the lintel were two inscriptions in Intision, Halt! The Death Empire lies ahead. Although Lumian had witnessed this sight before, he still felt a profound sense of reverence. Unlike his previous curiosity and confusion, he now keenly grasped the gravity conveyed by these warnings and the surrounding environment. Beneath Trier's surface lurked countless perils capable of obliterating the entire city and even Intis itself. These dangers included, but were not limited to, Trier, the Tree of Shadow, and invisible flames from the fourth epoch. The catacombs, situated here, were unlikely to be innocuous. According to Asta Troll, a secret suppliant, visitors who descended into the catacombs with lit white candles invoked the protection of a concealed entity, akin to a ritual. Lumian couldn't help but suspect that opening such a place to the public served to suppress some subterranean peril, much like the new city erected upon Trier in the fourth epoch. Kendall turned to Lumian and the others. It's time to light the candles. We must ensure they don't go out before we leave the catacombs. If we happen to get separated, don't panic. Look for a road sign. If you can't find one, follow the black line above you until you reach the exit. With Kendall holding the carbide lamp, Lumian and the two others ignited their white candles, casting a soft yellowish glow. As the four candles flickered gently, Kendall extinguished the carbide lamp and led the way through the boulder gate, entering the realm of the Death Empire. Lumian followed closely behind, clutching the urn in one hand and the white candle in the other. Suddenly, a chill swept over him, sending shivers down his spine. But the cold didn't originate from his surroundings, it emanated from deep within his heart, causing his hair to stand on end. Simultaneously, Lumian felt eyes fixed upon him, their gazes piercing his soul. Using the flame of his candle, he looked to his right and saw pits carved into the stone wall, each one containing a ghastly skeletal corpse. The hollow-eyed skulls stared at him lifelessly, devoid of emotion. Lumian didn't avert his gaze as he carefully observed the corpses. He realized that the eerie sensation of being watched didn't stem from them, yet the feeling remained. An instinctive urge to activate his spirit vision surged within him, but he had changed since arriving in Trier. He had encountered enough to know that many warnings were inscribed with blood and tears by those who came before him. I shouldn't look at what I shouldn't. Since it poses no danger to me, there's no need to search for the source of this abnormality. Lumian silently muttered, turning his attention to the police officers beside him. They seemed oblivious to any anomaly and continued following the tomb administrator, Kendall, as if everything was normal. This made Lumian suspect that the experience was a result of the qualitative change in his spirituality after his advancement to Pyromaniac. It's good that you can't feel it. Lumian couldn't help but sigh. Under the weight of countless gazes, his skin erupted in goosebumps. He cautiously looked up and saw a thick black line painted on the top of the tomb, with an arrow pointing toward the exit. As he advanced, Lumian noticed that both sides of the path were lined with bones. Some were nestled in pits along the stone walls, others were piled by the roadside, and some were covered by tattered garments. Some lay bare, stripped of all burial items, their skulls coated in a layer of dark green mold. The air carried a diluted scent of decay. The catacombs were divided into multiple chambers, each designated by name, ensuring visitors could locate specific remains. 
Lumian and his companions followed Kendall through the narrow passage between the tomb chapel and the tomb memorial pillar. Ahead, they saw dozens of yellowish candles. At times, the flames clustered together like fireflies in the night, while other times they formed a river of dim starlight. Lumian glanced around casually and spotted a bride, her face veiled in white, adorned in a sanctified gown. Beside her stood a groom in a black tailcoat, a floral handkerchief adorning his chest pocket. Surrounding them were thirty to forty youths, holding lit white candles and laughing merrily. What's happening? Lumian couldn't hide his confusion. Kendall scoffed and explained, it's part of a wedding ceremony. Since last year, newlyweds have been bringing young guests into the catacombs, crossing paths with the deceased. It's become a popular tradition in Trier. Young folks are always daring, taking pride in their courage and delighting in scaring others. I've seen guests purposely pick up skeletal hands and pat the bride and groom on the shoulder, nearly causing them to faint in fear. Oh, you Trierians. Lumian shook his head in amusement. It didn't take long for the four of them to reach their destination, the Tomb of Lights. In the center stood a black pedestal, atop which an obelisk painted white bore the emblem of the sun. At its peak rested an ancient, extinguished oil lamp. The walls and floor were filled with bones, urns, and countless tear bottles. Upon entering, Lumian realized a problem. Where are Flaming's relatives? He had wanted Flaming to rest alongside his children, wife, and parents. After a brief moment of contemplation, Lumian suddenly understood why Flaming hadn't specified the location of his kin's remains. He felt guilty and self-reproachful. Flaming desired to be with his family, yet he didn't dare approach them. He intended to stay in the same chamber and watch over them from a distance. An indescribable sorrow enveloped Lumian as he stood silently choosing to honor Flaming's final wish. He found an empty spot and gently placed the urn of the troubled soul. Once Robert and the others had arranged the urns of the Ruhr couple, the four of them offered simultaneous prayer, either uttering praise the sun or by steam. On their way back, they encountered the newlyweds and their young entourage. As Lumian brushed past them, he noticed a young couple in the group. Seizing the moment when the tomb administrator's attention waned, they impulsively attempted to blow out the white candle in their hands, curious to see what would happen. Whoosh! They had indeed done it. The two yellowish flames were extinguished. In that instant, Lumian's mind turned adrift. Quickly regaining his composure, he realized the young couple had vanished without a trace. They're gone. Lumian's eyes widened as he tried to comprehend the situation. A few seconds later, he accepted the undeniable truth. The young couple had truly vanished. Lumian then shifted his gaze back to the entourage. Whether it was the newlyweds leading the way, the attending guests, or those at the rear, no one seemed to notice anyone missing. They continued to smile, joke, and move forward. Chapter 267 Remains for a moment, Lumian thought he must be seeing things. There was no sign of the couple, nor any attempt to put out the candle flames. If Lumian hadn't witnessed it himself and been well aware of the dangers lurking in underground trier, he might have questioned whether the problem was with his own mind rather than searching for any trace of the couple's existence. The people behind the couple hastened their steps and caught up to the person in front, closing the sudden gap in the procession. They showed no surprise, fear, or confusion. Everything appeared normal. Lumian, already aware of the countless unseen gazes fixed upon him, felt the goosebumps on his skin intensify. Subconsciously, he glanced at Kendall, the tomb administrator, who led the way with two police officers, to gauge his reaction to the recent events. Clad in yellow trousers and a blue vest, Kendall held an extinguished carbide lamp in one hand and a quietly burning white candle in the other. He walked directly toward the exit of the catacombs, seemingly oblivious to the strange happenings surrounding the entourage. Suddenly, Kendall turned around and met Lumian's gaze. Is something the matter? Kendall's deep voice reverberated through the passageway, echoing in the nearby skull chambers. Lumian maintained a composed demeanor and replied calmly. I'm afraid I might get lost. Kendall nodded almost imperceptibly. 
then I'll slow down. He continued toward the exit, deliberately reducing his pace. He staggered slightly, remaining silent, resembling a zombie from a horror novel. Lumian held the flickering yellow candle and passed by the laughing wedding party participants, who occasionally made eye contact with the white skulls. Thoughts raced through his mind. They truly didn't notice that someone was missing. When they leave the catacombs, will the families of the man and woman discover their absence? I've always wondered. The catacombs are open to the public, and university students often take risks and dance among the bones. Are there truly no issues? Even visitors guided by the catacomb administrators disobey the warnings, let alone youngsters who venture in with a solitary white candle. Initially, I believed there were safety measures or that accidents were infrequent enough not to deter those individuals. Now, it seems to be a different matter altogether. Lumian suspected that not only would the body of the person consumed by the catacombs vanish, but even the memory of their existence would be erased from the minds of friends and relatives. Why can I remember them? Could it be because Termoboros is sealed within me, connecting my fate to his to some extent? Why do the government and the two churches continue to open such a perilous place to the public? Do the catacombs require a constant flow of living people to keep something suppressed? Are those who disregard the warnings deemed necessary sacrifices? The more Lumian dwelled on it, the more his hair stood on end. He forced himself not to delve further into the analysis. Without sufficient information, he couldn't explore the matter any deeper. Regardless, there was nothing worth investigating within the catacombs. Visiting occasionally posed no threat as long as he adhered to the rules. Once they entered the catacombs, the talkative police officer, Robert, fell silent, clearly uncomfortable in the environment. With his silence, the conversation ceased. In an indescribable silence, the quartet retraced their steps to the natural entrance adorned with intricate reliefs and emerged back into the open. As soon as Lumian crossed the threshold, he sensed the countless invisible gazes vanish. The chill in his body dissipated, and his skin quickly returned to normal. Phew. Robert exhaled deeply. I always feel uneasy whenever I'm in the catacombs. Kendall, how can you go in more than ten times a day and still be so cheerful? Kendall chuckled and replied, Do you think we remain unaffected? If we're not on night duty, those with families rush to find their wives. If not, they head to places like Rue de la Muraille and bask in the warmth of others. To be honest, after spending so much time here, I feel as if I'm slowly turning into a corpse. As they conversed, Kendall lit the carbide lamp and extinguished the candle in his hand. Returning to the surface, Robert glanced at the police headquarters carriage parked outside the entrance building and sheepishly smiled at his colleague and Lumian. That prolonged discomfort makes me need to use the loo. Wait for me. I'll go to the restroom first. With that, he headed toward the two-story building, painted a muddy gray, which served as the ticket office for the catacombs. Lumian gazed at the stone-engraved dome and positioned himself by a pillar at the edge, absent-mindedly observing the pedestrians on Place du Pertori. The other police officer boarded the carriage and settled into wait. At that moment, Lumian felt a sudden chill. It resembled the sensation he experienced upon entering the catacombs, though not as intense. Instinctively, he warily turned around and saw Kendall, the tomb administrator, standing behind him, wearing an expressionless face. What's the matter? Lumian calmly inquired. Kendall, with his thick brown beard, spoke in a deep voice, What were you looking at? Lumian's heart sank as he responded with a mixture of sincerity and pretense, Which aspect are you referring to? When we passed by that group of people on our way back. Kendall's tone remained neutral. Lumian acted as though a light bulb had switched on. I find the concept of a wedding among the dead quite intriguing. They seemed unafraid and were enjoying themselves. Kendall scrutinized him for a couple of seconds before nodding. Don't imitate them. With that, the tomb administrator carried the unlit carbide lamp and made his way toward the muddy gray building that housed them. Before long, Police officer Robert jogged back, and the carriage departed for Le Marquet du Cartier du Gentleman. 
in the evidence room deep within the corridor on the first floor of the Market District's police headquarters, Robert led Lumi into a wooden frame divided into multiple compartments and pointed to one of them. Here, Flaming's belongings. Among the items, there was a dark suitcase, a fountain pen, paper, an ink bottle, and several large books crammed inside. Lumian pulled out one of the books and quickly skimmed through its pages. He realized it was a mineralogy textbook focusing on Trier's underground rock formations. As an unschooled youth, the content proved challenging, with numerous unfamiliar words that were exclusive to mineralogy. The other books were also mineralogy texts, some containing basic teaching materials while others comprised complex collections of papers. Confirming this, Lumian retrieved the suitcase, placed it on the floor, and opened it. Inside, along with two sets of clothes and daily essentials, the suitcase was filled with small grayish-white cloth bags. Each bag had a different name written on it with a fountain pen, flower, sedge, sheep. These are the names Flaming mentioned, referring to the various rock strata beneath Trier. Could these bags contain corresponding mineral specimens? Lumian briefly recollected Flaming's words and formed a rough idea of what the cloth bags contained. Despite his madness, Flaming hadn't forgotten to bring along his research subjects. But all of this held little significance for Lumian, and he began contemplating letting the police headquarters handle them. Just then, Termoboros's magnificent voice resonated in his ears. The cloth bag on the far right. Oh, so a loser like you is finally speaking up again? Lumian's initial reaction was to mock Termoboros. However, he turned his gaze toward the cloth bag hinted at by the inevitability angel, feeling a mix of surprise and suspicion. The cloth bag rested on the far right side of the suitcase, sandwiched between flaming socks and his razor. Dark blue ink formed a combination of terms on its surface, earth blood. Earth. Blood. Lumian, crouching beside the suitcase, silently muttered as he calmly picked up the cloth bag in front of the police officer, Robert, and opened it. Inside the bag was a brown rock pockmarked with potholes. Each depression contained dark red speckles, resembling blood seeping from the earth. For some reason, just looking at it filled Lumian with a sense of frustration. He refrained from touching the mineral specimen with his bare hands. Instead, he securely tied the cloth bag and placed it back in the suitcase. He swiftly skimmed through the book detailing the materials found in Trier's underground rock formations, searching for answers. With a clear target in mind, he quickly discovered the answer. Earth blood rock stratum lies between 55 and 56 meters underground in Trier and has a thickness of approximately 0.76 meters. This is the deepest mineral we can gather. Beyond lies the forbidden ancient ruins reserve. Beside this textbook description, Flaming's familiar handwriting jotted a few words. A small number of ores within the earth blood rock stratum are more peculiar than the others. They are suspected to contain volatile toxins that can induce irritability and lead to a mental illness known as mania. A researcher suddenly went berserk and slashed his colleague. To handle specific mineral specimens from the earth blood rock stratum, one must wear corresponding protective gear. Earth blood is a rock stratum near Fourth Epic Trier? It's undeniably peculiar. No wonder Termoboros made me pay attention. As Lumian pondered, Robert urged, Do you want them or not? Make a decision quickly. Yes, Lumian responded, rising to his feet. Even though he only desired the mineral specimen from the earth blood rock stratum and the mineralogy textbook detailing Trier's underground rocks, he signed and took possession of all of Flaming's belongings to avoid arousing suspicion. Upon returning to room 207 of Aubert's Du Coke door, Lumian neglected to wash off his enigmatic makeup. He whispered to Termoboros, What makes this mineral specimen so special? Termoboros's voice echoed in Lumian's ears once more. Don't tell me you think it's normal for the Montsouris ghost to spare flaming? Chapter 268 Possible Encounters Upon hearing Termoboros's question, Lumian felt a jolt of alarm. He had never suspected that there might be something amiss with Flaming's prolonged stay at Aubert's Ducoke door, evading the clutches of the Montsouris ghost. 
From Lumian's perspective, Flaming's immediate family and wife had already met their demise, and it was only a matter of time before he met a similar fate. The archives at Psychic's headquarters revealed instances where victims had been slain by the Montsouris ghost up to eleven months after encountering it. While Flaming's circumstances were rare, they were not unprecedented. In an instant, Lumian's mind seized upon an intriguing detail. The previous victims had all met their end within the same year of their encounter, whereas Flaming had crossed paths with the ghost last year. He had even sought the sanctuary of the clergy during the New Year festivities. Although less than a year had passed since Flaming's encounter with the Montsouris ghost and his subsequent suicide, it was an unprecedented delay compared to the other cases. Could this earth blood or be responsible for protecting Flaming, causing the Montsouris ghost to repeatedly postpone its actions and disrupt its usual patterns? Lumian asked Termoboros, his voice hushed, seeking confirmation. Termoboros was a true angel, devoid of power due to a perfect seal but possessing remarkable insight knowledge, and level made him capable of deciphering many matters. Termoboros replied in a majestic voice, it instills fear and repulsion in the Montsouris ghost, but it holds no power of its own. For you, this could be a crucial key. A key? Lumian swiftly made numerous connections. The key to a hidden chamber in Fourth Epic Trier? Termoboros responded in an unusually deep voice, you will inevitably enter Fourth Epic Trier. It is where your destiny, both treacherous and serendipitous, awaits you. Rather than remaining passive, it would be wiser to explore proactively, leveraging the insights gained from each venture to better prepare yourself. Aren't you revealing your intentions too quickly? Lumian couldn't help but chuckle. Are you trying to hasten my demise? So that you may utilize the unique underground environment to block the signal of the collapsing seal and ensure your own safe escape? Given that the Tree of Shadow hadn't taken root in Fourth Epic Trier, Lumian held no interest in venturing underground. Without awaiting Termoboros's response, he left the room and made his way to the nearest washroom, eager to wash off the mystical makeup that concealed his true identity. Having eliminated the latent threat, Lumian settled at a wooden table and began to write. It was clear that both Flaming and the Earth Blood Ore were extraordinary cases. He couldn't simply follow Termoboros's directives, consulting Madame Magician was imperative. If he lacked knowledge and blindly believed the words of an angel tied to an evil deity, he would inevitably suffer dire consequences, even risking his life. Termoboros's voice resonated once more. Can you truly trust this magician, this tarot club, as they claim? They sealed me within your body instead of seeking my eradication. I fear they have ulterior motives, intending to exploit you for their nefarious purposes. They cast you into Trier, the very heart of the storm, yet they displayed no concern nor made any inquiries about your well-being. Don't you find this suspicious? It cannot be explained away as mere training. Lumian beamed and said with a sigh, Have you never deceived or manipulated others in the past, relying solely on your status and abilities to achieve your goals? Would you like me to purchase a copy of The Art of Persuasion and read it aloud daily for your instruction? Allow me to enlighten you. Such tricks wouldn't have ensnared me during my early teenage years. I am well aware of those I can depend on, my true friends, my adversaries, and those I must remain wary of. Termoboros fell silent, seemingly contemplating whether to acquire the art of rhetoric. Lumian swiftly penned a letter to Madame Magician, detailing the recent developments, and entrusted it, along with the earth blood ore, to the puppet messenger he had summoned. In due time, a reply arrived from Madame Magician, who returned the mineral specimen. I'm relieved to see that you remained cautious and didn't fully trust Termoboros's words. However, there is some truth to what he said. The ore lacks inherent power, but it carries remnants of unknown auras and characteristics, mostly dissipated. It won't aid you directly but it seems destined to bring about encounters in the future, which could be either beneficial or detrimental. Its current state is highly chaotic, making it difficult to provide an accurate interpretation. What Termoboros intentionally misled you about is that the fortuitous encounter he spoke of might not necessarily occur in Fourth Epic Trier, but somewhere underground. If, in the future, you wish to explore the potential encounters and are prepared to take risks, 
carry it with you whenever you venture into underground trier. Alternatively, if you wish to avoid the risk, keep it safely stored in your room. The symbolic elements I mentioned previously have already begun to unfold. A friend of mine mentioned that he possesses great proficiency in deciphering such matters. Once he completes his current tasks, I will arrange for you to meet him. Suddenly, a blaze erupted from Lumian's hand, reducing the letter to ashes. Contemplating the words of both Madame Magician and Termoboros, Lumian couldn't help but believe that the earth blood or before him could trigger some kind of mutation within underground trier. It could lead to a fortuitous encounter or even claim his life. For now, it's best not to take unnecessary risks, Lumian thought, aware of his current strengths. As a Sequence 7 pyromaniac, he had overcome any deficiencies in both close quarters combat and long range attacks, excelling in hand to hand combat and spell casting. He had surpassed the limitations of an ordinary individual. However, hunters leaned more towards conventional battles and lacked the peculiar abilities and methods to deal with the peculiarities of Underground Trier. Lumian decided to wait until he had fully digested the pyromaniac potion and obtained the contract T boon. Then, he would consider carrying the earth blood or based on the information he had gathered about Underground Trier. It would be even better if he could transform the Shadow Branch into a mystical item before that. Suppressing his thoughts, Lumian took the mineral specimen to Rue de Blouse's blanches and concealed it in his safe house. Before the afternoon sun waned, he delved into Aurora's grimoire, meticulously studying its contents alongside Franca's teachings and his own experiences with fire spells, searching for any potential issues. After more than an hour, Lumian stumbled upon a section about summoning creatures from the spirit world and forging contracts. His mind immediately turned to white paper, Aurora's contracted creature. The fragile spirit entity possessed the ability to withstand a specific ability of the contractor. I wonder if the contract between Aurora and White Paper has been severed. According to the notebook, aside from the designated ritual, the contract can only be broken if one of the parties is completely deceased. Regrettably, contracted creatures can only be summoned by the contractor and not by others like a messenger. Otherwise, I could utilize White Paper to determine if Aurora is truly deceased. H.M. Is it possible that Aurora left behind any information with White Paper? Lost in thought, Lumian's mind shifted to another matter that had previously escaped his notice. Considering that Aurora occasionally gained clarity and assisted him in cutting up the lever blue, reassembling letters, and seeking aid from the authorities, and since her initial response in the dream was to summon the messenger of the curly-haired baboons research society's vice president, Gila, to seek her counsel, why didn't she occasionally summon the messenger when she was lucid and inform Madame Gila about her predicament? In Madame Gila's earliest response to me, she clearly seemed unaware of the situation. What prevented Aurora from making such an attempt? Or could it be that she did summon a messenger, and Gila is concealing it? Lumian narrowed his eyes. Without the accompanying memories, he couldn't discern the source of the problem. For now, he wasn't overly suspicious of Gila, believing there must be another explanation. It was worth noting that Gila's messenger knew Lumian's exact location. If the woman was truly entangled in Kordu's affairs and played a dishonorable role, she would undoubtedly wish to eliminate the final survivor without leaving any loose ends. Yet, all this time, she not only refrained from making any substantial moves but also kindly provided knowledge and suggestions. For a moment, Lumian considered writing down his questions and sending them to Gila to gauge her response. However, he restrained himself, fearing that it might expose the king's new clothes and lead to unfavorable outcomes. He decided to first have a conversation with Franca and gather opinions from her teammates in the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society and the Tarot Club regarding Gila's trustworthiness. If Franca believed Gila to be reliable and had shared information about the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society with her major arcana card, Lumian would request Madame Magician to keep a watchful eye before sending inquiries to Gila. He forced himself to regain composure and resumed studying Aurora's grimoire. Only when evening arrived did he leave Rue de Blouse's blanches, making his way onto Avenue du Marquet and entering his salle de bal breeze. Good evening, boss. 
Greetings echoed from all directions as Lumian nodded in acknowledgement and led Louis and Sarkota to the second floor. Before he could settle in at the café, René, the dance hall manager, approached him. The slender middle-aged man pressed a hand to his chest and bowed respectfully. Monsieur Seal, Monsieur Martin requests your presence at Rue de Fontaine's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Boss wants to see me? Lumian was both surprised and delighted. He was taken aback that Gardener Martin had sent for him despite the recent lack of incidents. Yet, he couldn't help but feel a sense of joy at the prospect of further interaction with Gardener Martin and the opportunity to gain his trust to join the Iron and Blood Cross Order. Chapter 269, Islander All right. Lumian nodded at manager René. Lumian dabbed his mouth with a napkin and rose to his feet. He strolled towards one of the café's balconies, casting his eyes over the nocturnal scenery of Avenue du Marquet. The gas street lamps cast a soft, golden glow, illuminating the carriages and pedestrians that traversed the road. At that moment, people streamed into Sal de Ball Breeze one after another, joining the revelry within. To be honest, Lumian preferred the cozy atmosphere of the basement bar at Aubert's Du Coke door to this place. It allowed him to unwind and find enjoyment. From his perspective, the patrons of Sal de Ball Breeze were excessively self-indulgent. They cared little for their families or their futures. All they sought was a night of revelry, drowning themselves in alcohol, beauty, dance, and uproar. In contrast, the regulars at the basement bar were mostly tenants of Aubert's Du Coke door. They would return around 9 or 10 p.m. and had to be in bed by 1 a.m. They drank, sang, boasted, and frolicked, making the most of those fleeting two to three hours to find their own slice of joy. Only then did they gather the courage to face the arduous tasks of the following day and embrace the promise of a new dawn. It was akin to kerosene lamps that required regular refueling to continue casting their light. Lumian surveyed Avenue du Marquet for a few minutes before his attention was abruptly drawn to a familiar figure. There stood Charlie, adorned in a white shirt and blue waistcoat, embroiled in a street brawl, his formal coat casually slung over his arm. Now we're talking. Lumian smiled a touch of nostalgia and sentimentality washing over him as he used an expression that had recently gained popularity. Pressing his right hand against the balcony, Lumian gracefully leaped from the second floor, landing nimbly at the edge of Avenue du Marquet. With a few brisk strides, he reached the scene of Charlie's altercation. He made no move to intervene or assist Charlie. Instead, he observed the fight with keen interest. The other party engaged in this scuffle with Charlie was a slender young man in his mid-twenties, possessed of dark skin and sunken eyes. His lips were thick, and his slightly curly black hair marked him as a descendant of the Fog Sea Islander lineage. However, compared to his fellow islanders, he appeared somewhat more presentable. Cheat! You damn cheat! Charlie spat out, his curses interwoven with their tussle. The islander, donning a blue shirt with a fountain pen tucked in his breast pocket, deftly dodged Charlie's onslaught while offering an explanation. I didn't want this to happen either. I, too, fell victim to deceit. Dogs hit. Charlie's kick missed its mark. The two engaged in their amateurish scuffle until their breath grew ragged. Simultaneously, they slowed their movements and eventually ceased their struggle. Only then did Charlie notice Lumian standing beside him, observing the brawl with a smile. Seal, it's Monette. That swindler. The one who conned me out of ten verl d'or, nearly leaving me to starve. Charlie's face lit up as he eagerly revealed the identity of his islander adversary. Praise the sun for granting me this encounter. The islander whom Charlie deemed deserving of a dire fate. Lumian chuckled to himself. You're partly to blame as well. Haven't you heard the saying? Never trust an islander. I thought we were friends, Charlie muttered, his frustration evident. How could you be so naive and easily swayed? You two possess a certain knack for mischief. People like you can be easily ensnared by scheming individuals, falling into their traps without gaining either the affection or the riches you desire. Ah, you've already fallen victim. 
Lumian chastised, shifting his gaze towards the islander named Monette. Monette responded with an obsequious smile. I genuinely intended to help Charlie find employment, but I, too, fell prey to a scam and lost all my money. I couldn't face Charlie, so I secretly departed from Aubert's du Coke door. As he spoke, he reached into his pocket and withdrew a stack of banknotes, counting three five roll door bills. He handed them over to Charlie. I returned to the market district to find you and return your money, along with interest. Charlie's emotions eased considerably as he verified the authenticity of the three banknotes under the glow of the street lamps. He asked, still somewhat suspicious, are you someone who gets scammed easily? Ever since Charlie had encountered Monat until his departure, he had only witnessed him conning others. He had never seen him on the receiving end of such deals. True to his islander identity. Monette sheepishly smiled and replied, Not only was I swindled once, but I fell for it a second time. The first instance, I encountered a group of people who claimed that Sal de Ball Unique and Cartier de l'Observatoire wanted to expand and were offering shares for sale. Each lot cost a mere 200 verl d'or. You all know how lucrative the dance hall is. I couldn't resist dipping into my savings, but the share subscription certificate I received turned out to be counterfeit. I confronted them, only to be swindled once more. Sal de Bal Unique. Lumian's eyelids twitched involuntarily. The bankrupt merchant, Fitz, residing in room 401 of Aubert's du Coke door, had previously been duped out of 100,000 verl d'or by the owner of Sal de Bal Unique, Timmins. Fitz had sought Lumian's aid in recovering the sum, but Lumian had investigated and consulted several sources. He found the dance hall's practices dubious, possessing a formidable network. They appeared to wield considerable power, causing Lumian to abandon the commission. Now, he had encountered another victim of Sal de Bal Unique. You were swindled by them once before. How did you fall for it a second time? Charlie couldn't fathom such foolishness. Monette cleared his throat twice. They openly confessed to being a group of swindlers and refused to return the money. They even said that reporting them to the authorities would be futile. Impressed by my skills, they asked if I was willing to learn the art of deception from them, allowing me to recoup my losses. In the end, they merely taught me what I already knew. They only gave me something else. What was it? Charlie was always a curious one. In the blink of an eye, Monette retrieved a transparent monocle from his pocket. He smoothly placed it into his right eye socket. For some reason, Lumian sensed an inexplicable change in Monette as soon as he wore the monocle. It was as if he had transformed into a different character altogether. The corners of Monette's mouth curled slightly as he positioned the monocle over his right eye. He glanced at Charlie first, then turned his gaze towards Lumian. His eyes shifted from Lumian's face to his chest and hands. Lumian felt a subtle unease, but he detected no immediate danger. Monette smiled and said, Are you Seal, the mastermind behind the idiot instrument? Yes. Lumian did not deny it and remained silently cautious. Monette adjusted the monocle on his right eye. Quite adept at pulling pranks, I must say. Would you like this monocle? It's of no use to me. I could exchange it for some cash. With it, you can disguise yourself as a member of Sal de Bal Unique and earn a good amount of money there. Do I look like a fool to you? Lumian promptly rejected Monette's suggestion without hesitation. I have no interest in donning monocles. He had always been skeptical of the peculiar rules of Sal de Bal Unique, keeping his guard up. Disappointed, Monette redirected his gaze, removed the monocle, and turned to Charlie. I've given you the money and the interest. If you ever need anything in the future, come find me at Sal de Bal Unique. Charlie scoffed dismissively. He still harbored suspicions that Monette had intended to scam him in the past. After the islander left Avenue du Marquet, Lumian turned to Charlie. Remember to keep your distance from that fellow. Otherwise, you might end up encountering the same situation with Susanna Mattis. The latter part of his statement was a fabrication, primarily to instill fear in Charlie and ensure he took the advice seriously. Charlie was instantly alarmed. 
Without questioning further, he hastily nodded and replied, All right, all right. At midnight, Lumian and Jenna, the latter wearing a sparkling red dress, exited Sal de Ball Breeze and made their way towards Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Jenna did not inquire about the reason for their route. After a moment of silence, she spoke up. Have you ever felt like nothing matters? Lost and devoid of motivation? Definitely, Lumian replied casually, his gaze fixed on the street ahead. In such moments, you must rediscover the meaning of life and determine what truly matters to you. Jenna fell silent once more. After a while, she asked, Have you ever experienced something akin to an illusion shattering within you? A mysterious cosmos materializing, adorned with stars of varying sizes? No, Lumian replied after a brief pause. He had experienced the sensation of illusory objects abruptly disintegrating. It occurred every time the potion was completely digested. However, he knew nothing of the mysterious cosmos or the glimmering stars of different magnitudes. Jenna remained silent, deep in thought about the implications of this phenomenon or contemplating other matters. Soon enough, they arrived at apartment 601, three Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Franco was already back and regarded them warily as they entered side by side. Before she could inquire, Jenna brought up the topic of the shattered illusions and the appearance of the mysterious cosmos. Franco was taken aback but spoke joyfully, your assassin potion has been fully digested. Assassinating a parliament member in public and under heavy security certainly facilitated the digestion process. Is this a sign of potion digestion? Lumian couldn't hide his surprise and perplexity. Why do I experience only the first half and not the second? Franca scrutinized him suspiciously. You've never experienced it before? How did you advance then? Not only is the seal on me restraining Termoboros, but it also restricts some of my mystical senses? That's right. The seal resides within me. It's impossible for it to have zero impact. Lumi informed a vague hypothesis and casually brushed it off. It wasn't as pronounced. Franca, more concerned about her female companion, did not press the matter further and curiously asked Jenna, So, have you managed to summarize the principles of acting? Acting principles? Jenna pondered for a moment. After the assassination, I learned many principles. Yes, assassination is a matter of risking one's life. It is the ultimate form of punishment, a calamity for those criminals. Enthusiastically delving into the acting method and discussing acting principles with Jenna, Franca suddenly remembered Lumian's presence. What? What's the matter? She glanced at her male companion, who had settled onto the sofa. Lumian met her gaze and indicated that they needed to speak privately. Jenna instantly understood, excused herself to change clothes, and retreated into the guest bedroom. Lumian lowered his voice and addressed Franca, What do you make of Hila? What kind of person do you think she is? Chapter 270, Agreement Madam Hila? How do you know her? Franca's immediate reaction was one of surprise and astonishment. She quickly remembered that Lumian's sister, Muggle, was also a member of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. She hastily added, Did your sister mention Madame Hila to you? Lumian nodded. Not only did she mention her, but she also gave me the incantation to summon Madame Hila's messenger. Did she suggest seeking help from Madame Hila when you faced trouble? Franca speculated. Are you planning to summon Madame Hila's messenger and ask if she can be trusted? Sort of, Lumian affirmed. I've already established a connection with Madame Hila and summoned her messenger but today I realized that some of my sister's actions during the disaster in Cordu were unusual. It seems to be connected to Madame Hila. I don't know if I should question her directly. Observing that Lumian hadn't provided further details about the disaster in Cordu or Aurora's abnormal behavior, Franca understood why and refrained from prying. She pondered and replied, Personally, I trust Madame Hila. Damn it, you've established a connection with her without even telling me. Well, she's one of the most advanced members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society on the Paths of the Divine. There are suspicions that she belongs to the Corpse Collector Pathway. 
Not only does she willingly share her knowledge and experience with us, but she also offers assistance whenever possible. The items she trades are only slightly more expensive than their cost price. To many of us, including your sister and me, Madame Hila is like a dependable older sister. She has rescued us from helplessness, anxiety, and indecision. We trust her implicitly. Understood, Lumian sighed with relief. I'll have an honest conversation with Madame Hila to uncover the true cause of the problem. At this point, he changed the subject. Does your major arcana card know about the curly-haired baboons research society? I haven't mentioned it to her directly. All I said was that I joined a secret organization that provides mutual assistance. However, she seems to be aware of the research society's situation, Franca lowered her voice unconsciously. I suspect I'm not the only member of the Tarot Club in the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. With his lingering doubts cleared, Lumian turned around, smiling, and waved his hand. I'm going to summon Madame Hila's messenger. Hey, it's still early. Wanna play fighting evil for a couple of hours before heading back? Franca, who wasn't fond of going to bed early, tried to find some entertainment. Lumian rejected her without hesitation. When he returned to room 207 of Aubert's Du Coke door, Lumian didn't rush to summon Hila's messenger. Instead, he unfolded a piece of paper and wrote to Madame Magician once again. He briefly mentioned the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society and informed the demigod that Aurora was willing to seek help anonymously from the authorities when she was lucid. However, she hadn't summoned Hila's messenger for advice, which didn't align with her behavior in Lumian's dream. He didn't know if Aurora was under another restriction or if there was an issue with Hila. Before long, Madame Magician replied with a simple line, Based on the information we have, Hila is trustworthy. Phew. Lumian relaxed and began writing a letter to Madame Hila. In the letter, he candidly pointed out Aurora's abnormality and asked if she had missed receiving any letters. Skilled in the process, Lumian made slight adjustments to the altar and changed the ingredients. He swiftly summoned a human skull that appeared to be made of pure silver. As he gazed at the pale white flames silently burning in the skull's eye sockets, Pyromaniac Lumian felt a greater sense of danger emanating from it than ever before. It was no less intense than the feeling he got from Madame Magician's puppet messenger. The pure silver skull clamped onto the letter and vanished into the dense darkness around it. Lumian didn't rush to tidy up the altar. He patiently waited. As time ticked by, a letter suddenly materialized on the wooden table in front of him, and he hadn't sensed its arrival until the end. Of course, this was a significant improvement from before. Previously, he only noticed it after the pure silver skull had placed the letter. Lumian unfolded the letter and swiftly scanned it under the glow of the two yellow candles on the altar. I haven't received any letters from Muggle since February of this year. I understand that a one-sided story lacks credibility, but if you carefully consider it, you should find some details that support this matter. I suspect that some force had influenced Muggle, causing her to refrain from seeking help from me for some reason. In fact, if she had written to me before the catastrophe completely unfolded, I could have arrived earlier than the official Beyonders. I might have been able to save Muggle and prevent the catastrophe. Often, letters and exchanges fail to inspire insights, making it difficult for us to engage in broader and more profound discussions. I will be in trier in the coming days. If you are willing, we can arrange a time and place to meet and discuss your sister's encounter and the disaster in Cordu in detail. Perhaps, then, I can offer you useful suggestions. Lumian pondered for a few seconds before recalling a detail from his dream. Aurora had attempted to summon Hila's messenger but ultimately refrained from doing so. She was afraid of triggering a loop that would cause Cordu to restart frequently. This likely meant that she had given up summoning Hila's messenger in reality or that she had tried but failed for some reason. After realizing this, Lumian replied to Hila's suggestion, No problem. We'll arrange a time and place when you arrive in Trier. After sending the letter, concluding the ritual, and tidying up the altar, Lumian realized it was getting late. He quickly washed up, lay on the bed, and drifted off to sleep. 
The following morning, Lumian awoke naturally to the resonating sound of the cathedral bell. After visiting the washroom, he embarked on his usual morning jog along familiar streets like Rue Anarchy and Avenue du Marquet, fully energizing his body. During his routine, he discovered an empty space in the square outside Eglise St. Robert and spent nearly an hour practicing combat techniques. Returning to Aubert's du Coq d'Or, Lumian enjoyed a meatloaf breakfast while sipping a whiskey sour. On his way, he passed the Suet Steam Locomotive Station, where new vendors were already selling photos of street maîtres d'ateliers. Lumian scanned the scene and caught sight of Baron Brignais. The Savoy mob leader, adorned with a diamond ring and smoking a mahogany pipe, appeared gentlemanly with his half-top hat and the absence of any accompanying thugs. Holding a seven- or eight-year-old child, he made his way from the steam locomotive station towards a carriage parked by the roadside. The child donned a caramel coat with brass buttons, a black and white checkered shirt, and a linen coat. His black strapless leather shoes and white socks paired with a dark red school bag that appeared somewhat heavy and solid. With yellow hair, brown eyes, and a sturdy physique, the child had noticeable baby fat on his face and exuded an air of simplicity and honesty. Baron Brignese's child? He usually resides in other provinces and visits Trier for summer vacations? No wonder they don't seem too familiar. Lumian muttered to himself, redirecting his gaze and continuing his stroll. Eleven Rue de Fontaines, within Gardner Martin's grayish-white three-story villa. Lumian arrived in the exclusive carriage of Sal de Ball Breeze. He passed through the hall adorned with weapons and armor, arriving at a room filled with bookshelves. Gardner Martin, displaying his amiable disposition, deep facial features, and brownish-red eyes, sat in an armchair at the back of the study. Standing before him were the short rat Christo, with his gray-black hair, dark blue eyes, and mustache, and the towering giant Simon, measuring over 1.9 meters, his light yellow hair closely cropped, clad in an unusually tight black suit. Sensing Lumian's entrance into the study, Giant Simon and Rat Christo turned to regard their colleague. Giant Simon's eyes displayed caution and defiance as he instinctively raised his head. He believed that Seal, who had defeated Hammer 8, shouldn't be underestimated. However, he also believed that he himself was unquestionably stronger than that fool and might not lose to Seal. Rat Christo showed no evident emotions, but the right pocket of his dark brown shirt suddenly stirred, as if something alive resided within. Christo slipped his right hand into his pocket, his expression abruptly changing. His gaze upon Lumian grew intense with fear, and he couldn't help but smile obsequiously. W.H. Lumian felt a tad uneasy. After pondering for a moment, he suspected that Rat Christo had used an item in his pocket to see that Lumian had advanced to Sequence 7 and become a pyromaniac. In contrast, Giant Simon clearly lacked such intuition, failing to notice the subtle shifts in his colleague. Good morning, boss, Lumian energetically greeted Gardner Martin. A few days ago, he had informed the boss of the Savoy mob that he had consumed the potion and advanced to Pyromaniac. Gardner Martin nodded slightly, shifting his gaze from Lumian's face to Rat Christo and Giant Simon. After nearly ten seconds, he spoke in a low voice. I have a mission for all of you. At precisely noon, retrieve something from Underground Trier and bring it to Rue de Fontaine's. Mission? Lumian's eyebrows twitched, sensing a potential trap. As a new beyonder to the Savoy mob, trust between him and Gardner Martin was still lacking. Why would he be assigned such a crucial and confidential task? With these thoughts racing through his mind, Lumian had two conjectures, either he was mere cannon fodder or this was a test. Chapter 271, Acting With this in mind, Lumian's gaze automatically drifted over Rat Christo and Giant Simon, taking them in. He sensed that the chances of them becoming expendable pawns were slim. Potion-consuming meanders, unlike the blessed relying on divine favors from evil gods, were a rarity. They couldn't be simply stockpiled at will. Firstly, the ingredients required were specific, and secondly, ample time was needed. At the mid-sequence, luck and mastery of the acting method played a role. If he were to use them as mere pawns in this mission, 
the likelihood of reclaiming the Beyonder characteristics would be greatly diminished. It constituted a substantial portion of Gardner Martin's control over the underground world and the market district. As a member of the secretive organization, the Iron and Blood Cross Order, Gardner Martin could indeed bear such a loss, but he wouldn't make such a colossal sacrifice for something insignificant. And if the mission was of sufficient importance, sending only one Sequence 7 and two Sequence 8 Beyonders was clearly inadequate. Shouldn't Gardner Martin be concerned about failure? With this realization, Lumian swiftly revised his conjecture. Either this was a preliminary test, a low-risk mission designed to assess him, regardless of whether Rat Christo and Giant Simon were aware of it, or it was indeed a crucial and perilous operation. While using them as pawns, there would be powerhouses present as a safety net. This was also a test. With this in mind, Lumian's initial reaction was to gaze at Gardner Martin and accept the mission, projecting an image of an ambitious young man striving to climb the ranks. If it was the first possibility, this was his best chance to prove himself. If it was the second possibility, Lumian still had Mr. K's finger quietly nestled in his pocket as a trump card. When the time came, if he needed to divulge his affiliation with the Aurora Order to ensure his survival, he could abandon the Iron and Blood Cross Order's mission. As long as he remained alive, he could await another opportunity. After the catastrophe caused by the Tree of Shadow, Lumian visited Psychic's headquarters and met Mr. K before Gardner Martin could conduct an investigation. He concealed his experience with the Tree of Shadow, merely mentioning that something had occurred in the Market District, trapping them in a peculiar wilderness. Then the brownish-green tree descended, and Susanna Mattis appeared, draining everyone's energy. To combat the fallen tree spirit, he used the finger to fashion a robust defensive flesh rope, but he didn't receive additional assistance. Later, with the aid of the tree's further descent, Susanna Mattis' weakened state, and the involvement of the other two present beyonders, he barely overcame the enemy and vanquished her using his pyromaniac abilities and the fallen mercury from Cordu. He spoke the truth, albeit blurring the sequence of events, time, and location, as well as omitting a few details. The logic remained intact. Mr. K harbored no suspicions after hearing the account, instead, he sighed and cautioned Lumian not to overly rely on the finger since there were multiple ways to sever the mystical connection between him and it. Satisfied with Lumian's advancement to Pyromaniac with Gardner Martin's assistance, Mr. K plucked another finger for him. This led Lumian to believe that, as long as he didn't encounter extraordinary environments like Permitha or the Tree of Shadow and wasn't entangled in the perilous affair of confronting a godlike entity head-on, with Mr. K's finger, even if he couldn't completely reverse the situation, he still had a high chance of escape. Just as Lumian was about to express his stance to the boss, he suddenly sensed that he shouldn't push his acting too far. That was what Jenna would occasionally say. According to Franca, boss is at least a sequence six conspirer. I can't underestimate his intelligence and discernment. My background is undeniably evident. I'm young and hail from the countryside. I was once entangled in a beyonder catastrophe and lacked knowledge. I wanted to change my fate, but I've spent a considerable time in the market district, openly and covertly accomplishing much. Even with what the boss only knows, it should be enough for him to perceive that I'm not an ignorant country bumpkin who acts rashly and mercilessly. Based on today's incident, the impression the boss has of me should be someone capable of detecting mission abnormalities and potential dangers. Simply agreeing without reason or observation would only raise suspicions of ulterior motives or reliance on something. That would be troublesome. A whirlwind of thoughts raced through Lumian's mind. He immediately shifted his gaze to Giant Simon and Rat Christo, eagerly awaiting their reactions and attitudes toward the mission. It remained unclear whether Rat Christo was recalling the incident involving the mirror person or his brother's demise due to it. His expression grew nasty, tainted with fear and apprehension. Doubt and wariness flickered across Giant Simon's face, yet he didn't voice any objections. After a few seconds, they nearly spoke simultaneously. Yes, boss. Observing this, Lumian deliberately hesitated before continuing, yes, boss. With keen eyes, Gardner Martin observed Lumian, Christo, and Simon, assessing their expressions and demeanors. 
After their unanimous agreement, the boss of the Savoy mob grinned with satisfaction and said, I shall now disclose the mission details. He reached into a drawer and retrieved a scroll made of faux goatskin, laying it out on the desk before them. Approaching, Lumian and his companions beheld a map revealing a section of underground trier. The map measured a meter in length and 50 centimeters in width. The upper level depicted the underground trier, formed by the municipal department through the excavation of various tunnels and reinforcement of the quarry cave. It corresponded to the streets and squares above ground. The map focused solely on the underground areas of Cartier du Marquet, Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative, Cartier du Jardin Botanique, and Cartier de l'Observatoire. However, it was intricately detailed, as if copied from the original by infiltrating the municipal department. Lumian could clearly discern extensions on both sides, although the drawing did not continue. In the middle of the map lay quarry caves, ancient catacombs, and underground river tributaries, scattered in a haphazard manner and connected to the upper level through visible or concealed tunnels. This portion contained numerous gaps and omissions. Beside these areas were inscriptions such as to be investigated, to be explored, and to be searched. The lower levels of the map encompassed collapsed mines and more missing information, as if veiled in a shroud of fog. Even the Iron and Blood Cross Order, a secret organization, lacked comprehensive knowledge. Numerous passageways extended downward from this level, but the map did not indicate their connections. Fourth Epic Trier the place referred to as the ancient ruins reserved by the authorities? It's evident that this map is a copy of a more comprehensive one. A complete version includes Fourth Epic Trier. The Iron and Blood Cross Order possesses extensive knowledge of the underground. Lumian speculated as he committed the incomplete map to memory. After his three subordinates had taken a cursory glance at the map, Gardner Martin pointed to a location and said, This is your destination. It marked a collapsed mine, yet there remained some open space. Situated at the lowest level of the map, it was near Fourth Epic Trier. Above it, corresponding to Avenue Selbu, Rue de Mauvais en Fon, and Place de la Forêt, lay the intersection between Cartier de l'Observatoire and Cartier du Jardin Botanique. It's called the Albert Mines, Gardner Martin introduced. To reach it, you must traverse two privately bored tunnels. It remains unknown to the authorities and most people who travel underground. As he spoke, Gardner Martin traced the tunnel with his finger and instructed Lumian, Christo, and Simon on the correct entrance. Finally, he sighed with a tinge of emotion and added, Six years ago, Albert Goncourt, the leader of the rebellion and the mastermind behind the uprising, relied on this mine, which he discovered and named, to elude the army, police, and official beyonders who were searching the underground. He survived. Six years ago. Rebellion. Uprising. Lumian instantly recalled what he had witnessed and heard. During the war with the Lowland Kingdom, prices in Trier skyrocketed, leaving people in despair due to the exorbitant cost of food. This triggered a massive protest that swept through the city, resulting in various conflicts. From Gardner Martin's words, it was evident that the protest wasn't purely spontaneous. Someone had planned and guided it. Was the Iron and Blood Cross Order also involved? Lumian continued to gaze at the map, lost in thought. Concluding his explanation, Gardner Martin said, Your task is to reach the Albert Mines before noon and await the arrival of a trader who will hand you a box. You need not give him anything, nor do you need to communicate with him verbally. On your return journey, you must not open that box, as doing so would expose you to immeasurable danger. As long as you strictly follow my instructions, the mission poses minimal risk. While you may encounter peculiar phenomena concealed underground or face beyond their monsters, good teamwork will resolve those challenges. After providing them with additional guidance, Lumian, Christo, and Simon each took a carbide lamp and departed from eleven Rue de Fontaines, making their way to the nearest entrance to underground trier. Casting a final glance at the now out of sight grayish white villa, Lumian considered the impression Gardner Martin had of him. With a smile, he casually inquired of Rat Christo and Giant Simon, Have you undertaken similar missions before? Rat Christo fell silent for a few seconds before answering, Thrice. 
Once, Giant Simon replied in a slightly buzzing voice. Lumian chuckled. Well, the fact that you're still alive suggests that such missions aren't too perilous. Rat Christo remained silent, as though he had fallen into a grim recollection. Giant Simon reassured himself, echoing Lumian's words. You're right. Perhaps this is a test from the boss. Those who pass may have an opportunity to advance further. Lumian smiled. And what about those who fail? Do they perish on the spot? Chapter 272 Charismatic Artist Giant Simon found himself momentarily speechless, struggling to find the right words. After a few seconds of contemplation, he finally spoke up. Are you out of your mind? If you fail, the worst outcome would be missing an opportunity. Rat Christo chimed in. If the mission is truly important, the boss wouldn't hesitate to handle it personally. He wouldn't send us. And if it's not a significant task, the risk won't be too high. This train of thought mirrored Lumian's initial concerns. Lumian glanced towards the nearby entrance of Underground Trier, intentionally wearing a smile. Perhaps we are merely bait in this scenario? For instance, the boss suspects that a faction is secretly watching us, so he has deliberately devised this mission. If everything goes smoothly without any abnormalities, he can deactivate the alarm and consider it a test. However, if he does catch something, he can follow the trail of clues to uncover the truth and eliminate any hidden dangers. As for us being the bait and potentially getting caught, it's not his concern. As long as we ultimately achieve his goal, losing a few low sequence beyonders falls within his level of tolerance. Rat Christo's face turned pale upon hearing these words, while Giant Simon fell into silence. Although they lacked experience with mysticism, their years as mobsters and leaders had honed their basic analytical skills. They couldn't help but admit that Seal's theory made sense. This, naturally, brought about a deep sense of fear for their lives. Especially for Christo, memories of his brother Erkin's death and the pained expressions of his wife and children flooded his mind. If it weren't for the boss assigning him another task and excluding him from the smuggling operation, he might have been replaced by the so-called mirror people and met a tragic end somewhere underground. And as for his wife, his dogs, and the other animals he cared for, the mirror person would have had the opportunity to enjoy them for a while. With these thoughts weighing on their minds, the three of them ignited their carbide lamps and descended the steel stairs in silence. Christo scanned the dark tunnel with the bluish-yellow light, his voice trembling as he spoke. The boss wouldn't purposefully send us to our deaths. Even as low sequence beyonders, we still have our uses. If we perish underground, it might take the boss half a year or even a whole year to groom a replacement. The mirror people incident came to his mind, the boss's request for him to undertake a different task being a clear attempt to protect him without revealing anything. Everything comes at a price. Perhaps the stakes involved this time are more valuable than the three of us combined. Lumian held the carbide lamp emitting a yellowish glow, walking steadily through the dark and slightly damp passageway. He sneered and said, I hope this mission won't be as perilous as the boss claims, but we can't afford to be naive. We must prepare for the worst. Noting Seal's significant improvement, Christo couldn't help but ask, what should we do? From his perspective, Seal was the most reliable person in this mission, a lifeline in critical moments. Surprised by Christo's sudden timidity, Giant Simon turned towards him. When did the rat become so fearful? As a leader under the boss, why would he choose to display weakness and worry in front of Seal? Where is his pride and self-esteem? Wasn't he afraid that Seal would overshadow him and encroach upon his smuggling business? This was precisely the effect Lumian intended. He genuinely spoke up. The boss has helped me multiple times and I'm more than willing to carry out missions for him. However, the risk involved should not be excessively high, leaving us with only the option of death. Damn it, I haven't lived long enough. That's why my stance is to attempt the mission if possible. If it becomes too dangerous, I won't hesitate to abandon it and ensure my own survival. This might require the three of us to let down our guard against each other and cooperate fully to overcome any hidden threats. 
such an attitude struck a chord with Christo and Simon, prompting visible or imperceptible nods from them. No one was entirely selfless. Taking a calculated risk for the boss was already a testament to their loyalty. Accepting this attitude and genuinely cooperating to resist danger seemed to be the only viable choice, at least on the surface. How should we collaborate? Christo swiftly made up his mind. He didn't want another mirror people incident. Lumian smirked once more. First and foremost, we must understand each other's abilities so that we can complement one another more effectively. Christo pondered for a moment before speaking up, I'm a beast tamer, a sequence 8 of the apothecary pathway. I can directly confront and communicate with various beasts to a certain extent. I have the ability to gradually tame them and make them my assistants. I'm also skilled in treating illnesses and providing comprehensive medical care. At that moment, he couldn't help but cast a questioning glance at Seal, as if hinting at his need for a remedy to improve his performance in bed and replenish his physical stamina. Word had gotten around about Seal being quite a libertine. Not only was he involved with Jenna, Red Boot's mistress, but he had also been linked to nearly ten dancers. He had arranged for them to receive acting lessons at Theatre de Lancy and Kaja Pigeons, allowing them to earn money without having to accompany customers. An apothecary? If only I had known that Rat Christo was an apothecary, I would have gotten him to give plenty of medicine to Jenna's mother. She would have made a quick recovery and returned home that very night. Lumian silently sighed and nodded approvingly in the flickering light of the carbide lamp. The more giant Simon listened, the more astonished he became. He began to suspect that Rat Christo had lost his mind by divulging the secrets of his sequence. Until now, apart from Gardner Martin, nobody knew Christo's sequence or the pathway he belonged to. After all, there were plenty of people in Trier who had a fondness for pets, some even had a large number of them or formed intimate relationships with animals, as occasionally seen in the newspapers. In a flash, an idea struck Simon. Rat Christo was in charge of the smuggling business and had completed most of the boss's secret missions. Perhaps he knew something and had become pessimistic about this operation, hence his sincere cooperation with Seal. Christo let out a sigh and continued, I've been unlucky. I haven't managed to tame a genuine Beyonder creature yet. Otherwise, I wouldn't be powerless against mid-sequence Beyonders even if I encountered them. This mission was sudden and we didn't have time to prepare. I only brought a few companions with me. Is he afraid that we won't die quickly enough? As he spoke, he raised his right hand. A colorful snake-like creature with a triangular head emerged from his sleeve. Soon after, Christo had the snake retreat back into his sleeve. He reached into his pocket and produced a palm-sized rat. This rat was different from the ordinary kind. Its fur was pale white and distinct, with eyes as bright as rubies. This is Taffy. It's a unique creature I discovered underground during my smuggling days. It can't be used as the main ingredient for any potion, but it has the ability to sense hidden dangers, Christo briefly introduced. It can also sense the approximate strength of others, right? Lumian asked thoughtfully. Christo looked at Lumian with surprise and hesitated for a moment before replying, yes. Recognizing that Christo had already divulged enough information, Lumian didn't press further despite suspecting that he possessed other abilities or other animal companions. Instead, he shifted his gaze to Giant Simon. Simon hesitated for a moment, recalling his earlier speculation. In a muffled voice, he said, I'm a Sequence 8 pugilist of the Warrior Pathway. Like Hammer 8, I excel in face-to-face -face combat and various fighting techniques. I carry a gun, a dagger, a bayonet, and boxing gloves. His explanation was brief, as pugilists didn't possess any extraordinary abilities. No mystical item? That's true. It's indeed challenging for mobsters groomed by secret organizations to acquire such items. Lumian chuckled to himself. You're stronger than Hammer 8 because you're intelligent and can read the situation clearly. These words left Simon unsure whether to feel angered or proud. Holding the carbide lamp, he looked at Lumian and said, What about you? Which Sequence 8 pathway are you from? Hunter? 
Since they were working together, Seal couldn't keep his sequence a secret. Lumian smiled, raising his right hand in front of him. Silently, a crimson flame emerged from his palm and hung in the air, burning silently. You're a pyromaniac? Simon exclaimed in surprise. Among Trier's mystical circles, the most common information concerned mid-sequence beyonders of the Hunter Pathway, especially those below Sequence 6. Lumian didn't respond, opting to maintain his smile instead. Simon suddenly understood why Rat Christo's attitude towards Seal had undergone such a drastic change and why he appeared to seek his assistance. Sequence 7 was the starting point for mid-sequence beyonders. Compared to low-sequence beyonders like themselves, their strength had undergone a qualitative transformation. They were countless times more powerful. With his attention now diverted from the pocket of Rat Christo, Simon asked Lumian in surprise and suspicion, Does the boss know that you've advanced to Sequence 7? The boss provided me with the necessary supplementary ingredients, Lumian truthfully replied, dissipating the crimson flame in his palm under the yellowish glow of the lamp. Wah! Simon's pupils dilated. Lumian looked around and continued, That's why, if I can complete this mission, I will do everything in my power to see it through. With those words, he pulled out an iron-colored canister and tossed it to Simon. This is scorpion poison that I obtained from Hammer 8. You can apply it to your weapon. Increasing your strength will increase our chances of survival. Simon caught the canister, momentarily taken aback. Though Seal disgusted him and they were at odds, his knowledge, intelligence, strength, and approach to things made him seem reliable. Unconsciously, he found himself listening to him and following his lead. Lumian, who was walking ahead without turning back, let out a sigh of relief. He had exaggerated the risks and instilled fear to dampen the spirits of Rat Christo and Simon, plunging them into a state of worry. Then, by revealing his own strength, offering convincing suggestions, and providing small favors, he would establish himself as the team's leader. Only then could he fully harness the team's combined strength without exposing his hidden trump cards and effectively combat any potential threats. Chapter 273, Traitor Holding the carbide lamp aloft, Giant Simon trailed behind Lumian for a few steps, his keen eyes picking up on the inconsistencies in Lumian's words. Seal, the boss knows you've turned into a pyromaniac. He won't just toss you aside recklessly, will he? Lumian gazed ahead at the tunnel bathed in the yellowish glow, a smile playing on his lips as he posed a question without turning around. How long have I been with the Savoy mob? Both Giant Simon and Rat Christo had a moment of enlightenment and found themselves in agreement with Lumian's explanation. It was true that Lumian, a beyonder with a dubious past who had recently joined the mob, had brought with him a crucial ingredient for a potion. Such a person couldn't be trusted right off the bat. They had to undergo a series of tests in the form of missions. And if Lumian were to meet his demise during one of these missions, it would simply be chalked up to his ill luck. Losing a foreign beyonder was far less painful for the boss than losing a subordinate he had meticulously groomed. The two leaders of the Savoy mob hesitated no longer. They cautiously followed Lumian, maintaining a distance of two to three steps. It was a familiar arrangement, much like when they traveled with a few mobsters stationed at similar positions behind them. In the midst of their journey, Giant Simon donned gloves and applied a small amount of scorpion poison to his dagger, bayonet, and boxing gloves. He then returned the canister to Lumian. The trio descended into the tunnel marked on the map. Despite their soft steps, the special environment caused their footfalls to echo faintly in the dark, eerily silent underground. Nearly 45 minutes later, they passed through the area marked as an ancient tomb and arrived at the entrance of a concealed passageway. It led to an abandoned quarry cave that had lain dormant for ages. The ground was uneven, covered in moss. In the distance, the sound of an underground river could be heard, occasionally accompanied by the rumbling of a steam subway passing by. Lumian observed for a moment, clenching the ring of the carbide lamp between his teeth. With both hands, he grasped a protruding stone wall and climbed to the cave summit. Then, extending his right hand, he pushed an apparently ordinary stone behind him, 
wedging it between the side wall and the cave roof. A pitch black hole materialized, allowing someone as tall as Simon to bend over and crawl through. The hidden tunnel had been fashioned using a long forgotten ventilation system that already existed in a nearby quarry. The three of them hunched over and strode deeper into the underground tunnel. Gradually, the sounds of the underground river and the steam subway faded away. Apart from their own breathing and footsteps, the surroundings were silent as a tomb. After nearly half an hour, Lumian and his companions followed the markings on the map and leaped from an exit, emerging into an already existing underground cave. From high above, stalactites dangled like the menacing teeth of a terrifying beast lurking in the darkness. Lumian didn't rush to enter another hidden tunnel at the cave's base. Instead, he turned to giant Simon and Rat Christo, who had accumulated a fair amount of dust on their heads. Wearing a grave expression, he spoke. Before we proceed, let's confirm something to avoid any mishaps. We won't have time for verbal communication. All right. Both Rat Christo and Giant Simon accepted Lumian's words without question. With a subtle nod, Lumian replied, Firstly, from the moment we enter the second tunnel until we return here, no one is allowed to speak. Make use of physical gestures as much as possible. If that's not feasible, you must obtain my permission before uttering a word. This precautionary measure stemmed from Gardner Martin's advice regarding the lack of need for communication with the traitor. Lumian had expanded its scope and made it absolute to prevent any potential mishaps. Christo and Simon recalled the boss's counsel and nodded in agreement. Observing their response, Lumian pressed on, Secondly, no matter what anomalies occur, unless something attacks both of you, stay calm and act in accordance with my lead. Thirdly, I won't force you, but if you wish to survive, it's best to heed my instructions. These two requests were met with resistance from Rat Christo and Giant Simon. They would be entrusting their safety to Lumian's intelligence, skills, reactions, and knowledge. It was a departure from their usual reliance on their own wild beyonder instincts. After a few seconds of hesitation, Rat Christo forced a smile, recollecting Seal's strength and previous performances. I'll follow your arrangements, but if you fail to react in time and Taffy warns me of danger, I'll take matters into my own hands. Damn it, the longer I've been in this smuggling business, the more I dread Trier's underground. Giant Simon chimed in, I'm with you on that, Rat. Lumian felt a sense of satisfaction, having successfully tamed the two Beyonders who also served as leaders in the Savoy mob. He didn't push further and simply nodded in agreement. No problem. Fourthly, I will be the one to make contact with the traitor later and retrieve the box the boss desires. Upon hearing this, Rat Christo and Giant Simon looked at Lumian as if they were seeing Seal in a new light. They had expected the pyromaniac to leverage his strength and authority to assign one of them to interact with the traitor and handle the riskiest part of the mission. Alternatively, they thought Lumian might suggest drawing lots to determine who would handle the task. To their surprise, Lumian volunteered to take on the responsibility himself. Seal is quite fair. Giant Simon couldn't help but sigh. He knew he wouldn't be able to do the same if he were in Lumian's position. This realization made both Rat Christo and Giant Simon less resistant to following Lumian's instructions. Though the lighting was dim, Lumian managed to observe his two colleagues' reactions. He couldn't help but sneer inwardly. If it weren't for the fact that you two Beyonders lack mystical knowledge and might cause trouble during the box exchange, I wouldn't be taking such a risk myself. Lumian sighed from the depths of his heart. Sometimes, weakness could be an advantage. Emphasizing that they were to maintain silence, Lumian picked up the carbide lamp and made his way to the bottom of the cave. He gestured for Giant Simon to embrace a rock about half his height and move it aside. The rock was incredibly heavy, posing a challenge even for Simon's strength. It took him some time to shift it, revealing the deep entrance to the hidden tunnel. The tunnel wasn't particularly long, and it took them only seven to eight minutes to crouch down and make their way through. They arrived at a mineral cave that had suffered significant collapse, leaving only a limited space. This was their destination, the Albert Mines. Lumian surveyed the cluttered gray-black stones and turned to Giant Simon, 
who was dressed in a black formal suit. He pointed at his chest. Understanding the unspoken request, Simon produced an iron-gray pocket watch and opened it with a snap. The dial revealed numerous tightly clenched gears, exuding a sophisticated yet cold mechanical beauty. Giant Simon held up his pocket watch, showing it to Lumian and Rat Christo, indicating that there were still over ten minutes until the designated time of the transaction, noon. Lumian nodded and remained silent, patiently awaiting the appointed hour. After a while, he subtly turned his head, listening intently for any signs of movement around them. He sensed an unusual sound emanating from underground, as if a multitude of people were screaming, roaring, and fighting. Beneath the illumination of the carbide lamp, Lumian glanced at Simon and Christo, noticing their similar reactions, as if they too had caught wind of the commotion. Observing Simon and Christo's gazes fixed on him, Lumian lowered his right hand, signaling them to refrain from being affected. Intermittently, they could hear peculiar movements. The three of them stood at the edge of the Albert Mines, silently waiting. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed from the other side of the mine, as if someone in leather shoes was approaching from an unusually quiet tunnel dozens of meters away. Is that the traitor? Lumian mused, casting his thoughtful gaze in that direction. The footsteps paused and then resumed, resonating through the Albert Mines. When they were merely a few meters away from the entrance, they mysteriously ceased altogether. After a brief wait, Lumian and his companions spotted a figure emerging from the opposite mine entrance. It was a man over 1.8 meters tall, donning a white shirt, yellow vest, black formal suit, and dark pants. He clutched a small brown leather suitcase in his hand. The man wore a silk top hat pulled low, casting a shadow over his face. However, Lumian's hunter eyesight allowed him to discern the man's appearance with the aid of the three carbide lamps. The man had short auburn hair, brownish red eyes, slightly unkempt and thick beard, and thick eyebrows. He resembled a starved male bear, exaggeratedly thin. The collar of his shirt was tightly fastened, as if he dreaded the cold. Lumian held the carbide lamp and was about to approach the man. But then, Christo tugged at his arm. When Lumian turned his head, Christo anxiously and fearfully pointed at his right pocket. Does this mean that Taffy, the peculiar rat, has issued a warning of danger? But judging from Christo's behavior, the threat hasn't materialized yet and is still manageable. Otherwise, he would have already turned and fled. Lumian interpreted the signs and nodded at Christo, indicating that he would proceed with caution. Christo didn't stop him. He watched Lumian with concern as he advanced toward the traitor. As he closed the distance, Lumian's gaze carefully assessed the man's physique, analyzing every detail. His clothes are slightly oversized, as though they don't quite fit him. He seems fearful of something, yet his eyes hold anger and hatred. His hands don't extend beyond his sleeves, and they're concealed within, including the handle of the suitcase. His feet. Lumian's pupils dilated as he noticed that the trader wasn't wearing shoes but rather a pair of gray socks. This contradicted the sound of leather shoes they had just heard. Could it be that the footsteps didn't belong to him but someone else? Lumian grew increasingly vigilant. With limited space remaining in the Albert Mines, he swiftly arrived in front of the trader. The man, resembling a starved bear, chuckled and inquired with a hint of amusement, Did Gardner Martin send you? Was he scared out of his wits after receiving a message from his companion, who went underground to search for the entrance to the fourth epic trier, months after disappearing, claiming to possess an important item to deliver to him? Chapter 274 Escape The entrance to Fourth Epic Trier? The Iron and Blood Cross Order is hunting for it? This person reappeared after vanishing for months? Lumian's mind raced upon hearing the traitor's words. He kept in mind the warning not to speak and tried his best not to. Leaning forward slightly, he extended his right hand to receive the small brown leather suitcase. The man, resembling a starved bear, didn't refuse and chuckled. If I were Gardner Martin, I'd pray I never find out what's in this box. What does this mean? Lumian wondered as his palm touched the suitcase. 
At that moment, his eyes narrowed as he noticed the trader's right palm was absent from the suitcase's handle, floating as if held by an invisible force. Following the handle, Lumian saw there was no arm in the sleeve. It was empty, supported by something invisible. No arm. His heart tightened as he glanced up at the trader. His brownish-red eyes, accentuated by his thick beard and eyebrows, were as cold as a wild beast's, filled with undisguised hatred and fear. Various thoughts raced through Lumian's mind as he forced himself to control his reaction. He calmly took the suitcase, not inquiring or observing. He didn't instinctively defend or attack, as if he hadn't noticed anything. The trader's emotions seemed to shift slightly, and his laughter carried a hint of sorrow. Tell Gardner Martin that it won't be long before he goes underground too. All the pain and torture I've endured, he too will experience them. Lumian didn't say a word. He picked up the small suitcase and was about to turn around and leave the Albert Mines with Giant Simon and Rat Cristo. Suddenly, footsteps echoed from the other entrance behind the trader. Compared to earlier, it became much clearer, almost within arm's reach. Lumian felt more certain now, he could hear the distinct sound of leather shoes approaching from the silent tunnel. In an instant, a figure emerged before Lumian, Cristo, and Simon. It was a man, completely naked, his head missing, blood oozing from the neck wound. He wore only dark blue shorts and strapless black leather shoes. With two swift steps, the headless monster reached the traitor from behind, stretching out its hands, seizing his head, and yanking it upwards. Save me! Save me! cried the traitor, unable to hide his panic and fear. Almost simultaneously, his entire head was lifted, exposing a blood-stained spine dangling below. The spine was unusually long, swaying gently like a tail. Silently, the trader's shirt, vest, pants, and formal attire lost support and collapsed to the ground. He had no body left, only his head connected to the bloody spine. Save me! Save me! The trader struggled with all his might but the headless monster held him tightly, seemingly attempting to stuff him into its empty neck. Although Lumian had encountered many terrifying and warped creatures in Kordu, this was the first time he had come across something so bizarre and terrifying. Without hesitation, he turned around and dashed towards the entrance of the hidden tunnel, ignoring the traitor's pleas for help. Giant Simon and Rat Cristo, who had been frightened from the very start, finally lost control. Like cyclists hearing the starting signal, they bent down and hurried into the tunnel. Lumian caught up with them in a few strides, the echoing voice of the Albert Mines haunting their trail. Save me. Save me. If I die, you guys can forget about living. Help. With their carbide lamps in hand, the trio silently made their way through the hidden tunnel, their hearts constricting at the screams left behind. A few minutes passed, and the shrill cries suddenly ceased, leaving an eerie silence that enveloped the Albert Mines. Then, the echoing sound of tapping leather shoes reverberated through the hidden tunnel. Rat Cristo, being the shortest, found it easiest to keep his back bent as he moved forward. In a state of fear, he frantically pointed at his pocket with his right hand, as if he had seen death itself. Has that peculiar rat given us a perilous warning? Lumian glanced at Christo's left chest and nodded reassuringly, indicating that he would cover their rear. All they needed to do was run with all their might. As the tapping sounds drew nearer, Lumian and the others grew tense. Though they had to bend their backs to navigate the concealed tunnel, it only slightly reduced their escape speed. After all, they were skilled beyonders, their physical abilities notably enhanced. With each passing moment, Lumian felt a chill down his spine. Just as the sound of the leather shoes approached to within a few meters, the trio finally reached the tunnel exit and burrowed out. Seeing giant Simon about to flee on his own, Lumian, who had already returned to their agreed position, could no longer stay silent. He lowered his voice and growled, Block the door. As he spoke, he turned around and abandoned the carbide lamp and small suitcase, attempting to push the heavy rock beside the exit. Giant Simon subconsciously ignored Lumian's command, but his heart still trembled from the low shout. Throughout their journey, he had grown accustomed to following his instructions, as if it were the only way to ensure his survival. 
he found himself caught in a dilemma. After a brief moment of hesitation, Giant Simon suspected that if he ran away and left Seal to fend for himself against the monster, Seal might very well attack him and kill him as a deserter once he survived the attack. Rat Christo had similar thoughts, but he believed that if they both didn't help, Seal wouldn't waste time blocking the tunnel exit. When the time came, whoever ran the slowest would become the monster's first target, buying enough time for the other two to escape. After evaluating each other's pathway characteristics and sequences, Christo realized he was definitely the slowest. Moreover, he couldn't injure Giant Simon and Lion Seal in a short period of time, meaning he couldn't slow them down and overtake them. Without hesitation, he stopped fleeing and returned to the tunnel exit, assisting Lumian in pushing the stone to block the door. Taking a cue from the rat, Giant Simon chose to obey and turned around. Together, in just a few seconds, the trio secured the entrance to the hidden tunnel. The sound of footsteps faded into nothingness. Simultaneously, Rat Christo couldn't contain his surprise and delight, exclaiming, everything's fine now. There was no more visible movement in his pocket, where the rat named Taffy resided. Lumian didn't share Christo's exuberance. He picked up the carbide lamp and small suitcase, speaking in a deep voice, let's talk when we get back to the first underground level. Giant Simon and Rat Christo's relaxed minds tensed up once more. Instinctively, they followed Lumian up the rock wall and turned into another hidden tunnel. Along the way, they didn't encounter any attacks, but being underground meant they were surrounded by either complete silence or occasional strange sounds. After their recent fright, the environment was far from pleasant for them. If Lumian hadn't remained calm and composed, Giant Simon and Rat Christo might have resorted to drastic measures. Upon returning to the area corresponding to the streets and squares above ground, Rat Christo reached into his pocket to comfort Taffy and let out a long sigh. When I saw that monster, I thought we were going to die right there. Though he and Simon had killed over ten people, interacted with other Beyonders, and even fought them, they had never encountered a monster like the Headless One before. It was an abnormal horror they had never experienced. This was even scarier than the horror stories they had heard in their youth. Lumian smiled. Didn't the boss say that there won't be much risk if we don't communicate or open the box? However, in such a situation, most people couldn't stay calm. Giant Simon and Rat Christo gained a newfound appreciation for Seal's mental fortitude. Thanks to the shock brought about by the traitor and the headless monster, Lumian and his companions weren't interested in what lay inside the box. They hurriedly left the underground and returned to Eleven Rue de Fontaines, where they met Gardner Martin in the study. Gardner Martin took the small suitcase and examined it casually. He smiled and said, Very good. You've all done well. I'll reward you later. After praising them, the Savoy mob boss looked at Lumian and nodded gently. I have a message for you. If you wish to progress further on the hunter pathway, you must remember this sentence, the demon is our friend, and hell is someone else's. The demon is our friend, and hell is someone else's. Lumian couldn't fully grasp the true meaning of this sentence, but Gardner Martin didn't provide further explanation. As his three subordinates left the study, Gardner Martin turned to the door connecting to the activity room. The door creaked open, and a man in a half-top hat, white shirt, yellow vest, black suit, and dark pants approached. He had short auburn hair, brownish-red eyes, a thick, messy beard, and thick eyebrows, resembling a starving bear. He was the traitor who had given the small suitcase to Lumian and the others and been dragged back by the headless monster. Olsen, any thoughts on him? Gardner Martin inquired. The traitor addressed as Olsen replied with a smile, simple background, clear origins, smart, bold, and decisive. He could bring together a few people who were originally unrelated into a team in a short period of time. Isn't that what you want? As for loyalty, that's the least of my worries. When the time comes, even if he's not loyal, he'll become loyal. Gardner Martin nodded slightly. Observe him for a while longer and see who he interacts with. After discussing this topic, Gardner Martin looked at the small suitcase on the table and asked curiously, what's inside? Like I said, you'd better pray you never find out. 
the trader known as Olson smiled, picked up the suitcase, and left the study. After taking a few steps in the hall, he suddenly found his head a little tilted. He raised his hands, held his head, and straightened it with a snap. Chapter 275 Poaching In the carriage heading back to the market district, Lumian stared out the window, reflecting on Gardner Martin's actions after completing the mission. He felt that the Savoy mob's boss didn't seem too concerned about the suitcase they risked their lives for. The boss merely glanced at it casually and placed it on the desk. Was it really some kind of test? The Iron and Blood Cross Order possesses information about the spine-dangling head and headless monster. As long as I stick to the prescribed procedure and don't act independently, they won't really come after me. But the boss used to be a conspirer. Perhaps he just wanted us to see the suitcase, but it might not reveal his true intentions. Regardless, the head-only traitor and the headless humanoid monster are real. What do they symbolize? Can I trust the words of the former? He disappeared for months searching for the entrance to Fourth Epic Trier and experienced terrifying events. His head and body got separated, and both gained consciousness. When Boss said, the demon is our friend, and hell is someone else's, it felt like he was warning me not to trust others easily. Did he mention this because he was satisfied with my performance on the mission? Has he sent someone to secretly follow and observe us in detail? Or maybe Giant Simon or Rat Cristo are not as scared as they seem and one of them is secretly working as a spy for the boss. Since the boss didn't keep me here, the audit isn't over yet. Could someone be tailing this carriage and lurking in the shadows? Hehe, <laughs> Mr. K and his subordinates love doing this too. It'd be amusing if they ran into each other. In the carriage, Rat Cristo and Giant Simon, who were using the Sal de Ball Breeze's carriage to return to the market district, grew a bit uneasy as Lumian remained silent and gazed out of the window. After five minutes of indescribable silence, Christo forced a smile and asked, Seal, what are you looking at? It's too cramped, Lumian sighed, disregarding the question. Christo and Simon exchanged glances, thinking that Seal might be mocking them for taking up space in the carriage. After hesitating for a moment, Christo decided to share his intentions. He lowered his voice and said, Seal, I want to use this opportunity to talk to you. Damn it, I didn't expect Simon to join us. Son of a sow, I was the one who suggested borrowing the carriage in the first place. Giant Simon retorted. Ignoring him, Christo continued, Seal, this mission has allowed me to reacquaint myself with you. Apart from boss, you are the most intelligent, powerful, and calmest beyonder around me. The calmest? You haven't seen me when I'm impulsive. Lumian teased, deliberately provoking. Is that so? Am I more intelligent than Brignes and stronger than Franca? Rat Cristo was at a loss for words. After a few seconds, he said, Uh, well. What I mean is, in the future, when the boss assigns me secret missions, I want your help to analyze and figure out what to do. I don't want to be flustered when facing a similar monster next time. Oh, Intel has come knocking on my door? Lumian smiled and replied, I don't mind helping, but aren't you afraid the boss will be angry if he finds out? Christo glanced at Lumian, then at Giant Simon beside him, and his tone turned cold. If you keep quiet, and we keep quiet, the boss won't find out. Simon's eyelids twitched, and he added, My thoughts align with rats. He didn't want to die on the next secret mission either. Lumian pondered for a moment and grinned. All right, I can assist, but I can't guarantee I'll uncover the truth or find a way to avoid danger based solely on your descriptions. Also, I might make some small requests. No problem. Rat Christo agreed without hesitation. Today's encounter alone wouldn't have pushed him to this state. He had just escaped the Mirror People incident, and his nerves were on edge. Giant Simon also expressed his agreement. Then, he looked at Lumian and cursed himself softly, he cleared his throat and said, Seal, my big bro, I apologize. I wasn't too friendly before, and I even encouraged you to deal with red boots when you were new to the Savoy mob and knew little about us. I'm a rough and unrefined guy. I can't say pleasant words, 
but I hope you can accept my apology. In the future, I, Simon, will follow your lead. Wow, you've grasped the situation so quickly, and you're so humble. This fellow is quite a talent. Lumian pretended to be nonchalant and replied, I've already forgotten about the past. Besides, have I targeted you or sought revenge recently? With that said, Lumian added inwardly, Well, it's mostly because I'm too busy to bother with a mere mob leader like you. Simon breathed a sigh of relief, convinced that Seal wasn't too petty. Lumian smiled and questioned, Why do you call me Big Bro? I'm much younger than you. Simon smiled sheepishly. You're already a sequence seven. In terms of strength, I should call you Big Bro. Lumian couldn't help but jest, if you stick to addressing someone by their sequence, will you have to call me uncle once I reach sequence six? Simon hesitated for a moment before clearing his throat. If you wish. Damn it, isn't this guy too shameless? Is he like this even when talking to the boss privately? Rat Christo turned his head in surprise and looked at the burly man, who stood more than 1.9 meters tall, as though this was the first time he had met this giant. Simon continued, but I believe I'll reach sequence 7 before you hit sequence 6. You must have just become a pyromaniac. It might take years, even decades, to fully master the power of flames and withstand the next potion. He was implying, ha, huh, I was just joking. Perhaps we'll both be sequence 7 soon, and you'll still be my big bro. Upon hearing this, Lumian's mind wandered back to the moment he had used invisible flames to burn Susanna Mattis to death, feeling the potion digesting a little inside him. However, he couldn't be sure as he hadn't yet completed the first acting principle, making the degree of digestion unclear. Combining past experiences and recent events in the market district, Lumian sensed that the first acting principle was close to being revealed, but it always fell short. His thoughts lacked clarity and he had a feeling that he needed to wait for the right opportunity. His mind then shifted to Gardner Martin's possible covert observations and subsequent tests. As a result, Lumian decided to postpone his plans to attend Mr. Fool's Bishop's preaching at Lavini Dock in the Square District the day after tomorrow. He felt it would be better to wait until he passed the test and officially join the Iron and Blood Cross Order. But what about my psychiatric treatment scheduled for tomorrow afternoon? Should I still go? I believe my mental state and emotional control have improved over the past few days, but I'll need the two ladies to confirm it. Yes, they always use psychological invisibility. Madam Justice is a true demigod, so it's unlikely for Gardner Martin or his subordinates to see her. As a hunter, it's normal for me to have an interest in studying plants. After visiting the botanical garden, I'll have a coffee and take a break. No one can accuse me of anything. Lumian made a quick decision to continue the psychiatric treatment the next day. However, before heading to Mason's Cafe, he planned to spend two to three hours exploring the nearby botanical garden. Once the carriage stopped at Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian went upstairs to enjoy a cup of coffee while watching Giant Simon and Rat Cristo leave Avenue du Marque. Around 4 p.m., he put on a dark wide brimmed round hat and left the dance hall. His destination was Franca's place at Rue de Blouse's Blanches to discuss the peculiar mission and Gardner Martin's behavior in the afternoon. As Lumian strolled along Avenue du Marquet, a sudden thought struck him. If Boss is indeed sending someone to watch my actions during this period, he might think I'm having an affair with Franca if I frequent her apartment on Rue de Blouse's Blanches. But maybe, as a Triarian, he wouldn't mind. Right, there's already a rumor about me having an affair with Jenna. I'm going to Rue de Blouse's Blanches to find Jenna, not Franca. He won't be suspicious. Lumian calmed himself and arrived at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He knocked on the door of room 601. Franca, who was wearing her usual blouse and light colored pants, snapped, Why are you here again? At that moment, Lumian noticed peculiar drawings on her face a turd on the left side and a dark green turtle on the right. Lost at cards? Lumian raised an eyebrow. Franca had mentioned playing cards with Jenna and her dancers, involving strange punishments without money being at stake. Franca glanced back and lowered her voice, Jenna has been in a bad mood lately. 
I'm trying to find a way to cheer her up. Lumian followed her gaze and noticed that Jenna's face was also decorated with strange drawings, moles, and a pig's mouth. The lead dancer had similar marks. In that case, I'll wait for you to finish, Lumian said as he entered the living room. Assuming Seal was there for Jenna, the lead dancer hurriedly got up, washed her face, and left apartment 601. Being in a better mood, Jenna teasingly asked Lumian, Are you here for me or Franca? That came out wrong. Lumian replied honestly, Boss assigned me a strange mission, and I want to consult Franca. Curious, Franca asked, What mission is it? Lumian briefly recounted the noon encounter, including how he managed to keep Rat Cristo and Giant Simon in check, making them follow his instructions. Both Franca and Jenna were scared by the head-only traitor and the headless monster, and they fell into silence for a moment. After a few seconds, Franca clenched her teeth and said, Gardner Martin, that son of a bitch. What's wrong? Jenna didn't understand why Franca suddenly cursed the boss. Franca explained vaguely, I suspect this mission is Gardner Martin's way of testing Seal. He wants to see if Seal is fit to enter the core group. Damn it, fucking hell, I've been with him for so long, and he still doesn't trust me. He doesn't even want to test me.